podiums. A night of history starts right now. The time has finally come. They've made their case. We will make America great again. We're going to prove to the world we are stronger together. So who will be your next president right now? Live from Times Square, the crossroads of America, with our country at the crossroads. This is ABC Election Night 2016. Now reporting from ABC News Election Headquarters, George Stephanopoulos. Good evening and welcome to Election Night 2016. What a crazy campaign this has been. Bitter, ugly, always unpredictable. The debates, the rallies, the ads and attacks, they're all done now. The decision in your hands. Our whole team is here all through the night as the votes are counted and the first states are in, so let's get right to it. The polls have now closed in six states with 60 electoral votes, and ABC News can project that Donald Trump has won the state of Kentucky. That was a state won by Bill Clinton twice, 1992 and 1996, Republican ever since then. Donald Trump the winner tonight. Up in Vermont, three electoral votes. Hillary Clinton wins those three electoral votes, of course. That is the home state of Bernie Sanders, her rival in the primaries. Solid blue state. Hillary Clinton gets that tonight. And in the state of Indiana, right in the middle of the country, Donald Trump wins that as well. That was won by Barack Obama in 2008. It's gone Republican every other time since 1964. And of course, Donald Trump's running mate, uh, Mike Pence, is from the state of Indiana. So right there we see 19 electoral votes for Donald Trump, three for Hillary Clinton so far, those first three states we can call. Polls have also closed in the state of Georgia. That went to Bill Clinton in 1992. We do not have enough votes in to project that yet. It's been a solid Republican state ever since 1992. Not enough votes in there yet. State of South Carolina, also solid red. Went Democrat only once in the last generation to Jimmy Carter in 1976. Not enough votes there yet either. And we also have been paying special attention tonight to 12 battleground states. Those are the states that the candidates spent the most time in, spent the most money in. Those are the states that are going to determine this election. One of the key ones, polls just closed in the state of Virginia. They voted for Barack Obama in the last two elections. Of course, Hillary Clinton's running mate, Tim Kaine from the state of Virginia. That is a key part of her strategy, but we do not have enough votes in to project that. So we have some votes in, three states called. So far, as I said, our entire team is here. World News anchor David Muir, we don't have a lot of results. We do have exit polls. Exit polls, and these are preliminary, as you know, George, but we're already seeing some incredibly fascinating uh, signs about the, the makeup of this country and some of the key issues as they headed to the polls today. First, take a look at the, the issue of race in this country, and in particular, the racial makeup of the voters. 70% of the voters are turned out today white, 30% non-white. That number is up from 28% four years ago, and that number has tripled since 1976. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see the racial makeup in these key battlegrounds. On the question of honesty, so much attention paid to Hillary Clinton, the emails, that private server, when they were asked which candidate is most honest and trustworthy, 37% of voters saying Hillary Clinton. 32% saying Donald Trump is the most honest and trustworthy. This is a key question, as we know, which is most qualified to be president? Which candidate, Hillary Clinton, 53% at this point, Donald Trump, 37%. This is preliminary data. And on the final question, and George, you remember we asked Donald Trump about temperament. He said, I have the best temperament to be commander in chief, to be president. Voters were asked this question, who has the best temperament? 56% saying Hillary Clinton. At this point, 34% saying Donald Trump. Temperament and qualifications, two issues. Hillary Clinton went right at him. Also joined by my This Week colleague, Martha Raddatz, is here as well. You spent a lot of time during this election on the road, in your car, going out and meeting voters, and you really did hear this distaste for both candidates. Uh, absolutely distaste for both candidates and different parts. I, Pennsylvania, I was just back from Pennsylvania. In rural Pennsylvania, big Trump country, Hillary Clinton in those cities. But the voters would tell me, I'm not really voting for that person, I'm voting against the other. And that was everywhere I went, undecided voters, even though solidly for one of the candidates, it was more a vote against the other. Not a ton of enthusiasm. We'll see if that changes tonight. Our chief political analyst, Matthew Dowd, also here, what's the one thing you're watching for? I'm watching, as David said, I'm watching the demographics. If these hold, it looks much more like a presidential year. Donald Trump wanted it to look much more like a midterm year. I remember a tied race in 2000, 18% of the vote. 
was non-white in 2000. That was a tie. This year, it looks like around 30% is. To me, that's the history getting made tonight, besides the potential history at the end, who's declared president. The history is this country has fundamentally changed over the last 20 years. And John Carl, you've been doing a deep dive in all the states. I want to put up again these 12 states we are watching most closely, these battleground states. There they are right there. Which two are you paying most attention to? I'm paying attention to the ones that the candidates paid the most attention to. North Carolina, one of the big battleground states that was visited and spent uh, heavily in. And then Florida, no state had more candidate visits and more money spent than the state of Florida. And here's the thing, George, with both of those states, Donald Trump simply has to win. With North Carolina, it is very difficult to see how he gets elected president if he loses. With Florida, it is virtually impossible to see how he's elected. And if I can tell you one more item here, if you're looking at Florida, if you want to look at one place on this entire map, look at Hillsborough County. That's in Tampa. No Republican has carried Florida without carrying Hillsborough County since Calvin Coolidge. That is the Bellwether County right there. Okay, you know, we're to kind of an odd place tonight right here in Times Square. We consider it the crossroads of America. We, you know, we on GMA. I'm also joined by my GMA colleagues, though, who are at both headquarters right there. Robin Roberts is with the Clinton campaign. That's at the Javits Center. That's the Clinton headquarters tonight, 10 blocks away from here. Amy Robach at the Trump campaign up at the New York Hilton, 10 blocks up from here. And Robin, what's the mood there right now? Oh, it's growing. Uh, the crowd you can see is coming in. There's even a bigger crowd, George, outside. It took us about an hour and a half to gain access here. It's usually a short distance from our studios, and we saw police presence virtually at every block. But the crowd is beginning to, to grow, and there is a large projector that is showing the results as they come in. And the projector is hanging from a glass ceiling, and people have noted the glass ceiling here and wondering if Hillary Clinton will be able to indeed shatter that glass ceiling becoming the first woman to be to be president but you, it, it, you you've been to these things George it's, it's it's starting to pick up it's a little early yet but you can feel the energy building and no accident they picked that hall with the glass ceiling Cecilia Vega you of course have been with the Clinton campaign from the very very beginning and one of the things they've been telling us in the last couple of days as it seemed like they were getting momentum coming into election day is they really look back at the convention and the debates as the turning points those are the two moments in this campaign that they, they basically gave them their biggest bumps in some of the polls. Of course, that first con the convention, the, the con moment, that Gold Star family that ended up going at it with Donald Trump telling him to read the Constitution. And Michelle Obama's line, they go low, we go high. That became a campaign point for Hillary Clinton. She mentions it almost every day. And of course, that first debate where they just went at it. Hillary Clinton turning that issue into Alicia Machado took that out on the campaign trail. And you really saw her shift in her campaigning, turning it then to an issue of women, one that she started running on and has not stopped since, George. And how about the lowest point? I got one word for you, emails, and it did not let up. She started her campaign on the issue of emails at a low point, and she almost ended it on one. The craziest day we had on the campaign trail is that day that James Comey announced again that they were investigating her emails. Of course, we know what happened with that. Nothing came of that investigation, but that was definitely one of the low points. They were basically gloating about how well they were doing in the polls when that happened, and boy, that took the air out of that. At, at the very end, and David Muir, you know, she had such a hard time figuring out how to talk about the emails. The first time she apologized was in an interview with you. Yeah, and it was really interesting, and you had a sense going in that she knew she had to address the email question, George. Uh, we asked her that September day. She said, I'm sorry, and we talked about the book that she wrote right before the campaign, and in that book she talks about how important it is that a candidate acknowledges that they make mistakes, that a politician's able to call it a mistake. And I said, would you call it a mistake? And she said, I absolutely would. It's very interesting, though. Fast forward a year later, we sat down with her in the middle of this investigation, this question mark, and I said, can you believe we're still talking about your emails. You could tell she knew it really dogged her. Uh, Tim Kaine came to her defense, and I think she uh, welcomed him in that way, in particular that issue, because she was uh, so exhausted of trying to defend herself. She needed some bolstering yeah. on that, no question about it. Let me go to Amy Roebuck right now at the New York Hilton. You're not at the Trump Tower, Amy, but you are at the Trump That's rally. Right. Yes, this is the biggest venue closest to the Trump Tower, and that is why we are here at the Hilton. A few of the thousand expected guests have started to arrive. Probably one of the most exciting things we've seen is Amarosa, of course, of The Apprentice, taking selfies with some of those guests who have begun to come here. But something interesting, as those guests walk through the doors of this ballroom, they can each pick up one of those Make America Great Again caps, those red caps. And if you take a look behind me, I'd like you to look. There 
is one of those hats, the Make America Great Again hats, right behind me in a glass enclosed case. There are actually two of them on either side of the stage. They say the reason why is because it has become the iconic symbol of the Trump campaign. George? It certainly has. And Tom Yamas, you've been with the Trump campaign from the start. You and I were both there in Trump Tower, June 2015. I can tell you for my part, I had no, there was no way I thought Donald Trump would be here today as the nominee of the Republican Party. I'm not sure Donald Trump thought so either. George, never doubt how high Donald Trump thinks of himself, but <laughs> I, I do think you're right. This was an incredible campaign, and in the beginning, there really was no campaign. It was Donald Trump, a microphone, and a Twitter account. And he did so many things that were unconventional, and that's why no one believed he could get to this point. He savaged his opponents with insults. He shunned spending money on ads, on a ground game. He did whatever he wanted. He traveled around and showed off his airplane. There was so much going there, and of course, he would always make up his own facts. But it was his message and that energy. 70 years old, with that booming voice from Queens, he would go into those arenas, and he would say, we're going to build a wall, and Mexico's going to pay for it. NAFTA's killing your jobs. We're going to bomb the hell of ISIS and millions of people bought in. We'll find out if enough did. And for the longest of time, it looked like one of his iconic sentences, I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and not lose a vote. For a long time, that held. George, think about how much he bounced back from. He, in a sense, even bounced back from that horrific Access Hollywood moment to a race where we're watching battleground states right now. You know, he, he disparaged Hispanics, African Americans, every single voting block, if you think about it, at one point or another, he, he had problems with. And yet he's still at this point in a very close race. We can't ever deny that he truly is, in many ways, a comeback kid. And the reason why, he never stopped fighting. He never, give, he never gave up. Like him or hate him, he kept in this race the entire time. Five rallies right through midnight last night. Okay, Tom, we'll be coming back to you as well. I want to go out to Times Square right now. Our Michael Strand, my GMA colleague there as well, right down there with the people. you got a nice setup down there. Tell us about it, Michael. Uh, very nice setup, George, and, and thank you. you got Robin at the Jacob Javits Center. You have Amy at the Hilton. We're right here in the heart of New York City right here in Times Square and you see I'm standing on this map here this is an interactive map you have some red states some blue states these states light up when the when they're called when they're when the call is given for Trump or for Clinton it is a booth behind me but was built in partnership with Facebook we're going to connect with our audience we're going to with hundreds of our audience members and on hundreds of people out there we're going to talk about the things that they are concerned about the most things they're looking out for in this election and we have a great crowd here we have a lot of Trump supporters you have a lot of Clinton supporters they are excited a lot of young voters too here George see some Pace University students here so I'm going to stay out here in Times Square with the people and we're going to have a conversation about this election looking forward and to going back to you as well Michael thank you we've got our first tweet of the night this is the Twitter election this one comes from Mike Pence he says thank you Indiana for making our state the first on board to vote to make America great again at real Donald Trump that comes from the Republican vice presidential candidate and now I want to welcome back our friend and former leader Charlie Gibson Charlie it's great to see you and you know you started covering campaigns for ABC News, I think, back in 1976, the Ford. It was 1876. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I am pretty sure of, none of us has ever seen a campaign quite like this one. Are you asking me if I've seen anything like this? <laughs> <laughs> no. And? <laughs> and that's it. I can go home. Uh, no, you know, what's dismaying, George, and I think all of us who are here, all are here because we love politics. We love this process of electing a president. It is a, it is a moment of majesty. And I haven't seen much majesty in this campaign. Um, David made mention of, of Hillary Clinton's book and uh, a chapter about when you should apologize. I, don't, I think Donald Trump missed that chapter uh, somewhere along the line. And, and the, the, the toxic nature of this campaign is truly dismaying to somebody who loves politics. You know, you are all immersed in the who's going to win which Senate race and which whatever. But it, b being retired, I, I look at it sort of from 10,000 feet and at a greater distance. And, and this campaign truly, truly dismays me for the country, not just for what's happened over the last couple of months, but what's going to happen in the coming months, because the divisions are so great. And whether or not whoever wins tonight can govern, given the kind of toxicity that exists, really worries me. And I want to bring that question to Cookie Roberts, because Cookie, you grew up in politics, you grew up right. in Washington. One of the things the voters were saying this year is they really thought Washington 
was broken, especially Donald Trump voters. So it's going to be a big challenge for whoever wins tonight to try to make something work there as well. Right. His his drain the swamp uh, was all about Washington, and uh, and there's a tremendous anti-government mood in the electorate. We're seeing that as the voters come out of the polls, they are angry or dissatisfied with the government, and uh, and they've they've got good reason to be. Uh, the the Congress has not been able to function, and um, they've promised a lot of things they can't do, and so. So I think that uh, it's going to be it's going to be very very hard to pull this together. But but there's some you know I'm something something of a Pollyanna about this because like Charlie like all of us here uh, we really do um, love this process and love the the, the politics the, and the country. And I think that um, I think that sometimes after even a bitter election like this, people do come together. They 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 say okay. This is our president, and it's exciting, and let's do something. And, and Terry Moran, you spend most of your time in London as our chief foreign correspondent. I think a lot of people all around the world look at this election with eyes wide open. They were shocked, <laughs> and there's, <clears throat> there's no question that it's done damage to the United States image around the world. You don't have to look any farther than Iran. <clears throat> when the Ayatollahs wanted to find the, the best anti-American propaganda they could this year, they showed the presidential debates to the people of Iran. <laughs> and then they just said, look at how degenerate and broken that system is. And for our allies around the world, friends and allies, uh, this, this was a shocker. You know, they heard one of the major party candidates question the, the commitment of the United States to NATO. That's a bell that will be hard to unring for people around the world. And even beyond that, for people around the world, for all the problems that America has, the American democracy is still seen as kind of a beacon of stability, of right. decency, of order, and it's damaged that. And, and Byron Pitts, you know, eight years ago, Charlie announced Barack Obama would be the first African-American president in the United States. A lot of people thought then maybe we're heading towards a post-racial America. Clearly not the case. You know, throughout America's history, there has always been a backlash to, to progress. Um, 1863, Emancipation Proclamation, slavery is over. Great. 1865, the Klan is born. 1867, uh, Reconstruction begins. The end of Reconstruction, 1877, Jim Crow begins. So I think many people felt that certainly uh, the election of Barack Obama people could celebrate, but I think many people were mindful that, uh-oh, what happens next? I mean, there have been countless moments. Black America could raise his head when Jackie Robinson broke the color line. Black America could raise its head when uh, Ursula Burns became the first black woman CEO of a, of a Fortune 500 company. But, George, something happens when you raise your head, you got to look both ways because someone may be trying to knock your head off. And so I think black America is, was cautiously optimistic when Obama won, but history tells us, be careful what happens after progress. Byron Pitts, okay, we gotta take a quick break. Let's take another look at the board right now. 19 electoral votes for Donald Trump, three for Hillary Clinton. We're gonna be right back with Pierre Thomas on the impact of FBI Director James Comey on this election. And we've got election guru Nate Silver from 538 here as well with his final forecast. Back live in Times Square after this. And we are back now with election night 2016. We just heard Cecilia Vega talking a few minutes ago about this email issue, how much it hurt the Clinton campaign. And of course, that brings up the impact of the FBI director, James Comey. I want to talk to our senior justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, about that. Boy, Pierre, uh, James Comey getting it from all sides for coming out in July and giving that commentary after his finding that he wouldn't, uh, would not bring charges against Hillary Clinton. More, more criticism when he came out 10 days ago and said he was looking at it again. And then Sunday, the same thing. How much, what kind of damage has this done to him? And take us inside his head on why he took these actions. George, political theater is coming to Washington. Both of these candidates have sharply criticized uh, Comey about what he decided to do. Now, what this means is that the FBI director found himself right where he didn't want to be in the middle of an election, and it's going to be a prickly relationship because they're going to have to work with him. But the bottom line is he said that having a presidential candidate, Hillary Clinton, in the midst of a criminal investigation required transparency. He felt he had to do what he had to do. But one of his closest aides told me there were no good decisions he could make, only bad ones. He made the best he could, he could make. But bottom line, imagine that moment in the Situation Room for either Trump or Clinton, both having criticized 
you know, Comey, and he's going to have to work with them. He's got a 10-year term that does not end until 2023. He doesn't plan on going anywhere, but again, he serves at the pleasure of the president. George. Seven years left. Pierre Thomas, thanks very much. Let me bring that to Nate Silver of, of 530. And of course, you do these forecasts based on your own analysis of the polls, plus that whatever's coming in on our ABC projections as well. But before we get to that, I want to ask you about this Comey effect. When he came out with that letter about 10 days ago and said he'd be looking at the emails again, you know, you heard the Democrats scream, and they think it really hurt Hillary Clinton chances and their chances of getting control of the Senate. Yeah, so we had it hurting Clinton by about three points on net in the polls. She regained a point maybe over the last few days. So, But there were so many close Senate campaigns within a point or two that if one of them, say Evan Bayh, for example, who's down in early returns, would lose by a point or so, they might be able to point a few fingers potentially. And, and they tell us where you have your final forecast as we're coming into the evening. So we wound up with Clinton having a 71% chance of winning, so better than two and three. Um, and we'll update that as the night goes along, as you guys, ABC News calls states. So far, obviously no game changer with Trump winning Kentucky or Clinton winning Vermont. Um, the people I follow think the returns look good so far for Clinton in Florida, of course, which is a, which is a must win state for Trump. Okay, Nate Silver, thanks very much. We've got a group of strategists here from both sides as well, Republican and Democratic. Stephanie Cutter, let me begin with you. You, of course, worked on President Obama's campaigns in his White House as well. Uh, how are you feeling coming into the evening? I feel pretty good, um, especially listening to Nate saying a 72% chance of Hillary winning. But I think what we see from the early returns is that her ground game has really delivered, um, especially in Florida, where the makeup of that electorate is becoming all that much more diverse. So I think it's looking good for her there. And of course, if she blocks Trump there, then she's won the presidency. And Alex Castellanos, Republican strategist, I think you started out this campaign, not a big fan of Donald Trump, came on board for Donald Trump as the months went by. And in some ways, that is the story of the Republican Party over the course of this election. Yeah, this uh, we've seen it in both parties, frankly, the outsiders versus the insiders. And in the Democratic Party, it was Bernie Sanders trying to overthrow the Democratic establishment. They lost. But in our party, the outsider won. And uh, that has uh, it's been difficult to bring the party together and all that. You know, we shouldn't forget that on occasion, these elections are not just about the candidates. They're about government. And both parties think the government is failing them and want change. And it'll be interesting to see tonight if they get that change. A lot of Republicans never came on board for Donald Trump. One of them, Bill Kristol, the Weekly Standard. A lot of conservatives didn't come on board as well. We learned today that uh, former President George W. Bush and his wife Laura did not vote for Donald Trump either. And this, uh, there was a big group of conservatives, including you, that said the Republican Party simply cannot get on board. And we'll see what the implications of that are going forward. I see the Senator Pat Toomey in Pennsylvania in a tough re-election race, waited to vote till very late in the day, and did, then did announce that he did vote for Donald Trump. He had withheld his, his endorsement or support till the very end, which I think confirms the, the point you made to Alex. And most Republicans came on board. And I'm not for Trump, but I'll say this. I mean, if we have a reasonably close race, if Trump does almost as well as Mitt Romney did in 2012, better than John McCain in 2008, he will be a big force. This is not the end. If Trump loses tonight, it's not the end of Trump. It may be the end of the beginning of the Trump phenomenon, but the implications of Trump will ripple through our, the Republican Party and our politics it may for not years. Be, it may not be the end of Trump, but Kristen Soltis Anderson, also a Republican strategist, the question for the Republican Party is how do they grab onto those growing voter groups in the country? You're right. I, I have a feeling tonight as we're looking at the exit polls, we're going to be looking at a lot of these cleavages in the, the electorate along race lines, generational lines, college educational lines, and Republicans have, for the most part, tried to draw on votes from what I think are shrinking groups of voters. They'll need to expand them among these groups that are growing like the college educated and like Latinos to thrive in the future. Okay, thank you all. We'll be coming back to you as well. Got to take another quick break. When we come back, the polls close in North Carolina and Ohio, two big battleground states. This is ABC News live coverage of election night 2016. Here again, George Stephanopoulos. And we are back now, 7.30 in the east, and polls have just closed in three more states. Uh, there's 38 electoral votes in those three states. Let's take another look at the board right now. Donald Trump now has 24 electoral votes to three for Hillary Clinton because he's just won the state of West Virginia. Solid Republican state, voted Republican in the last four elections. Of course, Donald Trump made an awful, made a direct pitch to the coal miners in that state very turned off to Democrats that is a win for Donald Trump 
We're also closely following these battleground states. Polls have closed in two battleground states right now, including that state of North Carolina. You saw Hillary Clinton close out the campaign last night in the state of North Carolina. We do not have enough votes in to project that right now. Of course, Mitt Romney won that in 2012. Barack Obama won it in 2008. And this, John Carl, this was a really hard-fought state. Robbie Mook is even saying that he's the Clinton campaign manager. It's so close, they're not even sure it is going to be decided uh, tonight. And they, Barack Obama went in there heavy in the last several days. Went over there huge to try to boost the turnout among uh, young voters and especially African-American voters. The state that we've also watched in Florida, George, a lot of returns are coming in. What do you got? I'm tracking. So look at this. We have 40% of the vote already in and Florida. <laughs> it's been going back and forth. I've been watching so right now. So much early vote there. Yeah, so much early vote. That's why we're seeing so much come in. And neck and neck, it's been going back and forth between Clinton and Trump. If you look at some of the key counties, we still don't know. I mentioned Hillsborough County, the one that's been the bellwether forever in Florida. We don't have anything in from there yet. But look at Miami-Dade County. This is a, a county that is two-thirds Hispanic. Obama won it by 25 points uh, back back in four years ago, and it's almost exactly the same margin that Clinton is winning right now. And that's now. really interesting, because the Clinton campaign told us that that was right on the bubble. They said they would have to win that by about 24 or 25 to have a chance of winning the state. It's just about right there right now. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, it's it's going back. I'm telling you, every minute or so, it goes back and forth okay, between Clinton. I know you're going to keep an eye on that. The polls have also closed in the state of Ohio, such a key state for so many different election cycles. As we've said, no Republican has ever won the White House without winning the state of Ohio. Not enough votes in to check what's happening there yet. This was one of Donald Trump's best states through the campaign, one he returned to again and again. And David Muir, I know you've been going through the exit polls. What are we learning from them about that state? Part of his pitch is the working class blue collar workers left behind in the Rust Belt and Ohio. As you mentioned, Republicans need. Take a look at these two questions. First, uh, voters in Ohio were asked, and this is preliminary data, your job situation versus four years ago. 38% said the job situation is better today. 35 about the same. Only 27% said it's actually worse today. But then look at this issue that uh, Donald Trump really doubled down on trade. He really went after Hillary Clinton on this and Bill Clinton, uh, his time on this and, and the trade deal struck by under the first Clinton administration, uh, takes away jobs. 47% concerned about trade deals. Only 32% in Ohio say it actually creates more jobs. So these are issues key to Trump's success in Ohio. And Ron Claiborne in Ohio for us tonight. And Ron, I want to go to, you know, this has been such a competitive state for Donald Trump, despite the fact that the Republican governor of Ohio, John Kasich, is against him. That's right, George. Uh, Donald Trump's effort here had a lot going against it. Now, John Kasich is very popular here. He very pointedly did not endorse uh, Donald Trump. The Senate candidate, uh, Rob Portman, the GOP Senate candidate, endorsed him. And then after those remarks that were recorded uh, on, the, on that bus that came out about a month ago, Portman withdrew his endorsement of Trump. Also, the get out the vote uh, effort here by the uh, Trump campaign considered weak. A schism in the GOP party here. And yet Donald Trump expected to do very well here. The last polls we saw in the recent days showing him slightly ahead of Hillary Clinton. Martha Ratz, you were just there this weekend. Uh, Ohio, again, just like Pennsylvania, it is that divided America. There are parts of Ohio that none of us would recognize as America. There is absolute blight. There are people who are desperate. And those are people who've turned to Donald Trump. And what they hear from him, I can ask voters, say, do you believe that he'll make a change? Do you believe Hillary Clinton could make a change? And they'll say, I don't really believe either of them. But Donald Trump gave them some sort of hope. They didn't believe he could really make change, but it gave them hope. He said what they wanted to hear. And Matthew Dad, one of the signs of how much America's changing is that right now Ohio is a state that Democrats can win the presidency without winning. Ohio. Well, and I think we're going to see over the course of the night a, a few switches over the, oh, you have to win this state in order to win the presidency. Oh, yeah, I think that's going to switch back and forth. The other piece of data that I think is really important is how much Barack Obama mattered in this election. If you take a look, one, he campaigned in the last 10 days feverishly and I think helped build turnout. You, you take a look at his approval rating, which over the course of this campaign is one of the few things that has ridden, risen. People felt better about the president. But when you look at his approval rating and how it breaks, if you approve of Barack Barack Obama, you voted overwhelmingly for Hillary Clinton. If you didn't approve of Barack Obama, you voted overwhelmingly for Donald Trump. Okay, of course, the polls have also closed in the state of Virginia in the last half hour, one of those battleground states we're looking at. Let's take a look at it right now. We do not have enough votes in to project what's happening there just yet. But as you see on that board of the votes in right now, Donald Trump has a pretty good lead. Of course, Hillary Clinton came into this campaign considering that one of her safer 
uh, states with, with a pretty healthy lead in the polls. We'll be following that all night. But right now, I do want to go to Donald Trump's campaign manager, Kellyanne Conway, who's joining us this, this evening. I think you're at Trump Tower, maybe at the Hilton. Thank you for coming on. Tell me how you're feeling right now. We're feeling great, George. We like the fact that in some of these states, it looks like a jump ball. We're trying to protect our core four and add to that to get to 270. And as you know, in the last week or two, we've had a really aggressive campaign to try to flip a blue state or two. And in doing so, we, we look at Michigan. Pennsylvania is always what I call our REACH state, like your REACH college when you apply. But it's one that uh, really, to Martha's earlier point, really is attracted to Donald Trump's message about trade and illegal immigration and job creation and patriotism. And then, of course, we're looking at a big day of vote turnout in places like North Carolina, Florida, Nevada, where the Democrats generally do a very good job earlier on. And we like to make up those gains today. Then you look at Michigan, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, three states that don't have a very robust early vote. Absentee voting would be the key in those states. And so that's why we've been deploying Governor Pence and Mr. Trump back to those states where there'll be basically almost 100% day of voting. Secretary Clinton's team said earlier tonight that they were working on two speeches, a victory speech and a concession speech. Are you working on two as well? Mr. Trump is uh, prepared to address the results tonight as he sees them. And I was with him until we arrived back at Trump Tower 4.30 a.m. this morning from the Manchester, New Hampshire, and Grand Rapids, Michigan uh, rallies, historic crowds in both places. And he's feeling really great. He's feeling buoyant. And he's very pleased about the movement he's created, the fact that he has given voice to a lot of those forgotten men, forgotten women that Martha was talking about earlier in Ohio, for example. And he, I feel really good about the campaign and going tonight, too. We're competitive with... A candidate, Hillary Clinton, is very well known, who has the advantage of a very popular president, a former president who's also popular, happens to be her husband. A lot of celebrities uh, campaigning for her. And we didn't always have, you know, Republican elected officials. We're going to win a couple of these states tonight without the Republican governors yeah. or senators and I want to ask voting you, for us. I want to ask you about that, because we now know that former President George H.W. Bush voted for Hillary Clinton. George W. Bush said he left his ballot blank but did not vote for Donald Trump. There, your two previous nominees, John McCain and Mitt Romney, both did not vote for Donald Trump. How much did that hurt you? It doesn't help, and it's very personally disappointing, even though I respect all four of the people you just mentioned and, and respect their right to vote the way they'd like. I just would, what I would say to that is that we were all there for them, certainly. But secondly, you know, in growing a party, you have to count on being able to keep the party as it is together to be able to grow it. And the irony for Donald Trump is he's been able to grow this party in places and among voter groups without having the full support of some of these elected officials. As a party, as an infrastructure, we've worked hand in glove with Chairman Reince Priebus and the RNC. They've been nothing but fantastic to us here at the Trump campaign. Uh, but at the same time, we don't have we don't have all the senators, governors, former presidents. The irony, George, is tonight we are poised to win states that neither Romney nor McCain won, and we're winning those states without Romney or McCain's support. So. Uh, but Donald Trump has really grown the party. I think he's taken the party away from dangerously, dangerously veering close to being the party of the elites and to the party of the working men and working women, and that's a huge accomplishment. Mr. Trump had, had complained a lot about it, had talked a lot about before tonight of the possibility of, of some problems at voting sites. Are you seeing any big ones? We're hearing reports of some, but nothing that's uh, tangible enough to me to raise flags. But we do have folks uh, giving reports anecdotally. We also have a lot of positive information from the polling places today. Uh, very wrong, long lines with people in their full Trump regalia, their famous now red hats. And so people excited. I think you are going to see some record turnout in some places. That's a great sign great for the health of democracy. But um, we, we will assess that as it comes due, if it comes due. I know in some counties I'm reading that they may extend voting because they had some glitches, maybe Durham County, North Carolina, for example. But we're keeping an eye on that. But right now we're really focused on uh, people who are still voting in some of these states after work, looking at uh, the data inputs we have here in our data and digital war room to try to see if we can uh, piece together 270. I know you have a lot more work to do. Thanks for joining us, Kellyanne. I want to bring that Thank to you. Pierre Thomas. Right now you're keeping an eye on ballot security as well. Hearing of any major problems? No major problems so far. Things are going pretty well. Um, nothing to speak of, George. Okay, Pierre Thomas, thanks very much. I want to go back now to the Javits Center. Robin Roberts, you're there with a member of the Clinton campaign. Yes, I am. I'm here, George, with Christina.
Christina, Christina Shockley. She is the Deputy Communications Director with the Clinton Campaign. So how have they been responding to the campaign to the early results that we're seeing? You know, we feel great tonight. As you can see, thousands of people are starting to pour into Javits Center to what we hope is going to be a celebration here tonight. We felt great coming into today because the impressive early vote in critical battleground states like Florida and North Carolina, we really saw the Hillary Coalition come out and vote for her early, so we felt good coming in today. And from the early results, we're feeling very excited right now. And the number of people that have come out all across the country, the long lines, the wrapping around buildings and such. Yes, you know, it's really exciting for us to see millions of Americans are getting out there today. We're seeing democracy in action. We're really grateful by the enthusiastic supporters for Hillary Clinton. We're really seeing Hillary's coalition come together tonight. African Americans, Latinos, Millennials, Asian Pacific Islanders, suburban moms are really coming out to support her, and we think this is going to be a historic night. I, I don't have to tell you that Hillary Clinton's unfavorable ratings have been an issue throughout the campaign, and that is one of the reasons why you were brought in. What has been the biggest challenge there? Well, you know, we've had a lot of headwinds in this campaign. Hillary has certainly been at the forefront of a lot of issues for many years, and as a result, she takes a lot of incoming attacks she has for decades, but she always keeps in there and keeps fighting. And so we had some headwinds during the campaign, but she just got in there and worked her heart out, and we think people really responded to her positive message for this country. You see that the, the crowd is growing, and they're watching the results from the big screen that is hanging from the glass ceiling, and many people have commented about the glass ceiling here, Christina. Well, you know, we think it's going to be a meaningful night. One of the reasons that we actually are trying to make even our capacity bigger here tonight, Robin, is because so many of the people that we invited from across the country to come in and celebrate with us tonight asked to bring their daughters. We had moms and dads say that they thought this was going to be a really meaningful night for this country, and they wanted to bring their daughters to be here to hear Hillary Clinton speak. You know, I think uh, Hillary is somebody who has fought on behalf of children and families her entire life. She's a children's advocate running for president of the United States. We think she's going to make history tonight, and we think she's going to be an incredible president for America. A large crowd here, an even larger crowd waiting outside yes. to get in, George. Okay, Robin, thanks very much for coming back to you. And just a little bit, I want to put the results from Virginia up again, uh, so show the raw vote coming in for Virginia right there. Right now, it's showing a relatively large, rather large lead for Donald Trump right there, John Carl. D go inside the numbers, show us what's coming in, and try to assess what it means. Yeah, that would be pretty shocking, because this is a state that the Clinton team has felt they've had a lead for a long time, and the, uh, the Trump team actually pulled resources out of Virginia. But if you drill down, you see that Trump lead isn't all that it appears. First of all, Virginia is a state that the further south you go, the stronger Republican vote you're going to have. The key vote and the most populous part of the state is up north. The Fairfax County, this is a, a county uh, that went 21 points for Barack Obama, uh, and you see there's not much vote coming in. There's less than 1,000 votes in there. That's going to be overwhelmingly uh, uh, Clinton vote. And then Arlington County, right in here, nothing, nothing's come in. That's a state that Obama won by 40 points four years ago. There is a bellwether county up north, Loudoun County, which kind of crosses d different parts of the state. And if you look at that, in that state, uh, in that county, Loudoun, Clinton has a big lead. It went for Obama by just five points last time, very close to what he actually won the state and by. And Matthew, Dad, a real sign of a rapidly changing America right there. Virginia used to be part of the solid Republican South. It's been gone Barack, Barack Obama twice, as we said, as, with, as they get an influx of a lot of new uh, populations. Well, it's, I think and it's a reflection of this urban-rural split across the country. George Bush, we're having worked on his campaign in 2000 and 2004, we never considered West Virginia even close to a swing state. Well, that changed automatically in 2008, and now it's almost not, it's not almost no longer a swing state. It's moving so rapidly blue in the course of this. It's a problematic situation for the Republican Party that because of these demographics, a lot of these states now are following the demographics. Chris and Saltis Anderson, how does the Republicans get Virginian states like it back? I think we've got to figure out how to win voters who live in denser areas, that there are large pieces of the state that are rural, but it's when folks are living in these suburbs or in, in urban areas. Talking to voters who live in more diverse communities, I think that's a key way for Republicans to win back places like Virginia. And Mayor Stephanie Rawlings-Blake, Democratic Mayor uh, of Baltimore, of course you, you represent a city heavy African American population, but one of the concerns of Democrats in this election, of Hillary Clinton in, in this election, is that for the longest time African American voters were not coming out in the same kind of numbers they came out for Barack Obama. 
I think uh, Secretary Clinton really leaned on the first lady uh, during this race, and I think you're going to see the African-American vote really come out. I think it's, it's unreasonable to expect the vote to come out the same way it did in 2008, 2012, but I think that we're really going to show up because we understand how important this race is. I was there at the Congressional Black Caucus when President Obama looked into the crowd and said, if you care about me, and if you care about my legacy, then you need to support Hillary Clinton. And I think a lot of us heard that very loudly. Cookie Robert, you spent a lot of time studying first ladies. Michelle Obama, <laughs> in some ways, the star of this campaign. Absolutely. She is. She was the prime surrogate to get voters out, and, and not just African-American voters, young people. Young people really responded to her. And uh, and she just, she, she took it on the trail in a way that was so meaningful. And, and her, of course, her popularity ratings are so high that when when Donald Trump uh, just once went after her, he pulled back. It's the only time you've really seen him pull back fast. And um, and and Hillary Clinton, of course, took up her chant from the from the convention of when they go low, we go high and, and took it out on the trail. But the other thing Michelle Obama did that was so effective was every place she went should say to the voters, just two more votes in this precinct would have turned it around. And she had all of that data that she used along with her inspirational talks to really get the voters in her And Cecilia Vega, Hillary Clinton said she wasn't running for Bill Clinton's third term. She wasn't running for Barack Obama's third term. But you did see both Obamas, especially in these final two weeks, come out. And President Obama was very explicit. He said, we have work that needs to get finished. Final few weeks, final few hours. The biggest election, the biggest rally of this entire campaign was just last night in Philadelphia on Independence Mall. The Obamas there, the Clintons there. George, this election has very much been about for Hillary Clinton preserving President Obama's legacy and she is using that as a way to get votes especially with what Christina Shockey just called that Clinton coalition African American voters Latino voters voters of color the one voter the one group that she did not mention which I thought was really interesting is white men Hillary Clinton has had a huge problem with that from the very beginning but George I want to go back to Michelle Obama for one second one of the most invigorating rallies that I covered covering this for the last year and a half was a Michelle Obama rally in North Carolina with Hillary Clinton. When they walked out arm in arm in a college arena, that place went wild. And Hillary Clinton has tried to capitalize on that ever since that they go low, we go high moment at the convention. She, Michelle Obama was hands down her most important surrogate on the campaign trail. Okay, got to take another quick break. When we come back, Michael Strahan in Times Square and more results. now with election night 2016 right here in Times Square and right outside Michael Strahan with some Clinton supporters. All right, thank you, George. I am out here with a group of students from Pace University. And um, how many of you are first time voters? As you can see, a lot of young voters out here. And I have Mariah right here. Mariah is 20 years old, first time voter. She's from Tennessee and you usually are on the conservative side, but you voted for everyone here voted for Hillary and, and what switched you what made you vote for Hillary um, I just think that I couldn't support Trump because of his uh, views towards women I think he's sexist um, I don't agree with the idea of it being okay for someone to brag about sexually assaulting women I didn't like the whole Muslim ban thing I didn't like the idea of someone calling uh, Mexicans rapists and drug dealers um, so there is a there are a lot of things that seemed like a lot of things. Yeah, a lot of things that he said that I didn't agree with, um, and a lot of things that he said that I don't think line up with um, what used to be the Republican like family morals. Um, so I couldn't support him. All right, we'll definitely understand that, and congratulations on being first-time voters. Your voice. <laughs> will be heard, and we're going to go back to you, George. Thank you, Michael. I want to go down to North Carolina now. Lindsey Davis down in Raleigh, North Carolina. And, Lindsey, of course, the polls closed there at 730. What are you hearing there? You've got an important Senate race on the ballot there as well, and the governor's up. 
You're right, George. So, uh, in theory, the polls were supposed to close throughout the state of North Carolina at 7:30, but because of some problems that occurred in Durham County, what they're describing as computer glitches that essentially uh, uh, shut down voting for a period of time, they have extended uh, voting at a few locations in Durham County. But as you mentioned, yes, I'm calling this the the tight trifecta, right? Because you not only have a tight race for the Senate, for governor, but also uh, for president. Uh, according to the most recent polls here for president in North Carolina, you have a tie uh, between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And this is the epitome of a swing state, right? Because in 2012, uh, North Carolina voted for Mitt Romney. In 2008, they voted for President Obama. And what was a huge help for President Obama in 2008 was that extremely large uh, black voter turnout. The thought is that Hillary Clinton will need a repeat of that in order to win the state of North Carolina again. But based on uh, early voting here, uh, the black voter turnout is nine points down uh, this year compared to where it was in 2012, of course, the year that President Obama lost. Then also just to look at that Senate race, uh, this is being called one of the core four. Uh, obviously, Democrats need four seats in order to win uh, control of a majority in the Senate, uh, and Democrats are looking very close thinking that they could get a win here. Okay. Then you have that race for governor here where uh, the incumbent Republican, um, people are suggesting that there may be a referendum on his bathroom bill, which uh, some estimate has cost the state uh, billions of dollars in lost revenue, George. A lot of controversy in that state. Lindsay Davis, thanks very much. Let's keep North Carolina up there right now. See the results as they are coming in. Uh, that's Florida, but let's bring up North Carolina. And John, I want to go to you to dig inside what we're learning from the counties. By the way, just a minute ago, Trump was, uh, was up in North Carolina. So it's going back and forth. But if you look at what's happening here, the big Democratic stronghold in North Carolina, of course, is the Raleigh-Durham area. It's one of the big strongholds. This is an area uh, that Barack Obama won by a, a double-digit margin. Not any vote has come in yet from Raleigh-Durham. It's also big. It's populated. So I would expect, as we see more coming in from Raleigh-Durham uh, and actual votes coming in, you're going to see Clinton pull pull ahead. Uh, you see one county here to keep an eye on that also has not come in is Watuga. This county has voted for the winner in every uh, presidential election since 1996, but again, no vote coming in. So although you have about a quarter of the vote coming in, it's very even going back and forth. It seems to me there's a lot of Hillary Clinton vote that has not been counted. And you got yet. some exit polls there as well? Yes, yeah, some exit polls coming in, obviously preliminary from North Carolina, but when you ask when they made their decision, uh, a lot of talk about uh, Director Comey's announcement and then his announcement nine days later that this was much ado about nothing. Whether it would make a difference. Look at North Carolina. 59% said they made their decision much earlier uh, in the election in the campaign season. 18% say in the month of October. Just 5% say in the last few days or the last week. And we've seen uh, similar results from some of the other battlegrounds and the qualities in North Carolina that matter most. 35% said can bring change. 22% uh, good judgment. 21% right experience. But as you know, Donald Trump was campaigning on change in Washington. And Martha Raddatz, North Carolina, another one of those states that is changing very rapidly. Changing very rapidly. I, there's a fascinating figure here. The toddler population of this country, three, four-year-olds, younger, is now majority non-white. 70% of the electorate has been white. It's down two points from 2012. So that trend is going to continue as those toddlers grow up. And it is accelerating. Martha Reddits, thanks very much. I have to take another quick break. When we come back, polls about to close in 16 more states, including one of the biggest, one of the most critical of the night. That is the battleground state of Florida. We'll be right back. Finally come. They've made their case. We will make America great again. We're going to prove to the world we are stronger together. So who will be your next president? Right now, live from Times Square, the crossroads of America, with our country at the crossroads. This is ABC Election Night 2016. Now reporting from ABC News Election Headquarters, George Stephanopoulos. And welcome back to election night 2016, 8 p.m. here in the east. And the polls have just closed in 16 states plus the District of Columbia. Let's take a look at where things stand 
Right now, you see there's 68 electoral votes for Hillary Clinton, 37 for Donald Trump. The magic number is 270. Here are the states that have closed. We can say now that Hillary Clinton has won the big state of Illinois. Of course, she was born in the state of Illinois. That is her home state. She is the winner there. Democrat has won by double digits in the past six presidential elections. Hillary Clinton wins the state of Illinois. Hillary Clinton also wins the state of New Jersey. That is a state that has not voted Republican since, since 1988 for George H.W. Bush, a state also, one of the states where Donald Trump has a home in Bedminster, New Jersey, but that one has gone to Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton also wins the true blue state of Massachusetts right there. It's 11 electoral votes, has voted Democrat in the last seven elections, last voted Republican in 1984. Of course, also the home of Senator Elizabeth Warren, one of Hillary Clinton's allies, perhaps Donald Trump's most determined foe on Twitter. Hillary Clinton wins the state of Massachusetts and the state of Maryland and its 10 electoral votes. Hillary Clinton wins that as well. Mayor Stephanie Rawlings-Blake, I see you cheering right there, the Democratic mayor of Baltimore. You also have a new senator. Yeah, we do, and I'm very, very excited about Senator Chris Van Hollen. He's got such a wonderful reputation uh, in the House, and he is going to do an amazing job. And as this is all coming together, you know, I'm very excited about what this Clinton coalition is going to, to be. I'm, I'm excited about the numbers that we're hearing, and I'm very optimistic. More numbers are coming in Rhode Island, the state of Rhode Island, four electoral votes. Again, one of those solid blue states, the last Republican to win Rhode Island, Ronald Reagan in 1984. Another one, state of Delaware. It's three electoral votes. The Northeast filling in blue right now. Last vote of Republican in 1988 for George H.W. Bush. District of Columbia, no surprise there. That goes to Hillary Clinton right there, and it's three electoral votes. And now one for Donald Trump, the state of Mississippi, and it's six electoral votes. Jimmy Carter, the last Democrat to win that in 1976. Donald Trump campaigned in Mississippi. He wins that state. And the state of Oklahoma, seven electoral votes, voted Republican in every presidential election since 1968. And, and Matthew, Dad, before we move on right here, I want to show you what you're starting to see here is the, the way tradition has gone in so many of the last uh, elections. Democrats have won so many of these solid blue states for the six out of the last seven elections appears to be continuing tonight. Yeah, if you take a look at the map as it fills in, it's very much similar to a map that we saw in 20. 12 and a very similar to, for, for a few exceptions, to 2008. So you see, we've seen it in the demographics, we've seen it among race, and now we're seeing the geography, which is pretty much settled out in the country, where vast swaths are red, and then there's coasts that become blue. Okay, let's put up the map again one more time. We see where the scoreboard stands right now. 68 electoral votes for Hillary Clinton, 37 electoral votes for Donald Trump so far. A lot of states coming in right now that we don't have enough votes to project yet, including the state of Connecticut, and it's seven electoral votes. It last one Republican in 1988 for George H.W. Bush. Of course, that was his home state. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump both won their primaries in April. We cannot call that one yet. Tennessee, the state of Tennessee, not enough data in yet on the state of Tennessee and it's 11 electoral votes, hasn't voted Democrat since 1996. Even Al Gore, when he ran in 2000, could not win his home state for the Democrats. We don't have enough data. This is a little bit of a surprise to me. Maybe the vote is just coming in slow, but the state of Alabama, and it's nine electoral votes, not enough data to project there yet, not enough data to project in the state of Maine either. It's four electoral votes, and, and John Carl, while we're on the state of Maine, might as well stop right there, because there's a little twist in Maine, one of two states where they split the electoral votes. That's right, so the second congressional the Congressional District of Maine is way up north. They say uh, the people up there speak with Canadian accents, but they vote a little bit more like they're from Alabama. Uh, so it's more conservative, and it's a state, it's a part of the state that the Trump team has put a lot of effort in because one of their paths to 270 electoral votes gets them to exactly 270 electoral votes, and they have to take that Maine. Includes congressional that district. one congressional district. Okay, state of Missouri right now, 10 electoral votes. State has gone blue only twice in the last four decades, both times for Bill Clinton, 1992 and 19. 1996. Not enough information in to project on that one yet. Also an important Senate race being held there as well. So we're going to be spending time looking at Missouri later in the evening. But these are the states we're paying most attention to tonight. These battleground states, these 12 battleground states, and the biggest one of them all. The polls have closed now in the state of Florida. And that is the big one. Jonathan Carl, 29 electoral votes. And not only are the polls closed, so much of the vote is coming in. So let's take another look at what exactly we're seeing in that vote right now. Well, 
Well, if you take a deep dive into Florida, first of all, as I'm saying, it's been going back and forth right now. Clinton with a slight lead. But if you take a look at the counties, again, it all comes down to some of these bellwether counties. Down here, Miami-Dade is overwhelmingly uh, Hispanic and overwhelmingly Democratic. And if we take a look at where Miami-Dade is going, Hillary Clinton has a big lead there. Uh, a 30-point lead is actually a bigger lead than, than Barack Obama had in 2012, and there still is a significant amount of vote yet to be counted in Miami-Dade. That's going to be overwhelmingly Hillary Clinton. But if you go up here to, uh, to the panhandle, George, this is, excuse me, if you go up to the panhandle, this is a part of Florida that is overwhelmingly Republican, and we see very little vote has been counted up there. So there will be some more Donald Trump vote. One other county to mention is Duval County. This is up by Jacksonville. This is a part of the state that, uh, that Mitt Romney won by three points. And if you look at right now, we have a slight lead for Donald Trump. So I think Florida's gonna be close, but the trends seem to be moving towards and Let's stay on Florida, because there's probably no more important state early on in this evening. David Muir, what do you got in the exit polls? Of course, there? the Clinton campaign wants Florida to, to lights out for the night, right? But John, you were talking about Miami Day. There's been so much talk about the early vote setting records, perhaps, with the Hispanic vote. Take a look if you dive in uh, at the racial makeup of the voters so far in Florida. Hispanic Latino voters making up 18%. Uh, this preliminary data the exit poll showing us, but that's just ticking up one percentage point from four years ago. Uh, and if you break it down, when did you make up your decision? Uh, many of them, 61% said much earlier than the most recent weeks. But look at this. This could be interesting as the night plays out. When asked if Trump's treatment of women bothers you after the audio released from that bus, 68% of Florida voters are uh, saying so far that that bothered them a lot as they headed into the polls. No, that's interesting. It's Martha Raddus, you spent, as we said, a lot of time on the road, and a lot of the voters you talked to said it wasn't making that much of a difference to them. Well, I, I, a little bit of truth in both of that. They said it made a difference, but not as much difference as you would expect it. And it, and it changed over the months that I went. At first, they were very concerned about it. Then they weren't as concerned about it. Um, so they, so they went either way. It didn't seem like as big a deal as we're hearing about tonight. And I think it was very different in different states. Again, if you go to the rural areas, they knew everything about it. They knew every little change in whether or not her emails were up or down. Okay, let's go back to Paula Ferris now. She's at the University of Miami. What's happening there right now? What are you feeling? Uh, well, I got to tell you, there's a lot of excitement from these students behind me. But as you guys have been mentioning, it is all about Florida. And Trump's campaign knows that it's virtually impossible for him to win the presidency without winning here in the Sunshine State. That's why he spent more time and money here than anywhere else. In fact, both candidates have spent more time here in Florida over the last month than anywhere else. But, George, the story here has been this early vote. 6.4 million Floridians voted early here. We went to five polling stations, and they were virtually ghost towns to put that million into context. That's more than the total vote here in Florida back in 2000. One key demographic that David Muir was just referencing is that Hispanic vote. And the early Hispanic vote in 2012 no was 522,000. Fast forward to this cycle, 980,000. 36 percent of the Hispanic early vote didn't even vote in the last election cycle. But I got to tell you, the students here, George, are so engaged. Most of these students are from out of state. They know the gravity of this vote, so they registered here in Florida because they know their vote is going to count. One of the one of the students said, "Quote: I'm so nervous, I might pass out." But George, they want to say one thing to you. We have a lot of fans here on the campus of University of Miami, George. That is good to hear. I will take that. Okay, thanks very much. Let's stick on this for another minute. I want to bring in Tom and Cecilia right on this right now because one of the things we're seeing here, especially with this focus on the Latino vote and the early vote, is the difference in the ground games between the Clinton organization and the Trump organization. Yeah, they both call this a must-win state, and Hillary Clinton has spent a lot of time in Florida. In fact, one of the things that we've seen over her camp out of her campaign over the last few months is this coalition of big name celebrity surrogates and she had this huge rally down there with Jennifer Lopez and Latino stars and really she's trying to galvanize the Latino community down in Florida to her that's the ticket but you know Donald Trump says he spends half of his time in Florida that's his second home Hillary Clinton's trying to get in on some of that and ground. Tom Yamas he did very well there in the primaries that's right he won 66 of the 67 counties in Florida the only county that he lost though Miami-Dade I can't tell you enough how
how important Florida is for the Donald Trump campaign. It's part of their core four. It's where he spent the most money. It's where he had the most visits since he locked up the nomination. But look at the ad spending. The Clinton team, 92 million to 41 million for Donald Trump. Now, Kellyanne Conway has told me there is one path to the nomination for them without Florida, but many people believe you're entering Don Quixote territory and you're chasing windmills at that point. And we've got another big announcement out of the state of Florida right now. Uh, Marco Rubio, of course, he was running for president earlier in the year, decided to go back into the Senate race. He will come back as a senator. He has won that race right there, 51 to 46 right now over Patrick Murphy. And John Carl, we're seeing a real, a real gap here between Marco Rubio and Donald Trump. Yeah, in, the, in Miami Dade, it's over 10 points statewide. It's about five points, five to six points, depending as it goes back and forth. Uh, uh, Rubio outperforming Donald Trump. It's a little sweet revenge. Rubio's presidential campaign died in Florida when he got destroyed by Donald Trump. He said he was never going to run for Senate again. He finally decided to change his mind to run. And then he had to, he had to answer for everything he had said about Trump during the primaries. He never lifted his endorsement, George. Uh, but he also made it clear he still does not like Does Donald not like Trump. him, but he did vote. He did vote he did for, vote he said he voted for Donald Trump. And he endorsed him. Yeah, it's secret ballot. We'll we see remember, if it, like, <laughs> remember but, 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 from the debate. But, you know, but, but, you know, but, but, you know, George, he said during the primaries that Donald Trump couldn't be trusted with the nuclear codes. And then during the course of this election, he said, yes, he still believes that, but I still has my yeah, endorsement. Yeah, and I want to bring that to Alex Cassianos, both Crystal and, and Kristen over here, the Republican strategist right there. Marco Rubio, kind of a case study in the kind of pretzels you could get tied up into <laughs> when you're an elected official, Republican elected official, dealing with Donald Trump, called him all kinds of names, a con artist. He just said he could not be trusted with the nuclear codes, yet in the end, he comes around to Alex and votes for him. Yes, he does, and that was the tightrope I think a lot of Republicans had to walk. But if Marco Rubio is running five to ten points ahead of Donald Trump, I'm demanding a recount. Uh, <laughs> that's, those are not good signs early for uh, Donald Trump in Florida. You know, Trump has been appealing to a different voter than Rubio. Uh, Rubio's about the future. Donald Trump is appealing to the Republican Party's uh, Budweiser voter, older, uh, whiter, less educated, uh, likely to get a college education. Uh, Rubio is a very different candidate, and you can see a different Republican Party that may be younger, more optimistic, and, is doing a little better in Florida tonight. And, and, and Bill, you saw the former real split here between former Republican officials and current yeah. office holders. You had the former president saying, I'm not voting for Donald Trump. Most of the elected officials came around finally, maybe holding their nose to saying, I'm going to vote for him. There's a lot of pressure on them if they're on the ballot in particular, and that was true of Rubio and Toomey of Pennsylvania. But, you know, the secret ballot, George, is a wonderful thing. I, I worked for <laughs> Pat Moynihan in the summer of 76, ages ago, <laughs> in the Democratic primary, which he won, and then the general election. Jimmy Carter and Gerald Ford were on the ballot, and he was the Democratic candidate for Senate in New York. And he, he very much respected Gerald Ford, who had made him UN ambassador. He thought he was a very fine man. I don't think he had a very high view of Carter. And I asked Pat Moynihan, Pat, did you really vote for Carter over Ford? And Moynihan gave me a long lecture on the history of the secret ballot and how, <laughs> and how important a thing that is in the Anglo American tradition. So I wonder about Paul Ryan, Marco Rubio, all these people. Who they who really were... voted for. Exactly. Yeah. Tom Yamas, you wanted in on this? Uh, well, I just want to say we have some news coming in for the first time tonight. We we are hearing frustration from Donald Trump in an interview tonight over the radio on Lindsey Graham not voting for him. Senator Lindsey Graham, he says it's just absolutely insane. And rather than manning up, he goes and he does a thing like that. I think it's terrible on George W. Bush not voting for him. He says, well, I think it's sad. I think it's sad. Donald Trump can't be surprised. He put Lindsey Graham's cell phone number out in front of a microphone and the entire America had it. And with George W. Bush, he savaged him on the war in Iraq and he destroyed his brother, constantly made fun of his brother and his family. He can't be surprised, but for the first time, George, we are hearing the frustration of what's happening tonight. Okay, got to take another quick break. When we come back, Nate Silver's forecast is changing. We'll have that, plus more states. ABC News live coverage of Election Night 2016 will return in a moment. Back night with election night 2016. I want to go straight to Nate Silver from 538, our forecasting guru. And Nate, your forecast is changing right now? A little bit. We have Clinton up to 78%. She was at 72% at the start of the night as more blue states come in predictably to her side. So she goes up even though those states were expected to go her way? Yeah, I mean, you know, what we're seeing is that we have some semblance of a normal election night in America. You're not seeing New Jersey go red or something like that. I mean, obviously, the first major swing state that's called will shift those numbers a whole bunch. And we're on the edge of four or five 
or six, maybe not on the edge, but monitoring four or five or six states right now. But, you know, no major domino has fallen, but still the script is going a little bit more how the Clinton campaign would want it. We don't have any swing states we can call, but two other states have come in right now. The state of South Carolina has gone Republican. Of course, we were saying it is a solid Republican state. The only Democrat to win was Jimmy Carter in 1976. And Tennessee hasn't voted for a Democrat since 1996. That goes to Donald Trump as well. Let me bring in uh, one of Donald Trump's biggest supporters right now, Mayor Rudy Giuliani, former Mayor Rudy Giuliani of New York City. Some good news there. Uh, those last two states for you, uh, Mayor Giuliani. I like what a Washington Post reporter just sent out a bulletin saying he talked to you and said, you just left Trump's apartment, said Trump is watching everything even though I'm telling him not to. <laughs> I meant during the campaign more than tonight. <laughs> I, I, used to, I used to always tell him during the campaign, don't watch television the way George uh, W. never watched television. But uh, he, he loved watching it. So How's he doing right now? I never, I never, I, I ne oh, he's fine. He's in great shape. He, he, uh, he's, uh, he's happy. Uh, obviously, he doesn't, he, he doesn't know how all these numbers are going to turn out any more than we do, but he's pretty happy with the information we've gotten back about where we perform, where we thought we were going to perform. So um, I hate the word cautiously optimistic, but that's probably the best description I can give. I wish I could think of a better one. <laughs> you say he's pretty happy. He's been lashing out at some of his <laughs> opponents in some interviews tonight, including uh, Lindsey Graham. He still seems to have some anger there. Uh, I haven't heard that. I mean, uh, I, I can't imagine what Lindsey has to do with tonight, but. Uh, in any event, this is a, this is a question of we got to find out what the voters are going to do, and nobody ever knows until they actually vote. I, I remember in '04, uh, Kerry was going to win up until nine o'clock at night, and then all of a sudden, boom, it switched. No question about that. Uh, we all remember that much change. more dramatically than this. Do you think? Do you think Donald Trump is at peace with whatever the voters decide tonight? Oh yeah, this is a, a very mature, uh, very accomplished man. Uh, I think obviously whoever whoever wins is going to be extremely happy and feel very satisfied with what they did, and whoever loses is going to be really disappointed because, as you know, George, this is a tremendous effort. Uh, you give your whole life to it, and you also feel tremendous uh, uh, sort of loyalty to the people who work so hard for you. So this is not something that is easy to lose. It's something wonderful to win. I expect that he's going to win it, but I certainly am not a prophet, and I've seen these things switch in a, in a second one way or the other. And if he wins, there's been some talk of maybe you serving with him as attorney general. Are you interested? I'm, right now, I'm interested in getting through tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm superstitious. I'm superstitious about that stuff. I never, I never uh, when I was running, I never talked to anybody about what they might do should I get elected, even though I was the front runner for, for a while. I certainly thought about it in my head. I sort of thought about sometimes you'd have these little dreams of who your secretary of state or your attorney general or secretary of defense would be or head of the CIA. But uh, I never talked to anybody about it. I never would let anybody talk to me about it. Mayor Giuliani, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you very much, George. Always a pleasure. And, John, we're about to take another break. We got some new news from Florida. Well, I just want to say a few minutes ago, there was a 30 vote lead for Hillary Clinton out of 8 million votes cast. Florida is looking incredibly tight. Uh, Trump has just moved ahead ever so slightly, but this is looking incredibly close. And one thing you've got to say for Donald Trump, they are still counting votes in the panhandle. There are still votes to come in in Miami-Dade County. This is going to be a contest at the end that I think is going to go right down to the wire Matthew, in Florida. Matthew, Dad, you worked on the George W. Bush campaign in 2000. A little deja vu? Uh, I, I hope we're not faced with 547 votes, votes in this, but uh, it looks very close. Okay, we are just minutes away from polls closing in another state. Six more electoral votes up for grabs.
are back now at 8.30 here in the East. That is the crowd for Hillary Clinton's campaign at the Javits Center here in Midtown Manhattan. We'll be going to Robin Roberts in just a minute. But as we come back in, let's take another look at the at the map, the scoreboard right now. See where the electoral votes stand. And there you see it right there. Very close so far. 68 for Hillary Clinton. 66 for Donald Trump. The magic number 270. We can now say that Donald Trump has won the state of Alabama. Nine electoral votes. Last time they voted for a Democrat was also Jimmy Carter in 1976. That was the only time since 1964 it goes to Donald Trump and the polls have closed in one more state another home state of Hillary Clinton the state of Arkansas of course her husband was governor there for many years six electoral votes not enough uh, vote in yet to project a winner right there and of course we are following these battleground states these 12 battleground states uh, that are so important in this election and the polls have also closed in the state of Pennsylvania one of the key ones the Keystone State a real cornerstone of Hillary Clinton's strategy one of her closing rallies there last night with Barack Obama and the first lady there as well Bruce Springsteen John Bon Jovi this is so key Donald Trump's campaign hoping this could be one of the states in Hillary Clinton's blue firewall that they could flip. And Deborah Roberts, you're in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, where there is a core of Trump support. That's exactly right, George. In fact, folks are hoping that they will see some seismic activity here from Johnstown tonight. I have to tell you, though, that even though this is in Pennsylvania has traditionally in the last few years tilted Democratic, they're hoping tonight to see a big shift. We're at a watch party for a state legislator, uh, a Republican, Wayne Langerholt, who's hoping to become the first Republican in 30 years to occupy what has traditionally been a Democratic seat. They're also hoping to see this in the presidential race. This is is Trump territory. It's a former steel mill town. People have seen a lot of unemployment, drug problems. They feel like Donald Trump speaks to them. He was here about a week and a half ago, and boy, did they turn out for him, George. Uh, tonight, uh, a lot of the folks are saying they're right solidly behind him. Even some Democrats have told us that they voted for Donald Trump. I spoke with one woman who said she reluctantly voted for him. She held her nose. A number of people said they weren't really thrilled about this candidate, but they feel that he understands their problems, their pain, and their suffering better than Hillary Clinton. And they're hoping that this area might somehow shift this state a little bit more and maybe tip it over to the Trump column. Deb so it could be a long night. A uh, lot of folks here excited, and we'll see what happens. We will. Deborah Roberts in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Of course, Hillary Clinton, Debbie Muir, pinning her hopes on Philadelphia and those all-important Philadelphia suburbs. Yeah, the collar counties, as they call them, around Philadelphia. It was so interesting to listen to the president last night make a direct appeal, saying, I hope that the mom and dads out there will think about their daughters and the respect for their daughters uh, in a direct sort of appeal to, to that moment in the campaign when we heard that audio from that from that bus. We know this number so far in those Philadelphia suburbs, George, that you talked about. Obama won them by seven points. Hillary Clinton is now winning them by 27 points. That was part of their strategy. And in the exit polling, if you even look at what uh, the voters said about Trump and what he said about women on, on that audio tape and some of the other behavior towards women, take a look at this. 71% of Pennsylvania voters said it bothered them a lot. Only 28% uh, said not at all. So it would appear that at least in those counties around Philadelphia, the strategy is And Martha, so you spent a lot of time in those counties as well. The Clinton campaign really pitching directly at women there. Uh, directly at women. I, I, I have to say, Johnstown, where Deborah Roberts is, that's the only place I ask a voter what they thought of having a female president. And, and a man told me there is no way a woman could do that job. But back in the Philadelphia suburbs, they like Hillary Clinton, but they don't like her as much as they used to. I mean, the email thing we were talking about a little bit before, that actually has some resonance in those areas. But again, they like Donald Trump even and, less. And Tom Yamas, the, the Philadelphia suburbs, the only place we saw a speech for Melania Trump. Oh, that is right. He, he hoped outside of Philadelphia, I mean, in those suburbs, he hoped that Melania with that speech could somehow win over female voters because the Trump campaign really was worried with the Access Hollywood tape, with all those comments, and of course, all the women that came forward in the last few weeks accusing Donald Trump of sexual harassment. Melania was supposed to be the secret weapon out there, and she, she gave that one speech, and then we didn't really see her again. And you'll remember, during your interview, he sort of announced to her that she was going to be speaking these final oh. days, and she was surprised <laughs> herself. It was news to her. But let me tell you, we were in Pennsylvania yesterday in Scranton in this dark gymnasium. It was so dark, you could see the steam rising from the lights and the sea of red, Make America Great 
wearing again hats, and that crowd was so angry, they were on fire, and Donald Trump fed off that, and he said one of his most vicious lines about Hillary Clinton, he said, that is the face of failure, that is the face of a failed foreign policy, and that crowd loved it. Okay, I want to get to the next state of New Hampshire in a second, but first of all, we have a Senate race now uh, to call, and we can say that Congressman Todd Young in the state of Indiana, Republican, Congressman Todd Young has defeated Evan Bayh in that state. Evan Bayh, a former two-term senator, former two-term governor, and, and, and Stephanie Cutter, Democratic strategist, I want to come to you on this. This is a real blow. It is. The Democrats' hopes to take the Senate. It is. He was uh, the, Getting Senator Bayh back into office was a key part of taking the majority uh, in the Senate for Democrats. This loss means that that pathway is a little bit tougher. There's still a shot, but it's, it's getting tougher. But you know, this is also makes uh, Missouri a race to watch because uh, Blunt is the Evan By of Missouri. He's the insider, the lobbyist. And he's a Republican in Missouri. And he's a Republican, so they could balance each other right. out. And running against a real a person who's made, Jason Kander, who's made his name on the national scene over the last several months. I mean, Todd Young, the challenger of the House member, ran a classic outside. I mean, the Democrats recruited Evan By. Chuck Schumer did it personally, the, who hopes to be Senate Majority Leader. Uh, and they thought this was great, get a two-term governor and two-term senator back. They recruited a de facto incumbent and allowed the Republican to run the kind of challenger race for a Republican seat. And Young was behind and gained, I don't know, 15 points in the last three weeks of that Evan race. Evan By got hit for being a lobbyist, got hit for staying in a hotel room instead of his apartment whenever he would go back right. to Indiana. A real blow for the Democrats right there. Worked on the presidential level. <laughs> no, it will not. <laughs> and, and look, this, at one point, when Biden got into the race, he had a 35-point lead. George, I mean, this was a, this was a, gr a great recruit for Democrats, or so they thought. Uh, but you know, as you said, I mean, he did two terms Congress, two terms Senate, two terms Governor, yeah. also a lot of times a lobbyist. By the way, we have other big news. ABC News can project that Republicans are going to retain control of the House right there. Democrats are not going to be able to pick up enough seats to get control of the House. Not a big surprise. Not a big surprise, but this means that Paul Ryan will be the man, we think. I mean, the, the, the challenge now is Paul Ryan is Speaker of the House. Uh, he supported Donald Trump but refused to campaign with him. A lot of anger on the part of, of people who supported Trump. And he will face a challenge to his speakership. He has control of the Congress. Republicans have control. But there will be a lot of Republicans who, in the House who are saying that Paul Ryan should pay a price for not more fully And I want to bring Trump. this to both Cokie and Charlie. You both covered uh, <laughs> the House. This is going to be a real challenge both for Paul Ryan and whoever the next president is. Absolutely. Paul Ryan has been saying over the last couple of days, oh, this is a lot of hype. I'm fine for Speaker. Everybody's for me. I've been out in all their districts campaigning for them. And that does count for a lot, as you well know, Charlie. But, uh, but he's got a whole caucus that is very much opposed to him. And he's got to placate them at the same time that he'll be under pressure if there's a Democratic president to work with her. And so it's going to be a lot of tugging on him uh, to come. And then he's got to factor in as well, Charlie Gibson, does he ever want to be president of the United States and run? And that speaker's not the place to do it from. Are, are you asking is yeah. there a question about whether he wants to be president of the United States? <laughs> yeah, I can answer that one with one word, too. Um, but, but he has a devilish problem. And, and basically, he tried to finesse the Trump problem uh, as to whether he would support right. Donald Trump or not by simply going out and saying, I care about my members. I'm going to go out and do everything I can for them. He really worried about his own constituency in the House. But it's a devilishly difficult group to manage, as John Boehner learned um, uh, when he was Speaker of the House. So Ryan's problems aren't going to go away. Especially if, even if he retains control, if he has a smaller majority right there. And Tom Yamas, you know, it'll be one challenge to work with Hillary Clinton, another challenge to work with Donald Trump. There is no question that Donald Trump was irritated throughout this campaign by Paul Ryan. George, it was the strangest political relationship. It was almost like a, a love affair in junior high. It was like, did they break up? Are they back together? Did they break up? Are they back together? Two weeks ago, I interviewed Donald Trump, and I asked him what he thought about Paul Ryan, and he said one of the reasons why he wasn't supporting him was because he thought Paul Ryan wanted to run for president. Republicans were so upset over that. Ryan's Priebus, who's from Wisconsin, Paul Ryan State, tried so hard to mend that relationship, and just in the closing days, the Trump campaign deciding to pull out of Wisconsin. They didn't go there in those final days, and I can't remember, and John Carl can maybe help me out here, did they ever appear together in public? <laughs> they, they never appeared on stage together, not once. This is, and it's an unbelievable relationship because Trump was, you know, had Ryan at his convention. 
Ryan was technically the chair of the, the, chair of the convention, and they didn't appear together. Even when they met in Washington, you, did, you only saw the shot of Trump yeah, going in. The, they never the even showed each other together. Um, but I, I tell you, Ryan will face a serious challenge George, to his speakership. George, I, one of the things that we're seeing tonight, which three big check marks to be checked tonight in the politics in Washington. The Republicans just made a big check mark. They retained the House of Representatives. They are starting to look like they just won a seat in Indiana that nobody expected them to win in the course of this. That's beginning to see where it goes. So the idea that the Republican Party was gone, there was an anchor on it, they went in. They retained most of the governorships. They now retain the House, and we're waiting to hear on the president and the Senate. So this is a country still governed by two political parties. Two political parties. And Mary Bruce is in Janesville, Wisconsin, the home of the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. Mary, what's happening there? You know, George, Paul Ryan is a bit superstitious when it comes to election days. He has a ritual. He goes hunting. He did that today. He's hoping that that good luck will carry over, and he is going to need it. Regardless of what happens tonight with the presidential election, Paul Ryan's future is at stake here. His political future is on the line. If Donald Trump does not win, if Hillary Clinton does, Paul Ryan could face huge, tremendous challenges regardless. He is going to be the most powerful Republican standing in, in the House if Hillary Clinton does, in fact, win. He could be an instant 2020 contender, and that means that he's going to have to find some kind of way to show that Republicans in Congress can get something done while also dealing with a lot of the pushback that he could be getting from members of his own party who could point a finger at him if Donald Trump loses And tonight. I know you'll be covering the House for us, Mary Bruce. Thanks very much. I want to go back to the battleground board right now, and one of the key states right there is the state of New Hampshire. Polls have closed in the state of New Hampshire as well. We don't have enough votes in yet to project a win right there but John Carl this is a small state only four electoral votes but on this electoral map in this year it packs a powerful punch absolutely it's another one of those states that's on Donald Trump's path to getting exactly 270 electoral votes he spent a lot of time there New Hampshire is really in many ways the state that gave us Donald Trump Republican nominee because remember he lost Iowa came in second and then came in and had that huge victory in New Hampshire which propelled him into South Carolina and onto the nomination uh, but he has been largely behind in the public polls in New Hampshire almost throughout the course of this campaign uh, since the convention so this is a tough state for him it was a key state for them in the debate that you two moderated in New Hampshire the Republican debate such a key moment in that campaign because that was the debate where Marco Rubio took it on the yeah. chin from Chris Christie he was rising in this race before that Took happened. Took it on the chin. Yeah. He, I'll never forget he punched it. himself in the chin. Watching him did. repeat himself, it was actually repeating his argument against President Obama. And, and we remember How well. How many times was it? It, it was three times, yeah, three times. Three times. And as a moderator, you let him do it with, and let the voters notice it themselves. But I'll tell you who else noticed was Governor Chris Christie, who was at one of the other podiums across the stage. And as he was repeating himself again, I look over at Christie and he, and he looks at me. He's like, I'm ready. I'm ready on this one. <laughs> I said, you know, I got I'm this. not in the game there with you. He goes again. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. He, brought up, he brought up Governor Christie's name. So he invoked his name. So we went to the governor next. That was because pivotal. He wanted that it. Was the, the, other reason, pivotal night. the other reason New Hampshire is so important, I want to bring this to Cecilia Vega as well. We say it, if, if, if Hillary Clinton can hold on to the state of New Hampshire, then Donald Trump is almost certainly going to have to flip one of those other big blue states right across the top of the Midwest. Absolutely. And you've seen her concentrate on New Hampshire a lot recently. In fact, she had a rally there not too long ago with Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren. This is Bernie Sanders' backyard. You go back to that primary, that hard-fought primary that she lost in that state, and now she is trying to turn it to her camp. She is. This is one of the states where we saw her reach out to millennial voters, where she really had, a, a, she really struggled with that, so it'll be interesting to see how this works out for her tonight. The Clinton camp is watching the state closely. Meantime, we have another some more Senate news right now. It's coming from the state of Illinois, and this is a pickup for the Democrats. Congressman Tammy Duckworth, a veteran uh, who uh, is, is being has defeated Senator Mark Kirk. He was seeking a second term. You see it right there. Uh, Tammy Duckworth, that is a pickup for the Democrats. They need four if, if Hillary Clinton wins the White House to control the Senate, five if she doesn't. That is the first pickup there uh, for the Senate Democrats and uh, Stephanie Cutter that was one that was long expected 
Long expected. She she has been running very strong there for some time against Mark Kirk, incumbent senator. Um, and, and recently, they've had some explosions over racial comments that he's made. Um, so she really tied up the race over the past couple of weeks. The probability her, of her winning was only going up. Okay, so the Democrats plus one right now. And Jen, let's, while we're here, let's go back to the state of Florida and let's see where the vote stands right now because that state is so important. How much do we have in? Where is it coming from? Well, uh, it is close. 48% Clinton, 49% Trump. Trump has been gaining here. 91% of the precincts reporting. But zoom in here a little bit. If you want to see one story to tell you about Trump's strength right now in Florida, it's the county of Volusia. Volusia County right now, take a look at this. Trump has a huge lead. This is a county that, that, that Romney won, but barely won. He had about 111,000 votes in 2012. And look at this. He's got almost 180. Oh, I'm in Brevard. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the board. There it is. If you look, he's got 140,000 votes uh, in, in Volusia County, 30,000 more votes docked than, than Mitt Romney in 2012. So Florida, we still have uh, you know, about 10% of the state to count. This is, I think, going to be very close. Look back at Miami-Dade County. Again, this is the big, overwhelmingly uh, Democratic, largely Hispanic county. Uh, and we have 91% reporting, so we'll, we'll have a significant and, and, and what is the vote with 91% in there? What, what is the vote gap? Uh, the vote gap is almost 30 points. So she is doing better in Miami-Dade than Barack Obama did. And in fact, if you looked at our exit polls, she is outperforming Barack Obama among Hispanic voters statewide. She's at 29% lead among Hispanic voters in the state of Florida. Obama won Hispanic voters by 21%. So she is significantly doing significantly better than Obama did among Hispanics in Florida. They have to take another quick break. More results coming in. We'll be right back. Back live in Times Square after this. Back now, election night 2016. Let's take a look at where things stand. Put up the scoreboard of the electoral votes won by each of the candidates right now. 68 for Hillary Clinton, 66 for Donald Trump. Couldn't be closer right now. Let's take a look also at those battleground states, the 12 battleground states we are following most closely. These are the ones that are going to decide this election. Let's pull up one of the key ones. State of Ohio, John Carl, what are we seeing? Well, this is a, a, a battleground that Trump had been winning in virtually every public poll coming into this election. But if you look at this right now, there's only about a third of the state that's been voted, but Hillary Clinton has a narrow lead, and there are signs of trouble for Donald Trump. Take, for instance, Delaware County. Delaware County, which is right above Columbus. This is a county that Mitt Romney won by more than 20 points. And if you look at it right now, Donald Trump has barely a one-point lead in Delaware County. As you said, only about a third of the vote in. But Matthew Dowd, this is key as well, because as Donald Trump continues to do, hang in there in Florida, maybe ekes out a win in Florida. If Hillary Clinton wins in Ohio, completely cancels it out. Well, yeah, Donald Trump's map has to be Florida and has to be Ohio and has to be North Carolina in this. But as you say, Donald Trump, I mean, the, what's fascinating to me is that she's running up in their margins in all the places that she needed to in Florida and other places, and he's running up his margins in all the places he needed to. So that's why we're seeing this such a competitive race. Alex Castellanos, you've done a lot of races in Florida. A lot of races, and if you look at the northern counties, non-urban areas, there seems to be a bit of a Trump wave. Those counties are dramatically overperforming for Trump. If that's true in other places like Ohio and North Carolina, we ought to keep an eye on some of these rural counties because they may help balance the scales. So you've got Trump, Kirsten Sultan Sanderson, Trump overperforming up in the north, Clinton overperforming down in the south. So then what happens in the I-4 corridor? It's my home county, Orange County, I've been watching. It's a county that Barack Obama won by 19 points last time around with 19, 99% of uh, precincts in. I'm showing Donald Trump losing it by about 24 points. So doing worse in some of these I-4 corridor counties. Now bear in mind, what's interesting about Orange is that you have a real big influx of folks coming from Puerto Rico. These are folks who are U.S. citizens. They can vote. The Latino population in Florida is not just about the Cuban vote in Miami-Dade. It's becoming more diverse, and this is a big reason why this central Florida may be tougher for Donald Trump this time and, around. And, 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 and Bill Crystal, the Cuban vote is also changing in Florida. 
Yeah. Right, it is the younger generation. Yes, the younger generation is different from Alex's generation, which is different from Alex's parents' generation. But you know, we mentioned that Trump's overperforming in the North and Hillary Clinton in the South. The electorate is overperforming. It looks to me, just looking at some raw numbers here, that we're going to have a massive turnout in at least the competitive battleground states and maybe across the country. So for all the talk about how unfavorably viewed they both were, it's going to be a low turnout election. We might have the most Americans voting ever, I suspect. Stephanie Cutter, you spent a lot of nights sweating out Florida results. What are you looking at right now? <laughs> uh, it looks like we're going to be sweating it out again. Um, I think it's going to be very close. There's still a good sizable vote out uh, in the Miami-Dade area, which could bring her over the top. I also think in the I-4 corridor, it's an uh, increase in Latino votes, Puerto Ricans, but uh, it, this is an area where in the suburbs and the exurbs, we can see uh, the white college-educated women come out in large droves for her, too. That's part of the story in Florida that we haven't yet seen yet. Okay, I want to go back to the Javis Center. Robin Roberts uh, there with Brian Fallon from the Clinton campaign. Yes, the press secretary for Hillary Clinton. You've been very patient standing here with us, watching intently, listening intently. What are you hearing and what are you? how are you feeling about Florida right now? Well, a state like Florida is important, but it's important to also keep it in perspective. There is a large portion of the vote still out in southern Florida. We're looking at counties like Miami-Dade and Broward, where you're seeing a record set a couple hours before the polls even close. Uh, we're outperforming President Obama in many key counties in Florida. Uh, and I think that if we do win Florida, the story of it will be the surge that you've seen in the Latino vote. And to the point that was just made on the panel, we have had a very targeted strategy recognizing that the Latino vote is not a monolith. Uh, and we have communicated in very targeted ways to the Puerto Rican community, the, uh, the Cuban community in Florida, and then to the Mexican community and the Latino vote when you look at a state like Nevada. And so we've taken a very strategic approach. I think that that could make the difference. But while Florida is important in terms of if Donald Trump loses it, it's very hard to see how he could get to do 70. It's not going to be decisive for him just if he wins Florida. He's going to have to run the table, not just win Florida, win Ohio, win North Carolina, and then pull off either a Michigan or a Pennsylvania. And right now, those latter two states, Michigan and Pennsylvania, we feel very good about. You made a lot of mention of the glass ceiling, but you want to talk about quickly about the stage. The stage is symbolic, too. It's cut out in the shape of the full United States map, and there's a reason for that. It's because Hillary Clinton tonight, when she speaks, she's going to talk about how she wants to be president for everybody, not just those that voted for her. It's going to be important to bring the nation together. All right, Brian Fallon, thank you very much. We'll have more coverage coming up. Back live in Times Square, here again, George Stephanopoulos. It is 9 p.m. here on the East Coast. The polls have just closed in 14 more states. Let's put up the scoreboard right now. Take a look at where things stand right there. Donald Trump with 123 electoral votes. Hillary Clinton with 97. Of course, 270 is what you need to win. We are paying so much attention right now to those battleground states, especially that state of Florida. Let's take a look at where the vote stands in Florida right now. There you see it. Just about 100,000 some votes separate Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Donald Trump in the lead, 49 to 48. And Rebecca Jarvis, our senior business correspondent, is here. You've seen an interesting development as this news comes in. Yes, George, with those polls so close in Florida right now, we're actually seeing a sell-off. Okay, she, we, I, Rebecca's microphone went off. You're saying you're seeing a sell-off in the Mexican peso, about 1%. Okay, uh, Rebecca, Rebecca, we'll come back to you. 1% drop in the Mexican peso, and John Carl, those votes. So those are so close right now. It's unbelievably tight, and Trump has got a lead over 100,000 votes, well over 100,000 votes. But I see reasons here to think that Hillary Clinton will bounce back in Florida, and here's why. I've mentioned Miami-Dade County, of course, which is, which is so important. There's still vote coming in there, but 93% of precincts uh, uh, reporting. But look right north of Miami-Dade in Broward County. This is a county that went overwhelmingly for Barack Obama in 2012 and 2008. Only 16% of precincts are reporting. There are a lot of Hillary that Clinton votes left in Broward County. Big catch right there. Let's also take a look at the state of North Carolina. It is a close state as well. Let's put up that board right now, see what's happening there in North Carolina. 49-49, just about 4,000 votes separate Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump and Byron Pitts, another one of these changing states. 
Oh, George, remember earlier uh, Jonathan was talking about the Raleigh-Durham area? Well, the halfway point between Raleigh-Durham is a town called Apex, where my family's from, the Apex of Good Living. In 2000, <laughs> Apex had about 20,000 residents. It was 90% white. Today, Apex, a town of 42,000. The Hispanic population is up 300%. The black population of 80%. The uh, Asian Pacific population up 600%. So this is no longer Jesse Helms' North Carolina. Oh, also, one final point and how important the ground game is in North Carolina. Donald Trump had three offices in North Carolina. Hillary Clinton had 33. Okay, Byron Pitts, thanks very much. A lot of results coming in right now. Let's go through them. Starting out with the state of Texas, 38 electoral votes, one of the biggest prizes on the board, and Donald Trump, the projected winner in the state of Texas. Matthew Dowd, that is your home state. Democrats hope that state is changing as more Latinos come into that state, but not quite yet. No, there was a huge increase in the Latino vote, and it actually seemed to be in single digits before that Comey announcement two, 10 days ago or two weeks ago. But it seems to have trended back. I think what you're going to see is a, a less of a margin than a typical Republican gets there. Mitt Romney won it by 17, 18 points. You'll see less of a margin, but it's still a red state. Another Republican state, the state of Kansas, six ele electoral votes. Republicans dominate in that state, except for 1964. State has voted Republican every election since 1940. It goes again to the Republicans, Donald Trump. State of Nebraska, five electoral votes. But right now, Donald Trump is the projected winner of only four of them. John Carl explain again, Nebraska, <laughs> much like Maine. Uh, Nebraska is the other state that splits its vote. The second congressional district, just like it's in Maine, is one that voted for Barack. Barack Obama in 2008 had earned the nickname Obamaha because it's basically Omaha and the surrounding areas, and it's a place that the Clinton team is very helpful. Yeah, the Clinton team spent some money, did, did pay some attention to Omaha, Cecilia. Oh, surprisingly so, exactly. And they're paying attention not just to Omaha, it's states that they never paid attention to before. Arizona. I mean, who would have ever thought we'd be talking about Arizona on a night like tonight? You mentioned Texas. They had hopes there. They were even looking at Utah, George. This map has changed for them. They've got their. their their, their sights set high. We they, shall see. They had hoped to change, Arizona but we're seeing a lot of red right there right now. South Dakota also in right now. Three electoral votes in the state of South Dakota. That is going to go Republican as well. Only voted for Democrats in four presidential elections in state history, the last time in 1964. North Dakota, conservative state, not even competitive this year. Their three electoral votes go to Donald Trump as well. And Wyoming. Three electoral votes, of course, that's the home of former Vice President Dick Cheney. That goes to Donald Trump as well. And let's put up the map right now, because I want to show right up the middle of the country right now, straight down the middle, you have a line of red uh, right there for Donald Trump, also across the south. Fewer states there for Hillary Clinton, blue in the east, including one we see right now, and that is the state of New York, another one of Donald Trump's home states, Hillary Clinton's home state now as well. 29 electoral votes. It goes to Hillary Clinton, voted Democrat in every election since 1984. Tom, Tom Yamas, I got to bring you in on this because at the beginning of the general election campaign, Donald Trump kept talking about winning his home state. Oh, he made a bold prediction. He said he was going to win New York. He felt the people there would vote for Donald Trump. Uh, the only campaigning he did in New York essentially was from Trump Tower and events in and around Manhattan, of course, but that clearly did not break his way. We've just gotten word that Governor Mike Pence is on his way to Trump Tower. He's probably already there. And we bet, if anything, they're watching Florida, Florida, Florida as close as possible right now, George. Florida, so close right now. A lot a lot of states coming in right now that we can't project yet, including the state of Louisiana. Eight electoral votes, not enough votes coming in yet for us to project. New Mexico, five ele electoral votes. The Democrats hoping for a win there, part of their solid blue wall. Before 2008, it was a swing state. Uh, voted for Bush in 2004, Gore in 2000. The Democrats had been counting on it. And Donald Trump had a real feud there with the Republican governor, Susanna Martinez. Uh, Minnesota, 10 electoral votes. Not enough uh, data to coming in yet to project that. One and that was a state uh, that Donald Trump made a late play for. Uh, one of the things we saw, Tom, they thought he was going to go to Wisconsin over the final weekend. Trump team said they saw some polls, went to Minnesota instead. Trump himself says he saw a promising poll, and that's why they decided to put together a last minute rally in Minneapolis. But we will say this it was one of his biggest rallies in the final days. It was at an airport hangar. Trump Force One pulled up, people were going wild, and it was during a Vikings game, but people still showed out for Donald Trump. We'll see how it turns tonight. Though. But that is a solid blue state going yeah. Democrat every single election since 1976. We're saying Mitt Romney had a big rally in Minnesota yeah. in the final days of the 2012 campaign and lost the state big. So it's, uh, you know, false hopes. It's, it's a tough state for... Uh, can't call it yet, but it is a tough state uh, for, for Republicans. But let's go back to these battlegrounds right now. Florida... 
Florida, Florida, Florida. So I mentioned at the very beginning, George, that the state that's been the bellwether is Hillsborough County. Hillsborough County, no Republican has won Florida without winning Hillsborough County since Calvin Coolidge. He had a good campaign, good ground game. But take a look right here. Hillsborough County, I'll circle it right here by Tampa, and Hillary Clinton has a big lead in Hillsborough County. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to continue to be a bellwether, but it's always been a bellwether. Overall, in the state of Florida, the count is incredibly tight. It's, uh, it's still Donald Trump with a slight lead, but as I mentioned, a lot of Democratic votes to be still be counted in Broward County. Polls have just closed in some other battleground states as well, including the state of Michigan. 16 electoral votes. It's voted Democrat in the last six elections, voted for Bush in 1988. Matthew Dowd, that's one of your home states as well, even though you live in, in, in Texas right now. And Michigan has also been one of those states, like Pennsylvania, that Republicans towards the end think this is one we can get. Well, when they looked at the limited nature of the map for Donald Trump and the places that he could only win this election, we, as we've been talking all night, he needed to flip a, flip a blue state. He experimented in, in Wisconsin. They thought about Pennsylvania. Then they finally, it looked like, settled on Michigan. And the Clinton folks got nervous about it, sent a whole bunch of... Hillary went there, and on the last days, she sent a whole bunch of surrogates there. I mean, it is a state that's very divided. Detroit will, will, will vote overwhelmingly for Hillary Clinton and the rest of the state, rural areas of the state, will vote overwhelmingly for Donald Trump. And David Curley is in Detroit. What are you seeing, David? Well, exactly what Matthew's talking about is that the Trump campaign believes it's all about turnout. They were hoping they could get people out in these rural areas, and that was the one way that he might be able to crack this blue wall. But according to the exit polls, and the Trump campaign was hoping that the African-American vote would be lower, it was only 2% lower according to these exit polls. And also, we're finding out that two out of the 10 voters were white educated women, and Clinton is winning them by 10 points. Not a lot of votes counted here so far, but Hillary Clinton has the lead at this hour. Okay, David Curley, thanks very much. David Muir, job's always such a big issue in that upper Midwest. Huge issue, and that was what Donald Trump tried to capitalize on in, in trying to make Michigan the blue state that he was going to turn. If you take a look here, uh, voters were asked what your job situation was versus four years ago. 39% said better today, 36 about the same. Uh, 25 said uh, worse today, but it was very interesting. The Clinton campaign will say they were there uh, these final days sending the president and Hillary Clinton in the last 24 hours because they wanted to do those early voting states first, that they back-ended uh, the states like Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, Michigan. What we what we couldn't find out in the end was were they truly worried about Michigan in the final days, um, and and perhaps Trump's campaign, if they're not able to pull off Michigan, will wish they had a better ground game there all along. Right, because if the Democrats can hold Michigan and Wisconsin and Minnesota straight across with Pennsylvania, very very tough map for Donald Trump, even if he wins the state of Florida. We have another call right now. We can say ABC News can project that Donald Trump will win the state of Arkansas. Six electoral votes there, of course, as we said, Hillary Clinton was the first lady of Arkansas for many years, but that has been a Republican state in part because of the trend throughout the South. Uh, Democrats losing those working class whites and that state is going to go again to Donald Trump and it's six electoral votes. When we go back to the battlegrounds right now in the upper Midwest, go move over to Wisconsin. Uh, that's got 10 electoral votes. Tough state uh, for Donald Trump in the primaries. He lost that state to Ted Cruz in the primary. We don't have enough votes yet uh, to bring that, to, to call that uh, right now. And, and Bill Crystal, this is also a state where the conservatives never warmed uh, to Donald Trump, even though Ryan's previously RNC chair is from Wisconsin. Paul Ryan there couldn't support him, and strong talk radio voices there just didn't like him. Right. I mean, Wisconsin, I don't know what it is about the upper Midwest. It's the Mormons in Utah and the, and the, and the Midwesterners in Wisconsin who resisted Trump the most among <laughs> conservatives, actually. Paul Ryan state, obviously. And since we're talking about Wisconsin, Paul Ryan, I mean, on the one hand, he'll be under great pressure, as people said earlier, uh, from within his conference. On the other hand, if Republicans hold the House, don't win the presidency, and maybe lose the Senate, Paul Ryan's the one guy who came through, right? He held his, he said he wanted, I mean, people like me criticized him for being too nice to Trump and kind of being too accommodating, but he said, I want to do what will preserve the majority. If he preserves the majority, Paul Ryan has a claim to be the most valuable Republican of the night, I think. And another state has come in now for Hillary Clinton. That is the state of Connecticut. Seven electoral votes. Hillary Clinton is going to win those uh, seven electoral votes right now pretty handily in the state of Connecticut. So now 104 electoral votes for Hillary Clinton, 129 for Donald Trump on the way to 270. We want to drill down there now on another battleground state that is closed, and this is the state of Colorado. Nine electoral votes out in the West. Uh, the whole state votes uh, by mail. Uh, voted Democrat in 2008 and 2012. And uh, Matthew Dowd, Colorado, uh, 
When strategists look at Colorado, they look at Virginia and Colorado as a pair. The states tend to go the same way. Yeah, and I think what we're going to see tonight, they're going to go in the same way. We see Virginia's close. I think Colorado is going to be close in this. And again, another state where the divisions within the state, Denver, the city of Denver and the suburbs, are very different from the rest of the state. And Boulder, obviously, is a very Democratic area of the state. But we're seeing it just like places like Florida, Michigan, other states, is this geographic pots of votes that each side is getting and turning out. They're turning out another state, uh, Battleground State, we're keeping an eye on right next door, the state of Arizona with its 11 electoral votes. Uh, the Clinton team went in there late, sent Michelle Obama there as well, spent some money at the end, even though it has been Cecilia Vega's solid red state. Yeah, this is one of these anomalies on the map for Hillary Clinton. A Democrat hasn't won there in 20 years, but you were mentioning Colorado, same thing there. They were really hoping that the Latino vote would come out in both Arizona and Colorado. Colorado is one of these states that they thought they had locked in pretty early on, and then they kind of backed away and just went back and recently towards the end of the campaign and started pouring some more ad money in there because they started to get nervous. Arizona, they think they have this locked in going in, so we shall see. They think they had Arizona locked in. They don't need Arizona, but they, they had, that, would be, that would be big news right there. Uh, they would love the state of Florida. We're going to stay on the state of Florida because it is so close right now. What do you see in John Carl? Florida still remains unbelievably tight. I was going to give you, can I give you one on Colorado since sure. I'm right here? Uh, I mean, I, uh, th this is the... Jefferson County, Colorado. This is a key county, a swing county in Colorado, western uh, uh, Denver suburbs, and she is outperforming Donald Trump. I mean, uh, outperforming uh, Barack Obama pretty handily. So that's a good sign for her. But if you want to go back out to the uh, to, to the state of Florida, we are still. Look at this. 48 49 trump still has that lead but let's check into those counties uh outside of uh, of miami again broward county overwhelmingly democratic county now 48 percent reporting so there still is more than half the vote to be counted in a county that went overwhelmingly for barack obama and is going overwhelmingly for hillary clinton so you're gonna have this race matthew doubt at the end in florida you're gonna have the panhandle versus broward county getting in those last several votes yeah and i think it's going to come down to a few thousand votes of florida's going to shift we saw that in a lot of the polls. Florida was one of those pivot states, just like North Carolina was a pivot state and Ohio was a pivot state. All the polls, there were some polls that had Donald Trump ahead, some polls that had Hillary Clinton slightly ahead, but they were all within a point. And it looks like Florida is going to be within a point. Another quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to ABC News coverage of Election Night 2016. Here again, George Stephanopoulos. And we are back now here in Times Square. Let's take another look at where the map stands right now. The Electoral College count, you see it there, 104 electoral votes for Hillary Clinton, 129 for Donald Trump, the magic number 270. Let me check back in with Amy Roback, who's about 10 blocks north here at the New York Hilton. That is the Trump headquarters tonight. That's right, Georgia. We are seeing a very different scene here than we were just about 30 minutes ago. There is a lot of cheering, a lot of energy in this room as those results start to come in. Anytime anyone starts talking about Florida, you hear the crowd here erupt with cheers, chanting USA, USA. I'm seeing smiles. I'm seeing laughter. That is something I was not seeing an hour ago. So you can just feel the energy in this room increasing as people are now becoming a lot more hopeful than it seems they were earlier in the evening, George. And Matthew Dowd, if he's in the game in Florida. I want to bring this question to you and then have John Carl start to pull up some Electoral College maps, possibilities right here. He's in the game. Donald Trump is in the game if he can pull out that state of Florida. Yes, he's definitely in the game. It was going to be basically if she won Florida, it's slam dunk. There's really no path for him. Florida is the pillar of the game that he needs to keep running and then he needs to pick up. If picks up Florida, he needs to pick up uh, North Carolina. And then he starts needing to pick up across the country. Yeah. But Florida is the him. first one. Let, let's illustrate not, that now. But with, not Hillary Clinton. Not, not pivotal. Let's illustrate that right now with, with Donald Trump. Show the states that he's got to win to, to put himself in contention as we go into this night or later in the night. Well, if you look at it, it's basically 12 battleground states we've been looking at. And if you look at the ones that going into today, Hillary Clinton had a lead. As you can see, she's already got over 270. So what Trump has to do is to win all the ones that we had as toss-ups. He has to win Florida. He has to win North Carolina. He has to win Ohio, win New Hampshire, and win Arizona. And then he needs to find a way to pick off one of those 
uh, traditionally blue states. It could be Nevada. If he does Nevada, he gets there as long as he also wins that one congressional district we mentioned up in Maine. So what we're going to be doing all night long as we watch Florida, as we watch North Carolina, those two states that are so close now between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, if he manages to win those two states, then we have to start to focus on those blue states, those Midwestern blue states up in the north. He's got to find something there to pick off. Yeah, if he's not going to win in Nevada, if he's not going to win in New Hampshire, he has to get one of the biggies. He has to find a way to win. I think the one that they are most focused on, they feel the most potential, is, as you mentioned, the state of Michigan. It's also a state, by the way, that Democrats feel good about but we're the most nervous if you could say about any of those you know industrial Midwest states and David you picked up one of the signs uh, for why Donald Trump is sort of hanging in there in Florida yeah if Donald Trump wins in Florida you can bet that the Clinton campaign is gonna look at women voters in Florida take a look at this we zero in on the exit polls and and Clinton is getting 51 percent of female voters in Florida to Trump's 44 and I pointed out only because so far the exit polls show her doing much better with women in Michigan New Hampshire Ohio Wisconsin Georgia Colorado North Carolina and Pennsylvania where she's doing the best among women but in Florida of all the battlegrounds is where she's uh, performing um, at this level uh, she's surpassing this level in every other battleground. Stephanie Cutter, uh, John Carl mentioned there, 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 there was some sign of a little bit of nervousness in the Democratic camp in the state of Michigan. Take us through those states in the, in, in, the, in the Midwest. Which ones are they worried about? Which ones could show some weakness? Well I think in Michigan they're, they're, uh, they do think it's going to be much closer than 2012. They I think white college educated women um, like much of the Midwest will bring them over the top. It looks like the African-American vote is, is down a little bit in Michigan uh, and the rural vote is is significantly higher than it was in 2012. So it's going to be very tight. In Ohio, uh, much of their early vote was very good in Ohio. They were outperforming where President Obama was. Uh, there are some bellwether counties in Ohio that we always look for. They're not in yet. Uh, much, of, much of it surrounds suburban uh, areas outside of Cleveland and Cincinnati. Um, and in Pennsylvania, they feel very good about Pennsylvania um, uh, from all signs. Uh, traditional leaning Dem uh, Republican counties outside of Philadelphia are going for her in very strong ways. That's a very strong sign for what's going to happen across the state. Alex, 15 seconds. But Florida may be telling us something about the future in other states. Uh, Hillary Clinton's doing well in the I-4 corridor. That may mean she'll do well in Colorado. Trump is doing well in North Florida. Mm -hmm. The vote that David Muir called the left behind voter, Michigan. Yeah. Now coming up, we're live as millions vote across the country. Ten states left to go, including that crucial battleground of Nevada. We'll be right back. back now 930 in the east election 2016 let's take a look at where things stand right now 104 electoral votes for Hillary Clinton 129 for Donald Trump it takes 270 to win focusing most on those 12 battleground states we've been keeping an eye on all night long and let's go right to John Carl with the latest on Florida well Florida is as tight as it has been George take a look at this Donald Trump still has a lead still has a significant lead but again as I mentioned before, the Miami area, specifically the county just above Miami, Broward County, this is an overwhelmingly Democratic county. More than a third of the vote is still outstanding. Donald Trump can still, uh, I mean, Hillary Clinton can still harvest enough votes in Broward County. How much county. of the overall vote is in so far? Uh, the overall vote is about 90%. Let's take a look overall. Ninety-four percent of the of the vote in Florida is 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 in. And you have a little more than a hundred thousand vote lead now for Donald Trump. We're also keeping a close eye on the state of North Carolina. Let's pull up North Carolina right now. See where that stands. There it is, right there. Forty-nine for Donald Trump. He got about a sixty thousand vote vote lead. Matthew Dowd over Hillary Clinton there in North Carolina. Yeah, and I mean, this is <laughs> we're seeing multiple multiple states are gonna go down to the wire and that we may not even be decided by this evening. Uh, Florida, North Carolina, Ohio, uh, it's going to be a close race. Those are two states that Donald Trump must win. One state that, that Hillary Clinton is counting on, the state of New Hampshire, up in the north, let's pull that up. 
right now. There you see it, Donald Trump ahead there as well, much closer. There's about 78,000 to about 76,000 there in the state of New Hampshire. And, and New Hampshire is, uh, you know, a state that uh, is critical to one of Donald Trump's path and George incredibly close. Incredibly close right now. Another one that is close, state of Michigan. Uh, blue state of Michigan, who, as we said, a lot of attention there in the end. And Donald Trump also ahead right there right now. Uh, about 30,000 votes there over Hillary Clinton and uh, Cecilia Vega. This has to be unnerving the Clinton camp just a little bit. Yeah, they were a little uncertain about Michigan going in. They uh, th There was sort of maybe a head fake going on. They thought that they had this in the bag initially, and then they got really nervous and went back to Michigan just late last week. Hillary Clinton paid a trip there. Uh, they sent former President Bill Clinton there, uh, uh, and and President Obama was there. This is a state they want to win. They're not 100% sure about it. Um, you know, and the issue of trade has come up a lot for Hillary Clinton in the course of this race, especially in the primaries with Bernie Sanders and her issue on TPP and her flip-flop, as he would say, on that. Uh, and really, it's been used to illustrate what her opponents would say has been uh, inconsistencies in, in, in Hillary Clinton's willingness to say anything in their perspective to get elected. And this is something that has hammered her hard over the course of this race. Okay, we have another projection to make right now. Another part of the solid red South has come in for Donald Trump. That is the state of Louisiana. Eight electoral votes, part of the Republican Southern base that has come in for Donald Trump. So you're seeing the, the, the map fill in red there across the South and right down the middle of the country. Tom Yums, what are you hearing from the Trump camp? Well, right now we're hearing from inside the campaign. They are very buoyant right now. They are happy about what they're seeing. In fact, there's a tweet that just went out. Eric Trump has tweeted out a picture of his dad with Governor Mike Pence inside of Trump headquarters there in their war room, as they're calling it, as they watch returns come in. They're saying they're very excited right now. They like what they're seeing so far from the map and the states they have won so far. We'll see where it goes from here. See where it goes from here. But, you know, right now this could be, as you were saying, Matthew Dowd, a very, very long night. It could be a really long night. We're seeing this and we're seeing Donald Trump overperform in a lot of places that people didn't think people had questions about. He'd get the enthusiasm enough. But he is in many places he's setting records in rural and exurban counties in almost every single state. Alex Castellanos. Amazing story. You know, the missing Trump voter that we've all been uh, wondering about. Well, they've shown up. We've found him. He's in rural America. They're out there voting at intense levels. And that may mean that he can hang on in North Carolina and maybe in Michigan. If he can do that and keep Arizona, that would get Trump to 275. Martha and, and, you know, George, they're talking about this enthusiasm. I saw enthusiasm for Trump. I definitely did in these rural areas. They were concerned in Ohio and Pennsylvania that they could get the vote out. Talked to some GOP chairman there who said we're very worried because there's no organization here. But in the last couple of days, they really saw that ramp up. I travel around, I saw Trump signs all over the place. People were doing that themselves. Even if Trump didn't have an office, they'd bring in those signs, they'd put them in front of their houses. And of course, in these areas, economy is, is very, very important. It's the number one issue, for example, in Ohio. And that's where Trump was leading among those who are worried about the economy. And George, let's look at the gap in Michigan. This is the exit poll out of Michigan right now. Just the breakdown when it comes to rural voters versus some of those cities that uh, Detroit, for example, where Hillary Clinton's going to likely overperform Donald Trump. But look at this. Donald Trump, 54 to Hillary Clinton, 39. This could illustrate the success he's having in rural America tonight. That is right. Now, let's take a look at the picture of Donald Trump now watching the returns up there uh, in Trump Tower. There he is, uh, right there, surrounded by supporters, including, as Tom was saying, there's uh, Indiana Governor Mike Pence's running mate uh, right there as well. And, and, and John, as we look at that, yeah, so here, here's why they're smiling. I mean, if you look at if you look at the key states, if you look at New Hampshire, Michigan, North Carolina, and Florida, right now, and they're still counting votes, but right now in Florida, he still has that slight lead. In North Carolina, he has a lead very close. In New Hampshire, they've only counted 24% of the votes, but he looks like he has a chance to do something in New Hampshire. And Michigan, again, only 18% of the votes counted, but he's got off to an early lead. But let me just give one note of caution to the folks uh, at the Trump headquarters. If you look into Florida, again, back to that ever important county right now of Broward County, and we have 75% of precincts reporting, there is still about more, more than 200,000 votes outstanding 
uh, potential Democratic votes in Broward County by my calculations. That would be a very big chunk of chunks, Cecilia Vega, the Clinton campaign needs. And she's been there four times within the last few days, I believe. Look, Florida, they have invested heavily in not just in advertising, in visits. This is one of her most traveled to states uh, since early voting began. And they really tried to lock in that early vote there, uh, build up a firewall, if you will, against Donald Trump, try and lock in these voters. We were talking about that I-4 corridor, that coveted territory of I-4 corridor, and the demographic shift has shifted there. We're not just talking about Cubans anymore. We're talking about a lot of Puerto Ricans that have moved into the area, and they tend to vote more Democratic, especially in Florida. And the Clinton campaign is banking on that coalition for turning out to them. Terry Mar Moran, one of the things we're, we're seeing revealed here is something you saw in your travels across the country, this real split between the rural and the urban areas. Yeah, absolutely. You go 100 miles outside of a major metropolitan area and you and you hit it head on. And I'm, I'm thinking in particular of a, a middle school mock election in New Bethlehem, Pennsylvania that I went to where Trump, not surprisingly, got 86% of the vote from the kids. Uh, and I said, well, okay, can you think, uh, can you work with the Hillary supporters to make the country better? And they said, no, what we have to do is split this country. Split this country. Split this country. Look, the smartest girl in the class, 13-year-old girl. I said, well, we tried that. <laughs> uh, and, it, and it didn't really work. But I got to say, well, one other thing, I, on June 23rd, I stayed up all night in London covering the Brexit thing. And the night began pretty much the same way with, uh, with uh, the Brexit people, Nigel Farage, almost acknowledging defeat. And then one by one, Newcastle upon Tyne, and then Sunderland came in and surprised uh, everyone as the wave began. I'm not saying that's happening, but I've got a bad sense of de I've got a sense of deja vu happening here. Byron Pitts. George, I I'm, I'm fascinated by this change in America, or what you're saying happens, is happening in rural America versus urban America. In 1967, the Kern Commission came out, of, came out and said that there were two Americas, one black, one white, separate and unequal. Now it seems like we've gone in, the, in a different direction, where I would think many minorities, people of color, feel like America is now better for them. There are more black people in college uh, than there were 40 years ago. Life expectancy has increased. Um, there's been a 200% increase in the number of black families making more than $200,000. So for, for minorities in America, they think America is now a better place. But for rural working class white America, it seems like they're unhappy with where America is. They've been stuck for an awful long time. And, and, and Alex Costanos, one of the ways you put it is the difference between Starbucks and Budweiser America. <laughs> yeah, I looked at the uh, all 50 states and where you have the highest uh, per capita uh, Starbucks per voter. And uh, of the 22 states that you can uh, look at Hillary Clinton carrying, uh, 16 of hers are in the top half. Donald Trump's uh, states that he's carrying, 18 of his 25 are in the bottom half, low Starbucks. So, but that's why this is the last election, I think, that Republicans can rev up the engine past the red line and try to win with the old white guy strategy. It nearly blew up the car this election. So the challenge for Republicans is we've got to be a party that appeals to more Americans than just that. How, how do we win in the I-4 corridor? How do we appear to the uh, younger, educated voters? We can't be the party that's uh, not attracting people who think and read. Mayor Rawlings Blake? I think it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to uh, appeal to those voters when you don't have any understanding of urban America. When you, uh, when the only thing you can say about American cities are that they're basically cesspools. You can't grow your party. When you take a look uh, at it, Donald George, almost 90% of the population lives in cities and uh, metro areas. Mo almost 90% of the jobs are coming from cities and metro areas. It's no mistake that this is going to be a city versus um, rural uh, vote. And, and John Carl, well, let, let's also look at another battleground state we haven't looked at in a little while, Virginia. The state of Virginia, which is, of course, one that Hillary Clinton is counting on. What are we seeing there? Well, this one looks tight, too. Story of the night. Take a look at this. We've got 79% reporting, and Donald Trump still has a lead in Virginia. Now, I should caution, once again, we see the Democratic counties coming in slower. One of the biggest, maybe the most important Democratic county is Fairfax County. That's up north, just outside of D.C. So if you look at Fairfax County, right now, 80% reporting. Clinton has a 33% point lead, so she's got a lot more Democratic votes there, but Virginia is a lot closer than I thought it would be at this point. I want to bring in the chair of the Democratic National Committee, now Donna Brazil, the acting chair of the Democratic National Committee. Donna, thank you for joining us right now. We're seeing these close states across the board. We're seeing Florida, we're seeing North Carolina, we're seeing New Hampshire, we're seeing Michigan, we're seeing Virginia. How worried are you? 
Well, George, we're still confident that there are lots of votes that have still not been counted. Uh, votes that are in traditional Democratic areas and, of course, uh, votes that we believe that will go to Secretary Clinton and Senator Kane. So I'm still confident. I, I've talked to uh, the team back in uh, at the headquarters here in Brooklyn. Uh, we know that based on what we've heard early in the day uh, with the, the kind of lines that we saw, not just in Durham and, and, and North Carolina, the lines that we knew existed in, in uh, Detroit, the lines in uh, Pennsylvania, at the end of the night, I, I'm, I'm confident. Maybe it's too early to count all of the votes, but as soon as all of the votes are counted, uh, I think we'll, we'll, you'll see that the Democrats will overcome uh, some of the shortages we're witnessing right now. I had some sources tell me that they were actually seeing some weakness or sensing some weakness in Flint and Detroit. Well, earlier today, uh, as you know, some of the voters uh, that we rely on, the, these are reliable Democratic voters, they tend not to vote before 4.30, 5 o'clock. Uh, I was on several radio stations and just encouraging people to stay in line. So, uh, again, um, uh, earlier today, Detroit, uh, Flint, we had, uh, it was slow, steady, but then it started to, to come in after 4 or 5 o'clock this afternoon. And, in fact, the last message I had an hour ago was to remind people to stay in line. They have the right to vote if they stay in line. And, and, and Donna, of course, you were Al Gore's campaign manager. Uh, back, back in 2000. You remember well the days of the recount in Florida. Are we heading in that direction again? Well, I hope not, George, but I guess uh, if, if, we're, if that will happen, we're prepared uh, in Florida and any other state uh, for that uh, outcome. But right now, I, I want to see what happens in Broward. I want to see what happens in West Palm Beach. You know all the outstanding counties, even some precincts in Duval County. So I'm optimistic. Uh, even if we can't overcome that big hurdle, I still believe that we, there are enough votes out there before we start popping the champagne. And, Don, I just have to ask you, because Donald Trump has been bringing it up uh, over the last several days of this campaign, what was revealed in the WikiLeaks, some emails that suggested that you had given a debate questions to the Clinton campaign. Any regrets about that? Uh, George, let me be clear. As you know, uh, I've never had access to uh, debate questions. Uh, as, a, as a Democratic strategist and operative, I work with everybody to ensure that whether it's topics or trend lines or what we're talking about. But uh, the, the event that they uh, they claimed that there were debate questions, as you all well know, uh, I, I haven't seen the WikiLeaks. It was a forum. Look, I have enough time to, to make my case, but right now I'm focused, uh, like everybody else in the campaign, on making sure that every voter who's out there in line stay in line. And we believe that there are still votes that come in all across the country for Hillary Clinton. So we're expecting a good night tonight. Okay, Donna Brazil, thanks very much for joining us. Let me go back to Paula Ferris now in Miami. You, you, you talked about the possibility of a recount. Walk us through what procedures are in place down there. Right. Well, George, I don't mean to give everybody back in the studio immediate indigestion, but it is time to start talking about a mandatory recount. Matt Dowd, I know that you said you were expecting a 1% differential, but if the differential is 0.5%, that automatically triggers the mandatory recount. It will be ordered by the Secretary of State. It then has to be completed by next Thursday at 3 o'clock. So those are the rules, and that's the protocol in place. Again, we're talking about 50,000 votes, and right now those votes still coming in from Dem Democratic-heavy Broward County. If Hillary Clinton can make up some of the ground there, and if we're talking 50,000 differential votes, automatic trigger for a mandatory recount. Okay, that's the situation in Florida. And Charlie Gibson, you're saying you're seeing something, something in Virginia. Well, it's just 10,000 votes difference, so over 3 million votes cast. Um, John's been talking about the Northern Virginia vote. Um, I, I, you get so caught up in these numbers, you know, <laughs> and the tightening and the, and the opening. It's just an amazingly close situation, and Virginia is now an example of it. And it's a state that the Trump campaign has essentially written off uh, weeks ago. Uh, this, was, this became much less of a battleground. The assumption was that Hillary Clinton not only had the advantage there, but had a big advantage in Virginia. So to see it this close is really a sign of the strength of Donald Trump. They had time. stopped advertising there, Cecilia. And advertising there, and let's not forget where her running mate Tim Kaine is from. He is the senator of this state. They thought this was their state for the taking. I would love to hear from someone on the Clinton team right now about how they're digesting these numbers. Tim Kaine has never lost a race in the has state of Virginia. Has never lost a race. They're hoping that that stays the same tonight. And coming up, voters in 10 states still heading to the polls. We're going to be live here in Times Square with the campaigns and across the country when we come back. And we 
are back now. Election night 2016 coming up on 10 p.m. in the east. Let's take a look at where things stand right now in the Electoral College. There it is, 104 for Hillary Clinton, 137 for Donald Trump. You need 270 to win. And John Carl, there are so many close battleground states right now. Here are five that we're looking at. First of all, obviously the state of Florida, North Carolina, Virginia, incredibly close, uh, Michigan, surprisingly close, and New Hampshire. Let's take a quick look at where all of those stands. In, in Florida, Donald Trump still uh, has a lead. In North Carolina, Donald Trump still has a lead. In Virginia, Donald Trump has a lead. Now again, a lot of Democratic votes to still be countered in Northern Virginia. But Virginia is going to be incredibly close. Whether or not he wins, it's going to be a lot closer than anybody thought. New Hampshire, only a third of the vote in, but Donald Trump tracking a little bit of a lead there. And in, and in Michigan, a state uh, with only 21% in, but Donald Trump ahead. And, and Matthew Dowd, this is, these, these states are all so close. Coming into this race tonight, it looked like Hillary Clinton, the convergence of national polls had her at about a 4% lead. Yeah, and I had expected her to win nationally by five, which she may still win nationally by five. But what we're seeing right now is a divergence between the national number and the Electoral College in those key states. And what is being set up right now, the possibility, the possibility that Hillary Clinton could win the national vote by a large percentage, four or five points, and possibly by a few thousand votes, we have no idea what's gonna happen in the Electoral College. I mean, if Donald Trump holds onto the lead in three of those states, he gets elected president. If he holds onto the lead in Florida, North Carolina, and Virginia, or Florida, North Carolina, and Michigan, He's there because if he wins one of those states up in the north, Michigan, Pennsylvania, he's got a he's got a real possibility. Absolutely, right there. Cokie Roberts, incredible. It it is very different from what we were seeing going into it, and very different from what we're seeing uh, we're seeing earlier this evening. Um, and complete reversal of what we were talking about in terms of the Electoral College going for her and maybe the popular vote for him. That was an earlier uh, theory. And, um, and what it is, 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 as we've said earlier, it is a, uh, the rural votes getting out. It is the non-college educated people getting out, the people who feel like this new America that we've been talking about has left them out and left them behind economically and culturally. And so they are, are ready to ready to show their, their, their distaste for the current country. Charlie. And what's dismaying about this to me, George, looking at this, as I said, from a distance, is the disparities in so many groups. There's such a difference between urban and rural. There's such a difference between men and women. There is such a difference between college educated and right. not college educated. There is such a difference between whites and blacks. It is dismaying the, the, the polarity of all of these groups. Um, it, it, it simply bespeaks a country which is deeply, deeply divided, and that makes it that makes going I mean, forth very frightening, no matter who wins. In, in asking the question, as, are, what candidate is qualified to be president, honest and trustworthy, has the temperament to be president, the voters who say both have the temperament, 5%. Same thing with uh, same thing with the qualifications. Five percent say both. Two percent say both are honest and trustworthy. They're not willing to give an inch to the other side. Tom Yamas. Yeah, on Charlie's point of this sort of two Americas theory, I, I want to tell a story, and it takes place in Michigan. We just got some exit polling. It says that 50 percent of the people who voted in Michigan say trade kills jobs. I was there at a rally, and I saw this guy. He was just going crazy for Trump. So I said, "You're so fired up. What's your story?" He he says, I'm an auto worker, and I can tell you this much. The union bosses are going to vote for Hillary Clinton. Everyone on the shop floor is voting for Donald Trump. His message with Ford and their plans in Mexico and all that, that definitely helped him out. And Rebecca Jarvis, I think you're wired up right now. What are you seeing? The closer this looks, George, the more stocks are falling, the more Mexican peso is falling. And these have both been a barometer of Trump's prospects in this race throughout the campaign. As Trump has pulled ahead in the polls, we've seen a sell-off in both the peso as well as stocks. As he's fallen behind, we've seen things pick up in the stock market. So tonight, the closer things look, the more we're seeing the Dow down now 500 points. The whole world is watching right now, and all eyes are on Florida. Polls about to close in four more states. 21 electoral votes up for grabs. We're going to be right back. It's election night 2016. Welcome back to ABC News coverage of election night 2016. Here again 
George Stephanopoulos. And it is 10 p.m. here on the East Coast in Times Square. Let's take a look at where things stand right now in this very close race for president. There you see it. Hillary Clinton has 104 electoral votes. Donald Trump, 140. You need 270. Polls have just closed in four more states with 21 electoral votes. And we can say right now that Donald Trump has won another state, the state of Montana. Three electoral votes. Republicans carried that state in all but one election, 1992, since 1964. Uh, but it is going to Donald Trump, the Republican, this time around, and three electoral votes. Polls have also closed in the state of Iowa, one of our battleground states. Not enough vote in yet to say what's going to happen there with the six electoral votes. Voted for President Bush in 2004, close in both 2000 and 2004. Barack Obama won it twice. It's been a tough state for Hillary Clinton. We don't have enough votes in there to project it yet. And the state of Utah. State of Utah, six electoral votes. Not usually a battleground, usually solid red. But you've got uh, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, uh, Gary Johnson, of course, Evan McMullen, hometown favorite there, running as well. A Mormon in a very heavily Mormon state. Not enough votes to call that yet, but we are keeping an eye on these very, very close battleground states right now, including Nevada, another battleground state, six electoral votes right there. Not enough to project. You had a lot of early vote in that state. It last voted Republican in 2004 for George W. Bush. Not enough to project there yet. And Cecilia, I want to bring you in uh, on this because we did see a heavy Latino vote, an early vote in Nevada, and Democrats had been very encouraged by that. It was one of the most encouraging signs, I think, for the Clinton campaign this weekend coming into Election Day, uh, a market, uh, a Latino market in Las Vegas where uh, people waited an effort for, for hours to vote, to cast a vote. We saw a really strong ground game from the Clinton campaign in states like Nevada. And one number that jumps out at me as we headed into Election Day, the Clinton campaign, since early voting started, knocked on and made phone calls. They contacted 45 million people. This is a well-oiled very well paid for machine that they've got going into this election day and they're banking on that right now especially in states like Nevada. Democrats had also been banking on this Latino surge in Florida but boy. I don't know George take a look at this it's still very close but Donald Trump with a hundred and thirty thousand plus vote lead and I've been talking a lot about Broward County just north of Miami look what's happening in Broward County 98 percent of the vote is in and Donald Trump still has a big lead in the state of Florida it looks to me like he is trending towards winning the state of Florida Tom Yamas what are they seeing in the Trump war room George you know one of our Trump metrics is to measure Twitter the, the Trump campaign is sending out more and more photos of thumbs up of Donald Trump himself smiling inside that war room I got one text this is a wild night so far and I just got another one from inside that war room the mood is energetic and upbeat Brooklyn must be nervous Brooklyn must be nervous Amy Robach you're over at the New York Hilton where Trump campaign hoping to celebrate tonight that's right, and there are a lot of people already celebrating here, a lot of shouting, a lot of chanting, and we've also heard from inside that Trump war room, uh, one senior top aide telling us that the mood in that room could be summed up with one word, fireworks, and another one, intense. And we have tweets showing inside, actually, Trump's D.C. brand new hotel popping champagne already. People are in the mood to celebrate, and uh, certainly at Trump headquarters, we are waiting for him to make his way here here over to the Hilton at some point. We don't know when that's going to be, but a dramatic shift in mood here in the past hour. And uh, we are all watching very closely as these returns come in. Robin Roberts, what are we seeing at the Javits Center? Well, just as Amy said, a, dra a drastic shift in the mood here at the Javits Center, though people are trying to stay upbeat. And you can hear every time they just saw that she's the projected winner in New Mexico, and so they're very happy about that. But earlier, George, they were playing music. It was a very upbeat scene. And then when the race started getting tighter and going in the way of Donald Trump, they stopped the music. They put the results up on the big screen. They kept ch changing from different uh, networks to networks. And it was so quiet as people were intently listening to the commentary as well. So you could hear the cheers because of New Mexico, but they're, they're, uh, they're trying to remain optimistic. But in all honesty, there has been quite a shift here in the last hour or so, George. Okay, Robin Roberts, we are not ready to project the state of Mexico yet, but John, let's take a look at a couple of the other, other battlegrounds right now. What do we see in the state of Virginia? The state of Virginia, it looks like Hillary Clinton has pulled ahead, as we've discussed, those northern counties near Washington, D.C., especially Fairfax. That vote is coming in. Hillary Clinton is pulling ahead in Virginia. But I think the state that we're going to be watching, if Trump takes Florida, 
the state that it will all come down to, I believe, is the state of Michigan. The state of Michigan. The state Be of Michigan. Because, uh, Matthew Dowd, if Donald Trump holds on to Florida, he's leading now in North Carolina, leading in Ohio. Oh. We don't have enough vote yet in Iowa. Those are what they call their core four. Then all he really needs is one more of those big blue states from the Democrats. Yeah, and uh, John's right. I think as we move forward, as we this comes in, if this sticks with the way the numbers are, and as we know, these all these are a few thousand votes, it becomes the Great Lakes state of Michigan could ultimately decide the presidency. Stephanie Cutter, nervousness in the Democratic camp? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess that answers here. the question. Well, yeah. This camp. Uh, I, I think you're right. I mean, uh, Michigan, we knew it was going to be closer. Um, uh, there's, it, it, it's, it, there's, even though uh, we believe Florida is leaning in Trump's direction, there's still some vote out. Um, and uh, there's big Democratic counties that have yet to report in Michigan. I, I think this light is just going to be later than anybody thought, but I think she's still favored to win. Let's take another look at Michigan. David Muir, what yeah, do you have some there? indicators here from the exit polls. Take a look at this. Tom Yamas was talking about this earlier. When you ask about trade uh, with other countries, we know he, Donald Trump pounded this issue during his visits to Michigan. 50% of the voters in Michigan said these trade deals takes away jobs here in America. Only 31% said the trade deals uh, create more jobs. And look at this. When you break it down, with other countries take away jobs. If you feel like you're frightened about these trade deals, that the jobs uh, disappear because of them, the breakdown is very clear. You went with Donald Trump, 57% to Hillary, 36%. John, I want to go to you in a second, and both of you on Michigan, but we have another call to make right now. ABC News, News can now project that Donald Trump has won the state of Missouri. And it's 10 electoral votes gone blue only twice in the last four decades, both times for Bill Clinton in 1992 and 1996. Donald Trump, Republican, wins the state of Missouri right now, filling in the red across that Matt Martha Raddus. I, I just want to say this thing. We keep talking about this divide in America. The divide is about opportunity. And you look at places like Michigan, you look at places like Ohio, you look at places uh, like Pennsylvania, Real incomes for Americans with a four-year college degree have increased by 22%. Real incomes for Americans without have fallen by 10%. 68% of Americans age 25 and older do not have a four-year college degree. And it's not so much enthusiasm in these areas that's bringing out all these Trump voters. It is anger. It is frustration. It's feeling that they are really left out. And we just saw a state go to Donald Trump. Now a state is going to Hillary Clinton. We heard the Javits Center uh, applaud when they thought New Mexico was coming in for Hillary Clinton. We can project that now as well, New Mexico. And it's five electoral votes for Hillary Clinton. So there you see the map right now, 150 to 109. But, John, let's go back to that state of Michigan, as you said, becoming more and more important by the hour. This is a state that Barack Obama won by nine points. Right now, only a quarter of the vote is in and Trump is up five points. Here is what's happening. Look at three key counties in Michigan. First, Marquette County up north in the Upper Peninsula. Look at this. Trump is beating Hillary Clinton in Marquette County. You know what happened in that county in 2012? Barack Obama won by 14 points. So, Mitt, uh, so Donald Trump is outperforming Mitt Romney dramatically in that county. Now, if you go back and you look at uh, Eaton County, just outside of Lansing. Eaton County, Trump has a big lead. Again, only 35% reporting, but that's a significant sample. Obama won that state, won that county by 14 points. And then finally, historically, we know we always talked a lot about Macomb County. Now, only 1% of Macomb County is in, but this is the county that gave us the Reagan Democrats. The very early counting there, Donald Trump with a lead in Macomb County. So Michigan, very, very close right now. A lot of vote yet to come in in the state uh, of Michigan. Let's also pull up the state of North Carolina right now. That is another one of the core four uh, for Donald Trump. And in the state of North Carolina, John, what are you seeing? State of North Carolina, again, Trump expanding his lead. This has been close all night, but Trump is expanding his lead in North Carolina. 83% in, he's got a three percentage point lead. Matthew Dowd. <laughs> It's an amazing unfolding of the map as we watch this tonight. I mean, I had thought as the national polls were moving, all the stuff was going in the direction. But what we're seeing is a divergence, as I said earlier, a divergence between sort of the national popular vote 
and the votes in these states that are divided on a very rural versus urban and rural and suburban. Actually, one thing I've noticed in the in the numbers is Donald Trump is overperforming what anybody thought he was going to get in the suburban areas of these states. Tom Yamas, what are you seeing? What are you hearing from the Trump camp? Kellyanne Conway, we have this from her now. An hour ago, I called Mr. Trump and I said, come hang out in the war room. This is when the exit polls fade into view and the actual returns matter. She says he's energized and optimistic. We keep talking about the core four for the Trump campaign. That's Ohio, Florida, North Carolina, Iowa. Available. They have a lot of reasons to be very happy right now, George. They are watching those numbers come in, Byron Pitts. Across the street, there's a new play called A Bronx Tale, Robert De Niro's A Bronx Tale. One of the famous lines from the play is, it's better to be feared than loved. And so it seems at this point you know, tonight, fear is winning out. The, 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 the dark picture of America seems to be carrying, carrying the hour at this point. David? You talk about the divide in this country, the, the, the storyline that's sort of emerging here, this, this difference between urban America and rural America. And take a look at this. I just pulled this up. Uh, the U.S. economy, you ask, uh, the, is the condition of the economy not good or poor? 57% in urban America say it's not good or poor. But look at rural America, 72% say the economy needs to be fixed. You talk about right track, wrong track. Look at this nationwide direction of the country. Uh, in urban America, 53% uh, believe we're on the wrong track. But that, look at that number in rural America, 71% believe this country is on the wrong path. Terry Moran. Whoever wins here, what is happening in the United States is part of a pattern across the world, and it goes beyond Brexit. It's essentially ordinary people around the world saying that the way elites have arranged the globalized world through immigration and trade and all that ain't working for them and their families. And when they get a chance to punch the elite in the face, <laughs> they have. We're seeing they are sending a message to Washington, to the elite institutions across the board, Cecilia Vega. I'd just like to point out that we haven't heard from anyone in the Clinton campaign. And this is the opposite of what we normally deal with on debate nights when they feel like they've won something. They are out there screaming from the rooftops and Tom's going, I can't hear from, I haven't heard from anybody yet. And now it's the Clinton team that's actually remarkably quiet tonight. Uh, they, they do think that uh, they're still waiting on Michigan. They knew that was going to be a late one. And they always have said the storyline out of the Clinton campaign, Brooklyn, is that Florida was not theirs. They didn't necessarily need to win it. So that's but that Florida was the their spin. hope. That's why they went in for the kill in the last several days. Uh, that's their spin. Yes, their spin is that they didn't necessarily need it. But you saw them invest extremely heavily in that state. And if they do not, w if they do not win Florida tonight, there will be some tears because of that one inside Brooklyn. That's where they spent the most money, John Carl. They spent the most money. She went there more to Florida more than any other state. Trump spent the most money. Went there more than any state. It really did come down to Florida. And looking now, 95% reporting. He's still has that significant lead, well over 100,000 votes. You know, the other state I'm watching is New Hampshire, a, another state that four years ago, Mitt Romney actually had a home in New Hampshire. He was actually partly from New Hampshire, just like he was partly from Michigan. And uh, he lost handedly to Barack Obama. And look at this, almost half the vote is in, and Donald Trump has a three percentage point lead. And if Donald in Trump New wins New Hampshire and Michigan plus his core four, yeah, if, if he does that, take a look at the possibilities. If you look, again, we had 12 battleground states. Virginia, say that goes towards Clinton, she, she's up there. Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, she takes all those states that we, we, we've thought all along she's going to win. She seems to have a pretty clear path to 270, but now, because of what's happened, if you put Florida in Trump's camp, if you put uh, North Carolina in Trump's camp, if you put Ohio in Trump's camp, and Arizona, 254. He now actually has a couple of paths to get well, to 270. All it takes is Michigan right there. All it takes is Michigan. Michigan does it. If he doesn't do Michigan, he could also do New Hampshire and Nevada. And can I just point and, out that... And, of course, he has Iowa. I wasn't even counting Iowa. He's yeah, got Iowa. And in Michigan and in New Hampshire, remember, Hillary Clinton was dealt a surprise by Bernie Sanders, who had a very, many people have said, a similar message talking to white, working-class, blue-collar America about the inequality that so many people are feeling in this country. There are some parallels with Donald Trump's message and Bernie Sanders. I know that frustrated Sanders all through when he joined forces with Hillary Clinton saying, don't vote for him, vote for Hillary. But a lot of people on the ground feel like there's something that resonates about the arguments both have been made 
state. And we remember when Hillary was surprised our, in the primary campaign. Our friends at 538 had it as a 99% chance that Hillary Clinton would win the Michigan primary, and she lost to Bernie Sanders. And let's go to our friends at 538 right now. Nate Silver is joining us right now. And Nate, a pretty dramatic change in your forecast now. Well, it's not about our forecast. It's about the fact that we haven't had any swing states called yet, and those are states that Clinton was supposed to win, was supposed to win Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. Those states are all correlated, meaning that if you have problems with white working class voters, you don't turn out African Americans, then you potentially lose those states or win by a razor thin margin. I mean, she is in profound trouble right now in the Electoral College. Profound trouble in the Electoral College. And you were pointing out for a while that, that Donald Trump had a better chance in the Electoral College than he did in, in, in winning the national vote. But I also want you to address another question that I think a lot of people are going to be asking right now. We did see a convergence of the high quality national polls over the course of the last week at around a three to four point uh, lead uh, for Hillary Clinton. And we'll see what comes in, what comes in at the end. And some people had always been talking about the possibility of a systematic bias in the polls, that they were going to be missing Trump voters. Any sense that's what's happening? Well, first of all, our model at least always show this potential for a split, where I think Clinton might be the favorite still to win the popular vote. She'll rack up huge margins in California and here in New York and everything else. Um, but we said she is not performing that well in the Midwest, and that could prove to be her downfall in the Electoral College. Um, but also, polls at the end, sometimes it's not the last poll that's most accurate because pollsters her. They don't want to be out of line. Um, and therefore, it's the next to last poll sometimes that was the honest opinion of the pollster, and those showed a very competitive race. And as we were, just to repeat one more time, as we were coming into the day, you had your projection above 70% for Hillary Clinton. Where is it right now? I mean, I would look at betting markets, which say that Donald Trump is a narrow favorite to win the Electoral College. Okay, Nate Silver, thanks very much. As we saw both campaigns closely watching these results come in, millions still heading to the polls out west, voters in the final six states still casting their ballots. We'll be right back. Back live in Times Square after this. ABC News live coverage of election night 2016 is sponsored by Hulu. And it is election night 2016. We are right here in Times Square. What a dramatic night. What a close election. Want to go straight to these battleground states. John Carl been talking about the possibility. You just heard Nate Silver there looking at the betting market starting to predict a Donald Trump uh, victory. They had not been doing that for several weeks, for several months. In fact, let's look at the paths that could get him there. I see two paths for a Donald Trump victory if he wins the state of Florida. And that is trending in that direction. So if you put Florida in his column and you assume he wins Ohio where he is up, Iowa, Arizona, North Carolina, places where he is up, here's what he can do. The first thing he can do is win Nevada and New Hampshire. And that gets him to exactly 270. But again, George, it assumes he wins the second congressional district in Maine, which tells you why they were spending so much time there. But if not, we should say, though, but at 269, Donald Trump is probably still president. If it's 269, well. 269, it goes to the House of Representatives. The Republicans control the House. Uh, it's voted by state delegations. It's almost certain that they would choose a Republican president, Donald Trump, because you have to have run. So if you come back, if he, if he doesn't take New Hampshire and Nevada, he can take the state of Michigan. If he takes Michigan, he's at 276. Now, that said, both of these paths are difficult because there isn't that much vote yet in Michigan. Michigan is a state where he has not led a single public poll, but he's up right now in the raw vote, a little over a quarter uh, voted. The other uh, problem is that Nevada, Nevada's been a state, again, where the public polls were all trailing, you know, all going against Trump coming into this election. What did the polls miss? Oh, they missed the surge of the vote, of his vote, of the, of the margins that he was going to get among uh, non-college educated whites. Because as we've looked through the numbers, Hillary Clinton's getting overwhelming numbers with non-whites. There was a non-white turnout that unlike that we've ever seen. There was only 70% of the vote was white. And so what's happened, and she got college educated white women. What's happened is uh, non-college white men, by a huge margin, went to Donald Trump. And we've got to take a quick break, but before we go, a big state for Donald Trump. Donald Trump has won the state of Ohio. Donald Trump wins the state of Ohio, one of his core four. You saw it right there, a big victory there for Donald Trump. There you see it. 
key state. No Republican has ever won the White House with winning, without winning Ohio. Donald Trump has won it. We'll be right back. In 2016, 1030 here in the East Coast. You see it right there, Donald Trump. We called it just before the break. Donald Trump projected to win the state of Ohio and it's 18 electoral votes there. And David Muir, you see a big gender gap in that state. Well, let's dive into these demographics, George, because this is really fascinating in Ohio, which of course was a must win for Donald Trump. And he's now pulled that off tonight. No Republican wins the White House without Ohio. The breakdown, 53% women voters, 47% men. But look when we break it out. Who did they vote for? Look at the men. 54% with Donald Donald Trump, 39% with Clinton. That's 15 points right there, uh, the gap there. And then look at women. She carries women, but only by nine points. And one more thing I wanted to show you is when you do the education breakdown, uh, the voters without college degrees, 55% to 45 uh, with a college degree, which gets back to this discussion we've been having about economic opportunity in this country, not matching those with college degrees and trying to level the playing field. And, and Koki, that is something we've seen there. We've seen the gender gap probably a little bit less there than you would have expected and, that Hillary Clinton wanted in the state of Ohio. In Ohio, yes. Uh, but, you know, what we're seeing is we've been talking all, all season about this change in the college-educated vote, and especially college-educated white women. And they are going for Clinton, it appears, from all of the exit polls. The difference is, is they're not, they, they're not enough of them. Uh, and so what you've got is many more non-college educated people turning, first of all, there are many more of them, but secondly, many more of them turning out to vote. And it is, as we've said, this sense of opportunity that is worldwide because of technology. And so what you're seeing is people being left behind by the technological revolution in a way that is very similar to the Industrial Revolution, where they are really, their lives are so disrupted that they don't recognize them, either in terms of their day-to-day -day economic life or their neighbors. Their neighbors are different people from what they used to be. Their kids might be doing something, might be involved in a gay relationship that they never expected. All kinds of things have changed in their lives, and this is a way of saying we, don't, we want it to stop. Uh, and these are people who stuck with this guy through the most incredible campaign in our history, I think it's safe to say. Whatever happens tonight, Donald Trump has astonished uh, the country. You hear the noise right there. That means we have another state to call in. It's the state of Virginia. Virginia, 13 electoral votes. It's going to go to Hillary Clinton right there. As we said, it voted for Obama in the last two elections. He was the first Democrat to win since 1964. Such a key state for Hillary Clinton, her running mate, Tim Kaine from Virginia. You would even call it, John Carl, a must-win state. An absolute must-win, especially now. And one that although Hillary Clinton has won, it was a lot closer than anybody thought it would be. That's right, 48-47 coming in uh, right there. But right now, she seems to be holding on to the states so far that she needs, but it goes back to that state in the Midwest, state of Michigan. Let's take another look. And I'll tell you, uh, it's, it's very close. It's tightened a little bit. Trump still has a lead with about a third of the vote in. And I'm trying to look at the key counties in Michigan. It's been a while since it's been a true battleground. Uh, as close as you can get to a bellwether county, and I don't know what bellwether means anymore after this election. It is so scrambled. But is Kent County. Kent County is Lansing. And this is a county. It's Grand Rapids. Kent County is Grand Rapids. I'm sorry, I'm talking about Eaton. Yeah. I meant Eaton, exactly. <laughs> uh, Eaton Camp is, is, is Lansing, and this is a county that has gone in the past, has, has gone back and forth. If you look at it, a three-point victory for Obama. And look at this. Trump with 40% in, has a huge lead, a 24-point lead over Trump. But you mentioned Grand Rapids, so let's go out to Grand Rapids, which is a solidly Republican part of the state. So if you go to Kent County, as I said, in Grand, uh, Grand Rapids, uh, uh, Trump has a huge lead there, but only 9% of the vote is in. That means to me that there's a lot more Republican vote to come in from Grand Rapids and Kent County. But there's also a lot of vote, George, still to come in in Detroit, Wayne County, only Wayne County, and I'll circle it so you can see down here, Detroit, only about a third of the vote is in. That is overwhelmingly Democratic. So looking at this, I don't know. I could see Trump 
moving ahead in Michigan. I could see him losing Michigan. It's either, really either way, Cecilia Vega, I wonder, you know, President Obama went to Detroit in the final days. Hillary Clinton went back in the final days. But they didn't pay an awful lot of attention to it from between the convention and late October, early uh, November. Didn't spend any money there. And they kept saying that they thought that Donald Trump didn't invest early enough in the state of Michigan. Yeah, you're right. And it, I was Initially, I was going to say this became a general election state for them, but it really became like a last couple of weeks state for them that they really started to pay attention. Uh, George, I just want to say, I, over the last half hour, I've been sitting here and I keep thinking back to the primaries and these 17 Republicans duking it out. And I'm talking to sources in the Clinton campaign throughout all of it. And they thought they were getting ready to run against Marco Rubio or Jeb Bush. And they never thought that it would be they all have always said this would the race would be tight but I think when it came down to it the thought of Hillary Clinton running against Donald Trump they thought they had this in the bag and look at where they are right now you've got to bet that they are really nervous inside Brooklyn seeing this map form out the way it is right now Georgia, let me raise just one other thing that we haven't talked about tonight which is again looking at this as a distance as I now do being retired um, <laughs> Never in my lifetime, George, and I don't think in yours, have we had two such unpopular candidates. Have not. Never. And so we're talking about why people voted for Donald Trump or why they voted for Hillary Clinton. We haven't talked tonight about why people voted against Hillary Clinton and against Donald Trump. And, and a dismaying percentage of the vote in both cases were because they didn't like the other guy or they didn't like her. And, and that again bespeaks a sadness about this election that I mean something extraordinary is going on and, and you can't take anything away from Trump and, the, and, the, and how strongly he's running but I wonder how much of that is an anti-Hillary vote and how much is really a pro well, and I think you see a lot. You see a lot of anti the other side. It, people that I spoke to, it is about character. It is about temperament. A lot of people didn't trust Donald Trump's temperament, but they didn't trust Hillary Clinton's character. People knew a lot about this race. It's incredible to go around the country and hear everybody talking about it. Everybody engaged in this race. I wouldn't say there's a lot of depth on the issues, but the messaging worked. Donald Trump's message got out there among the voters. He said she's corrupt. He said the emails over and over and over again. He said Benghazi. And those sort of things really stuck with the I, voters. I, I, the other thing I think you're seeing is, is a reflection of the political environment. The environment we are in is, as a country as a whole. What you're watching is unfold. A bunch of voters don't think Donald Trump has the temperament. Don't think he's ready to be commander in chief. But they're voting for him because they're tired of the status quo. And in the end, it looks like she formalized representing the status quo, and he represented blowing it up. And a lot of voters, in spite of their questions about whether he was qualified to be president, went for blowing it and, up. And Pre nuclear codes, you could ask him about nuclear codes. Well, what about the nuclear codes if you don't think he has a temperament? And they'd say, you know, he's he wouldn't do that, would he? I'm going to vote for him anyway. Kristen, you know, it's, it's kind of astonishing that he's, he's this close right now when you've got a majority of Americans and solid majority say he's not qualified for the job. The analogy that I've heard often used is that he's the experimental treatment to what ails America, that he may come with all kinds of side effects, he may not be tested in the same way as other leaders might, but if you're desperate enough and you've been sick long enough, maybe you're willing to take a chance on that experimental treatment. I think that's right, and you and I have discussed this, George, over the months. In a change election, being the candidate of change is the better thing to be, and you have to make yourself minimally acceptable. A lot of us thought he probably hadn't quite succeeded in doing that and people think Secretary Clinton's more qualified etc but it sounds it seems like Donald Trump was able to reassure people just enough not to be scary enough that he if you want change we're voting for Trump and if he makes it across the finish line here or comes just short I mean it just shows how powerful the unhappiness of the status quo is and I do think Hillary Clinton and again we said this over the months it's not just second guessing she never really explained well what change was she going to bring about it was entirely a disqualification of Donald Trump that she attempted and she may have not quite succeeded you know, there's another name here that hasn't been mentioned, James Comey. Uh, when he came out and announced that he was starting reopening the investigation into the emails, not fully reopening it, but looking at what was on Anthony Weiner's uh, computer, Hillary Clinton was on her way, they certainly thought, and I think most of us thought, was on her way towards a pretty decisive win. That was a decisive moment thrown right into the middle of the campaign, the ultimate October surprise. Of course, Comey came back just a couple days ago and said, basically, never mind. There's nothing more to investigate. But I think that if... if
this goes Donald Trump, you're going to hear Democrats pointing. We have another projection right now. It is a projection for Hillary Clinton. It's the state of Colorado. Nine electoral votes in the West voted Democratic in 2008, 2012. That is going to Hillary Clinton right there. So one of the things we're seeing right now, Virginia and Colorado, as I said, Matthew Dowd, going in tandem, uh, voting alike. New Mexico also coming in uh, for Hillary Clinton, building up her bare minimum. Question is, can she hold her firewall? Well, that, that's the real question. We're going to go down to, we're going to go to Michigan. I think Wisconsin is still undecided. I think if you take a look at the numbers in Wisconsin, maybe John can give us an update on that. I think Wisconsin is not yet decided. Uh, New Hampshire's not yet decided. And so we still have, and obviously Florida's not been called, North Carolina's not been called. Those are leaning right now in, in Donald Trump's direction. This is going to be a long time. Okay, I want to go, John, why don't you pull up Wisconsin? In the meantime, let me go to Clayton Sandell in Denver. You hear those cheers behind you, Clayton. Yeah, there's a lot of excited people here, but I think there's also relief. You know, you heard uh, Cecilia say earlier, the Clinton camp thought that they had Colorado wrapped up very early. They pulled all of their ads over the summer, but in recent weeks, the race tightened here considerably. One poll even had them tied at one point, and that prompted a flurry of activity. Many visits by uh, Clinton surrogates and even Donald Trump himself over the weekend, and it highlights just how purple estate Colorado still is. In the last 10 presidents, presidential elections here. Republicans have won all the contests except for three, Bill Clinton in 92 and then of course Barack Obama twice. But with a Hillary Clinton win here, that now makes it three for three for Democrats here in Colorado. That has never happened here before, George. Okay, Clayton, thanks. Let's put up the scoreboard right now. 131 electoral votes for Hillary Clinton, 168 for Donald Trump right there. It takes 270. Nine battleground states left on the board. John Carlos, take a look at Wisconsin. Wisconsin is quite a story. 48%, almost half of the vote in, and Donald Trump with a two-point lead over Hillary Clinton. Uh, you know, we, I've got to drill down and see where the outstanding vote is, but with ha almost half the vote in to see Donald Trump leading in the state of Wisconsin is nothing this is short a state of he didn't shocking. Even win in the primaries. This is a state he got trounced in the primaries because the entire Republican establishment in the state was against him. Uh, Paul Ryan was against him. Uh, Scott Walker was against him. Uh, the, uh, the, the the conservative talk radio, a guy named Charlie Sykes, who's one of the you know big influencer of. You know, for Republicans and conservatives in, in Wisconsin, let a let a jihad against Donald Trump every day on the radio. He lost. He got trounced. And then, you know, looks. I mean, I don't know if he's going to win Wisconsin, but it is unbelievable that at this point he looks to be in the hunt. Tom Yamas. Let me take you inside the Trump war room right now in Trump Tower. It is so filled you can't even walk in. There are so many people around there. Chris Christie is right next to Donald Trump. You know, covering Trump is a lot like playing roulette. You never really know what's going to happen. And in roulette, the trend is your friend. And one lesson I've learned from covering Donald Trump, once he starts winning, he doesn't lose. And I know it's very, very early in the night, but I think we are at a very critical moment. He's just won Ohio. My Republican sources who have won several elections in Florida say he's going to win Florida as well. This could be a very interesting night. He wins Ohio. He wins Florida. He needs North Carolina. And then he's going to look up north uh, to the state of Michigan. We have another call to make right now in the Senate. And this is the North Carolina Senate race. And we can say that the Republican incumbent, Senator Richard Burr, is going to win that race in the state uh, of North Carolina. Key race uh, to help the Republicans retain control of the Senate. Now they have made up for the seat they lost in Illinois. And this is going to be very close, uh, Bill Crystal. But that was a big one for the Republican Party. Yeah, it looks like the Senate could maybe go to a 50-50 split. I think most of us thought that Hillary Clinton was likely to be the next president, and that would mean that it would be a democratically controlled Senate because Tim Kaine would be the vice president. It would be amazing if it were a 50-50 Senate and Mike Pence were breaking the tie as vice president, which doesn't seem impossible now. Okay, and, and Gary Langer, is, is Gary Langer our, our pollster? Is he hooked up now? Do we have, do we have Gary on the microphone right now? Uh, Gary, I want to pick up on a couple of the points where I was wanted to get at with Nate Silver uh, as well. And first of all, this idea that, you know, we, we're conditioned to watch all of these public polls. We saw Hillary Clinton uh, have a fairly solid but small lead in the final days. But first pick up on the point that John Carl was making. What kind of an impact did we see from this announcement about 10 days ago from James Carl? Well, George, what we have here is really a, a cry, I think, among uh, uh, the disadvantaged voters in this country, those who don't have a college education, who have seen their real incomes falling, as we've been discussing. They're not 
turning out in greater numbers than we expected, but they are voting overwhelmingly for Donald Trump. That is that expression of discontent with the status quo in terms of a system that hasn't been working for these Americans. Now, we did see this in the pre-election polling. We had a, a, a small uh, lead nationally for Clinton, the four points in our final estimate. We'll see how that comes out. Uh, but state by state, uh, in these toss-up states, you're seeing this overwhelming Trump but, vote among these non-college whites. But on those two states we were just talking about, Wisconsin and Michigan, and we had talked about this before, not a single public poll, there might have been one tie in Michigan between the conventions and, and, and election day, same, same thing in Wisconsin. Yeah, I didn't follow the state polls in those two states. We can dig back in and look how they did. Uh, state polling is sometimes squirrely. It, it takes a lot of effort to do pre-election polls well. Uh, but the, I think the most important thing to keep in mind is what the voters are telling us here. And this notion here that uh, for many Americans, for particularly non-college educated white Americans, the system has not been working. They've been falling behind, growing increasingly frustrated, not since the Great Recession, but for decades. And this expression of frustration turns into this anti-status yeah, And you, you, have a, you, have a, you have a good metaphor there as well, because you can look at some of the economic statistics and you can pick out statistics, but unemployment is down. There's been economic growth for the last uh, several quarters. You could see consumer confidence, a fairly healthy economy, yet a lot of people feel there's no economic opportunity. That's right. It's less about the economy than it is about the opportunity for, for prosperity, really the promise of the American dream. If you don't have a college degree, we talked about this earlier, your real income against inflation over the last 35 years has declined. The reason most people in this country feel like they're doing less well is because it's true, and we're seeing the result tonight. Okay, Gary Langer, thanks very much. Let's go back to Michigan. John Carl, what are you seeing right now? Michigan still projecting 41% in. Donald Trump still up by 3% in the state of Michigan. David Curley, what's the feeling there in Detroit? Oh, George, let me tell you, this is the state Democratic Party we're at in Detroit, and it has completely changed. People have been on the podium saying, keep your fingers crossed, we're not out of it yet, but the mood has changed here entirely. Don't forget, this is a state that hasn't gone Republican since 1988. It's been a solid blue state for so long. But as Gary Langer was just pointing out, what we're seeing in Michigan is that a lot more rural voters did turn out here. 27% of the vote in Michigan, <clears throat> excuse me, according to the exit polls, was rural. It was only 19% just the last election. So a lot of folks have turned out. Now, there are still a lot of votes in Detroit, about 60%, 64% of the vote still to come in from Wayne County. But this is what the Clinton campaign was worried about. How good was the Trump turnout? And what we're seeing is in the rural areas, it's very good. Will Detroit make up the difference? This George? night could not be more dramatic. It could not be more close. All eyes on Michigan, Florida, the battleground states. Voters still casting their ballots out west. We'll be right back. ABC News live coverage of election night 2016 is sponsored by who? Coming up on 11 p.m. in the East in this dramatic election night. It's been an unusual campaign, and tonight everything's so close, and Donald Trump uh, doing so well so far. Let's take a look right there. He's got 168 electoral votes to Hillary Clinton's 131. You need 270 to win. We've been keeping an eye on battleground states all night. It started out at 12. Now we're down to 9. And, John Carl, let's go through the ones that remain, starting with that big one, 29 electoral votes, the state of Florida. State of Florida, 95% reporting, George. Donald Trump still holding a pretty commanding lead. If we move up the coast a little bit, North Carolina, Donald Trump with a solid five-point lead, 91% reporting. Keep going further up Pennsylvania. This was a long shot from the start for Trump. He's losing, but again, it's pretty close. Only a three-point margin in Pennsylvania. New Hampshire, one that he had been losing in most of the public polling. Look at this. He's got a three-point lead with more than half of the uh of the vote in go to michigan donald trump still leading it's narrowed a little bit about 45 percent in wisconsin donald trump 
with over half the vote in, still has a pretty serious lead in the state of so Wisconsin. So three big, uh, three big opportunities there. Three yeah. big opportunities there for Donald Trump. Let's go back to your possibilities because let's say for the sake of argument, you give him the states where he's got a fairly healthy lead right now: North Carolina and Florida, the states that he has to win. Those are the states that he has to win. But then he's got his choice among Michigan, Wisconsin. Pennsylvania looking like Clinton for now, but he's got his choice of Michigan, Wisconsin, and New Hampshire still hanging out there. And, and I'm going to even leave Iowa in the middle because we didn't mention Iowa. Hillary Clinton is actually looking pretty strong in Iowa, which was a which was a state that we thought Donald Trump was one that we thought he was going to win. So you look at these other states. So 243 if he takes Ohio, which he already has, Florida, North Carolina, if he takes. And, and, and also Arizona, because Arizona, if he hangs on to that, he should, should, should take Arizona. If he takes Michigan, 270 electoral votes. Put Michigan back. If he takes Pennsylvania, 274. Put it back. If he takes Wisconsin, not quite there. He needs something else. He would need to pull in Iowa. That would get him to 270. So we've seen really a reversal of what we've seen to all throughout this election campaign where Hillary Clinton had multiple maps. Now it's Donald Trump has multiple maps and she has a narrower path. I want to take that to the chief strategist for the Republican National Committee, Sean Spicer. So, Sean, what do you see and what are you feeling? It's just pure excitement here at Trump Tower. Uh, Mr. Trump, Governor Pence and the entire team are just watching these results come in. Uh, the excitement is unbelievable, as we saw in North Carolina, Ohio. Uh, we're keeping our eye on Florida, but it looks good. Uh, and it's just, you know, again, you, you see Michigan and Wisconsin all closing in. And, and as I know Jonathan Carl was just talking about, uh, I'm not sure which one or all of them that we'll take. But it's definitely the race that we thought. I know we've, we've kind of had that candidate with a message in the ground game that we've been touting for a while. I think it came together and it's producing the result that we thought it would. What did you see that others didn't? Well, I, I think that we saw a shift in the electorate a few weeks ago uh, to Mr. Trump. And, uh, and again, I think this, this was the perfect storm. You heard Republicans out there talking about Clinton, Inc., the Obamacare increases uh, and, and the Trump message of change all kind of coming at that perfect storm in these last couple of weeks. And then when the FBI scandal happened uh, and they revived the concerns that most voters had with trust and honesty, uh, it really kind of became that perfect storm of that message of change uh, that Donald Trump and Mike Pence have been talking about. And what are you seeing out of Michigan right now? Well, again, I think that we, we've seen a shift in it the last couple of weeks. We had us going into this race just barely ahead, and, and the counties that we're tracking and the results that are coming in are pretty much on par. I think it's going to be close, but we're going to pull it over the finish line. And, and Wisconsin? Wisconsin's going to be a tight race, and, uh, and so we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. But, but Senator Johnson's fighting hard, uh, and I think we're, we're, we've got some areas that, you know, if you look at some of those key counties that Obama won 52, uh, 51, 52 percent, you're now seeing a role reversal where Donald Trump's up 51, 52 percent in those. So we're not giving up on Wisconsin. Uh, it's going to be tough, but, but it's amazing to see some of these counties come in. And I think that we feel, we feel pretty good about where Iowa's going to end up as well. You and your boss, the chairman of the Republican Party, Ryan Priebus, took a lot of heat for the way you've backed Donald Trump. I was wondering how Mr. Priebus is feeling now. I think there's smiles all around Trump Tower tonight. Uh, I think we've touted, and you know this, and John Carl knows this, but we've been talking about the data operation that the RNC put together, the ground game that we have, the amount of time and money that, that, that Chairman Rice Priebus has invested in both. And I think that we have a candidate that's talking about change and a movement, and those things combined. Uh, we've been talking about for a while, and I think it's, it's, it's finally that combination hit it at the sweet spot, and I think it's going to spell for a really good night for us tonight. Sean Spicer, thanks for joining us. All eyes on the big battleground states, Florida, North Carolina, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Polls about to close in five more states. We're going to have all the latest results when we come back. here in the East election night 2016 and it is in keeping with what this year has been unusual unpredictable could we have one of the biggest upsets in presidential history in the making right now 
Well, let's take a look at the map right now. Donald Trump is in the lead. Those are the two campaign headquarters here in New York uh, right now. Javits Center for the Clinton campaign, New York Hilton for the Trump campaign. But let's put up that board right now. See where things stand. 190 electoral votes for Clinton, 172 for Trump. That's because a lot of states have just come in. Polls have closed in five more states, 82 electoral votes. Let's go through those. California, that's the big one. 55 electoral votes going to Hillary Clinton. That was expected. She wins it, the biggest Democratic prize of the night. Out west, Hawaii, four electoral votes. They haven't voted for Republican since Ronald Reagan's landslide in 1984. That is going for Hillary Clinton as well. The state of Idaho, also four electoral votes. That's going for Donald Trump's solid Republican state. Not enough data yet in to protect the state of Washington. That's expected to go to Clinton, but not enough data in yet. Or the state of Oregon. We're going to wait for those. But we're paying so much attention now to those battleground states. We started out the night with 12 battleground states. We are down to nine right now. And what we have seen over the course of this evening is many more electoral paths opening up for Donald Trump to get to the 270 he needs. John Carl, you've been following it all night long. Let's start with that state of Florida. It looks like he's running the table on these remaining states. Florida, 95% of the vote is in. Donald Trump has a lead of well over 100,000 votes. There's just not enough votes out there, I believe, for Hillary Clinton to, to, to recapture the lead, but still haven't called it. But that is looking, trending very solidly for Donald Trump. Move up north to North Carolina, another state that was, you know, toss up right at the end. He's got a five point lead with 92% of the vote in. Go up a little bit further. He's trailing in the state of Pennsylvania with about 70% in. But look how close Pennsylvania is. This is a state that hasn't gone Republican since 1988. Keep going up north. New Hampshire, 59%, a state where Trump has been the underdog for months, George, and he is 49% to 46 for Hillary Clinton. But the real stories, the real story here may be in the industrial Midwest, the states of Michigan, where he still has a lead with about half the vote in, and the state of Wisconsin, where he is the ultimate underdog. He is up three points with 57%. Cecilia Vega. Think about this message shift that we saw from Hillary Clinton in the last five to seven days. You don't just vote against something, you vote for something. And a lot of observers, I think, would say that perhaps that message came too late for Hillary Clinton. The obituary, of course, is not written on either side at this point. But when we look back at the message that she cast over the last few days of this race, she said, don't just for, vote for something, vote for, vote, don't vote against something, vote for something. And, and I think it came a little late. And of course, so much of her message was drowned out in those final 10 days by that news from James Comey, the FBI director. Absolutely. Uh, again, to go back to the campaign's quick change in positioning, they were virtually gloating on her campaign plane just a few days ago about the status of this race, talking about their powerful ground game, this Clinton coalition they built, a, built up all around the country. And then this news broke and you saw this deflated sense about them, this roller coaster of emotions and projections. Uh, and But it, it really has been a campaign of emails, 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 and trustworthiness and likability, an issue that she has not been able to get past. Okay. Actually, we're voting for something. They were voting for change. And if we look at this in, in state after state that is close, about 39% of the voters, 40%, said that the change was the most important thing, more important than uh, temperament or judgment or any of that. And those voters went for Trump in each of those states by about 85%. And I want to bring that to Charlie Gibson, because, Charlie, you go back to the year 1980. There's been a Bush or a Clinton in the White House. Right. Every year since 19, except for eight years, the last eight years of Barack Obama, and then you had Secretary of State Hillary Clinton as well. We saw what Donald Trump was able to do to Jeb Bush in the primaries, and maybe there's some reaction just to people who've been in far too long. Yeah, I, you know, I think that was one of the things that, uh, despite the Donald Trump characterization of Jeb Bush, uh, uh, he was a, a formidable candidate going in. And um, indeed, was uh, had an incredible fundraising operation at the beginning, but people basically didn't want a third Bush in the White House, and and they may not have wanted a second Clinton. You heard those chimes right there. We have another state to project it as the state of North Carolina. Big battleground state. It's going to Donald Trump. 15 electoral votes right there. One of his core four states. So Matthew Dowd, he is filling in that map the way he needs to fill it in. Yeah, as we've talked about, she had all the paths in the world when the night began. Now, he has multiple paths to the Electoral College to get to 270 at this point. She, at this point, I wouldn't say has to run the table, 
but she has to come close to winning all the big prizes out there. Yeah, she has to win the state of Nevada that is still out there. She has to win the state of Minnesota that is still out there. She has to win the state of Wisconsin, the state of Michigan, the state of Pennsylvania, and the state of New Hampshire. Yeah, she's got to, she's got to now run the table. And we've been talking for weeks. Republicans privately have been saying this is a very narrow path for Donald Trump. But now suddenly here tonight, we see a narrow path for Hillary Clinton. And can, I, can I just point out one key number that's coming in, and this is emerging as the storyline of the night out of the national exit polls. Trump's margin among non-college yeah. voters is the highest going back, you know, 30 years. Look at this. 39-point gap between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton when it comes to non-college whites. That's better than Ronald Reagan did in 1984. Amy Robach, I can only imagine the cheers went, that went up in uh, the New York Hilton when you heard that North Carolina call. Oh, you can imagine. It was surreal. There was so much screaming and so much excitement in this room. And then right after they finished celebrating, they started chanting, Florida, 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 and call it, call it, call it. And so everyone is anxiously awaiting for that state to be called, but they are certainly celebrating tonight. You can see the sea of red hats behind me. Earlier this evening, no one had those hats on, those Make America Great Again hats. You can see behind me, everyone is proudly wearing them right now and very excited to be here and waiting for Trump to show up later this evening. Robin Roberts at the Javits Center. Yes, I am here at the Javits Center. We are up on the big screen right now, and it is, as you will... Robin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, they are intently watching uh, the coverage. It keeps switching from network to network, and they're watching very closely. They're doing their best to stay upbeat, and they are... Uh, the, the mood has changed off and on, as you would imagine, but they, as you hear them right now, they are not going anywhere, and they know it is a very small margin, but they still feel that victory is within the grasp for Hillary okay, Clinton. Okay, Robin Roberts, thanks very much. Sean, let's pull up your, your battleground possibilities again right now. Now that we've given North Carolina uh, to Donald Trump, let's pull up, see what we show there, and show his various paths now. Yeah, he's got various paths. So, so solid, he already called Ohio and North Carolina. He's got that solid lead still in the state of Florida. And he's Arizona, let's, let's give him Arizona, 254. So how does he get to 270? How does he get the remaining 16? He's got multiple paths. Uh, the first thing he could do is win the state of Michigan. It gets him to exactly 50. If he doesn't do Michigan, he could take Iowa, a place that he has led all along, although now it looks tight in the, in, in the vote that's come in so far, win Iowa and Wisconsin, where he is leading now. That also gets him to exactly 270. And he could also win the state of Pennsylvania. If he gets Pennsylvania, even if he doesn't get uh, Wisconsin. Uh, I should say that all of these, George, include that congressional district in Maine, the second congressional district. If he didn't take that, all of those 270s I gave you would be 269, 269. Okay, now let's put it back and let's try to imagine what Hillary Clinton's possible paths are right now as well. Put the put, put Pennsylvania back. We're going to leave Florida with Trump? Leave, leave Florida with Trump because for, for, well, North Carolina certainly. Leave Florida there for now and let's see, let's see what, what her paths are. Well, uh, the most likely would be to obviously take Pennsylvania. She's still leading there. And win Michigan. And then keep Wisconsin. 268. She's got to she still. still would need New Hampshire. She's still going to need Nevada or New Hampshire. To, in order to get it. Martha, George, yep. Whatever we're looking at tonight, whoever wins, the closer this is, the greater the divide in this country. And this is such a dramatic evening. And things that pollsters didn't expect, a lot of people didn't expect. But that line well, so I, close. And, and if she wins the popular vote, if he wins the Electoral College, then you'll have everybody doubting everything. Based on everything that we're seeing and likely unfolding of this, whoever wins is going to be very upset. I mean, Hillary Clinton is going to be very, she's going to sit there and think, I came very close, but for WikiLeaks, the release of information that the Russians supposedly hacked and then released out there, uh, and the Comey letter, there are going to be a huge body of Clinton voters. And then if Trump was to lose at this point, and a close race, which it looks like it's going to be, he's going to blame the Republican establishment, he's going to blame the media. So this has become, no matter who wins, I totally agree, it's an untenable situation in the aftermath. If you take a look at the exit polls right now, a 
among folks who say they're voting for Donald Trump, a majority nationwide say that they are not at all confident that votes will be counted accurately. So in some of these states where it's very close, if in the end it winds up breaking for Clinton, that's going to be a very divisive outcome no matter what. Meanwhile, among those voters who say that they prefer Hillary Clinton, 72% say that they are scared of a Donald Trump presidency. There are a lot of folks at home right now watching these numbers come in who are feeling an emotion that they may not normally feel on election night. Absolute terror at what they're yeah. seeing in this map. Stephanie, I see the look on your face and I'm wondering if, if, if Donald Trump wins this, I can imagine a lot of committed Democrats blaming James Comey, blaming the media. Well, I, I, James Comey, absolutely. Uh, you know, maybe media for the attention they gave to it. You know, I think that there's probably a lot of factors here. I think we're seeing a little bit of a wave in rural areas that nobody uh, had in their models, certainly maybe not the Clinton campaign. I think that the Comey uh, situation had more of an impact than anybody predicted uh, because it raised character as an issue and it drowned out any potential closing message that she had. So there are a lot of fingers to point here. Uh, that even leads us to a, a close race like this. You hear the chime. We have another state to project right now. It's the state of Oregon. Seven electoral votes. Has not voted for a Republican in 32 years since 1984. That state is going to go to Hillary Clinton. You see the West filling in now. The blue West filling in for Hillary Clinton. 197 electoral votes now for Hillary Clinton, 187 for Donald Trump. And, and, and Bill, Chris, I want to bring you in here right now, because Matt was talking about how each side is going to feel unhappy, how close this election is. Each side is going to feel some illegitimacy on, on, uh, if, if, if they lose. At the same time, if Donald Trump wins, and I don't think we should underestimate this, if Donald Trump wins, he is going to have a Republican House, almost certainly going to have a Republican Senate as well. Or a 50-50 Senate, which his vice president would break the tie on. No, I mean, if you had told anyone a week ago, undivided Republican government is now the single most likely outcome, by no means certain, Wisconsin and Michigan are very much up in the air, but if you look at the numbers, looks like he's trending ahead in both those states. Um, that's pretty amazing. But Trump has surprised Trump, Trump surprised a lot of us in the primaries time and time again, and we thought, okay, that was the primaries, general election, every poll is three or four points, the state polls. Nate Silver, who to his credit was very cautious, much more than most, in, in giving the odds, uh, in, 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 in predicting a Hillary Clinton victory, still he said it was two to one Hillary Clinton victory, and it looks like it might not happen. So Trump will have surprised again, and it will be an amazing moment. As there, when is the last time there's been a real upset of this kind when people went in on election day thinking, it was two, somewhere between two to one, four to one, five to one. I guess maybe Dewey defeats Truman, but that was a time when they didn't even poll in the final three weeks <laughs> right. uh, of, of an election. Alex <laughs> Castellanos. I think the big story, though, here, win or lose whichever candidate, is the size of the repudiation of business as usual, what Koki was talking about, the demand for change, is stunning tonight. And in that, I think there is an opportunity to bring the country together. Trump did it, by the way, if, if he does win tonight. He did it March 15th in Florida after he won the Florida primary, the gracious press conference, lots of flags. Whichever candidate wins tonight is going to need to do that, reach just out one, to one, one, Just one footnote, if I could. I mean, what's amazing is, is just Obama, President Obama's approval rating in some of these states, Michigan, Wisconsin, is above 50%. Yeah. So by definition, if Trump wins them, there are some people who approve of President Obama who are voting for Donald Trump. Think of that. I think the thing that is fearful and really is striking terror with a lot of people, it's not whether uh, Trump can strike that balance, but the people who've come to those rallies. Um, there was a lot of hate in in those rallies there was a lot oh, of I racism in those discanola. absolutely it was and to for I think, uh, we think a little bit more of about half of the American people who might be voting for Donald Trump than to than to say that about them you know the only they, they wore it on their t-shirt and all I'm saying is there's oh. a lot of people who are you know you can say what you want about Trump and what he wants to do there's a lot of fear in communities about the people who showed up for those rallies there was not a lot of let's all work together this, in those rallies. This may be an election that's about mm -hmm. change, but I think there's a big question about what type of change these voters want. We're, We're, still, still, We're still trying to figure out when this a magical year, when America was great. Do you know the year we're trying to get back to? Nobody's trying to get back to anything. He's talking about making America great and opening up opportunities for everybody. He went into the inner city and said, why do we want, why, do, why is black America trapped in islands, these urban islands of poverty and despair? Let's do something about that. And we're still waiting to see what's going to happen right now. So, John, Trump I want to come, I want to come back. I want to come back to the, the, the states that we're looking at most closely. What are we seeing in Florida? 
Well, Florida, we have now 96% reporting. And George, if you look at Florida, if you look at those counties that I've been talking about down about Miami, about Democrats waiting for that vote to come in, well, Miami-Dade's 100% in. And, and Broward and, County is 100% in. And she won each Palm of Beach. those. She won each of those first two by 30% of the vote. She won uh, Miami-Dade by uh, almost 30% of the vote. In other words, a margin bigger than Barack Obama. Yeah, won. and Cecilia, what's so interesting about that? That means that the Clinton people hit their targets. They said if they won Miami-Dade by about 25%, they would win. What apparently they have not accounted for is the surge in Trump territory. I think there is probably some serious head scratching going on uh, right now and uh, and rear view mirror peering into trying to figure out how this possibly could have happened in this state that they uh, both sides said was a must win. David? Can't underscore this number, George. Take a look at this. When you look at non-college whites in this country, how they voted, it's a 39-point gap. 28% went for Hillary Clinton, 67% went for Donald Trump. And George, how many times did Kellyanne Conway, in talking to both of us, tell us there's going to be a shadow Trump vote? And that shadow Trump vote is non-college whites here in America. I remember being out in the trail with him on Labor Day, and Donald Trump kept saying to me, look at the size of the crowds out here at this county fair. Look outside the door. Look at the people lined up down the street. He said the same thing to Tom Yamas over and over again. Donald Trump was confident that what he was feeling and sensing in those crowds was something that people were not registering in these polls. Let's go back. I go think ahead, there's go one ahead. other thing we should raise, and I'm getting certainly getting emails about it, which is uh, there probably is a strong sentiment about not having a woman president. And that is something that we've never had a woman president. And we've talked about excitement among women to have a woman president. But uh, there's, there's always in these situations at least equal amounts of hostility to that kind of change. And the fact that, we've, you know, that we're seeing this, uh, uh, particularly among non-college educated white men, is not surprising. And I think some of it has to be attributed to the fact that, that Trump is running against a woman. The vote is still coming in. What are we seeing in Michigan? Michigan, we still have, I'm sorry, I'm back on the uh, the, the, the 12 map. Michigan, uh, Donald Trump, 49%, 46 for Hillary Clinton, more than half the vote counted. So Michigan, we, we're still looking for Wayne County, it's Detroit, but look, 60% of Wayne County is in. Only 40% outstanding in Wayne County, Detroit, which will be a lot of Democrats. Uh, out in Grand Rapids, Kent County, uh, two-thirds yet to be counted. That's solidly Republican territory. So you could see Trump's lead some ways build in Michigan. You know, George. Well, well I would just add about Michigan. I think what you, I mean, obviously, Wayne County is much bigger. So 40% yes. left in Wayne County is a much bigger pool of votes and 65% in Kent County. Macomb to me, and John just brought it up, yeah, Macomb I, I just to me Macomb. is, a, is may, may come down to Macomb County, which is Donald Trump is carrying, but not as big as he was carrying earlier. But Michigan, Michigan is going to go until the wee hours. But we should explain but, a little bit more about Macomb County because it's a key county in, 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 the, in the state of Michigan. That is a state where Ronald Reagan uh, brought a lot of, of, of people, Democrats over to the Republican Party. They were called the Reagan Democrats up in Macomb County. Bill Clinton won them back for the Democrats in 1992 and 96, been fought over since, and it looks like Donald Trump could be getting them back Well, and it was well. basically, if you go, and John has, I'm sure, as the numbers is, is it, it's always, winning Michigan for a Democrat was always run up the numbers in Wayne County, do as best as you can in recently, and you can in Oakland and Wayne, I mean, Oakland and Macomb, and then survive the rest of the state. That's what was the, always the winning strategy for Democrats. It looks like now that he's doing better in Macomb than normal and outstate, which is the rest of the state, the rest of the mitten, as we say, the rest of the mitten, he's running up huge numbers. Bill Crystal. Oh, so check on this. I'm just looking at my own, you know, little uh, math here. That Trump is running stronger in Wisconsin than Michigan and is very likely to win Wisconsin. There's more vote in there and he's got a bigger margin. And the parts that are outstanding don't look particularly democratic to me. What are we seeing in Wisconsin, Jim? We're, we're seeing 63% of the vote in and he's got a lead a commanding lead, a 3% lead. So, I mean, I, I haven't Now, what does the math do with Wisconsin? Well, Wisconsin's a smaller state than Michigan. So 10, what if, 10 electoral votes. Wisconsin means he has to Michigan. hang on to Iowa. If he can hang on to Iowa, wins Wisconsin, he's And there. where are we in Iowa? Iowa's close. Uh, let's take a look. Right now, Trump has moved ahead in Iowa, 49-46. Tom Yamas. After, after being behind for most of the evening. One of Trump's top aides on Twitter tweeting now, it's happening. Um, <laughs> we're seeing... 
a trend What's here that happening? is happening. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know, but but apparently it's happening, and they're very excited about it. And one thing I'm thinking about is the conventional wisdom throughout this campaign. I know Bill was talking about this was always wrong. So there. there Many of us shouldn't be surprised tonight because he always exceeded expectations. He called this Brexit plus, plus, plus this week. He may be 100% right. And I'm thinking, as I was looking at Amy Robach's live shot inside his, you know, victory watch party, he is such a master at branding that he not only motivated all these white voters, but he also gave them a uniform. They're all wearing that Trump Make America Great Again hat. And to me, I think the big story right now, if he ends up winning tonight, is that he motivated the white vote so much. He gave them a shot of an espresso and a Red Bull chaser, and they ran to the polls for him more than the non-white vote, which was not the conventional wisdom. The Trump camp says it is happening. We'll be right back. Back live in Times Square after this. And we are back now in Times Square, coming up at 1130 in the East. We just heard before we went to break, tweet from the Donald Trump campaign saying it is happening. They believe they are on their way to victory. I want to bring John Carl back in here because we've been paying so much attention to these battleground states. And if you look at these battleground states right now, Donald Trump isn't ahead in the states he needs to get 270 electoral votes. He absolutely is. Let's take a look. Let's go start in the South. Start with Florida. He is, I think, has a very commanding lead with 96% of the vote in and all the Democratic vote in in Southeast Florida. So move up to the state of uh, North Carolina. He has already won. Pennsylvania is one state. <laughs> look at this, George. 48-48. Wow. Trump with a slight lead in the state of Pennsylvania was 66% reported this is a state again that has not gone Republican since 1988 a state that few people I imagine few people in this room thought Trump had any chance of being close in he has it tied uh, move up state of uh, New Hampshire another state he had trailed Trump still continues to have a lead with 64 percent of the vote in go to Michigan Michigan has tightened a bit, but Donald Trump still has a lead in Michigan. Still, almost half the vote is still out. Wisconsin, maybe the shocker of them all, 65%. Two-thirds of the vote is in, and Donald Trump has a lead, a three-point lead over Hillary Clinton in Wisconsin. Getting back to what Cokie Roberts brought up a little earlier, whether or not we are witnessing uh, pushback to the idea of the first woman president. And I just want to show you uh, some of the numbers. We have the breakdown uh, in the national exit polls. Looking at this, 41% of the men who went to the polls today went uh, for Hillary Clinton, 53 for Donald Trump, 12 point difference there. And when you look at women, it's the reverse. Hillary Clinton, 54, Donald Trump, 42. That's a 24 point gender gap. We haven't seen that since 1976, Koki. Huge gender gap right there. I want to go to Rebecca Jarvis, our business correspondent. Markets around the world are watching these results come in. And they're selling off around the world at this moment, George. Dow futures at this moment are down more than 700 points. If that were to stick in tomorrow's trading session, to put that in perspective, it would be the single largest digit loss for stocks since the Great Recession. Okay, we heard that, Chime. We have another state coming in for Donald Trump right now. It is the state of Utah. Six electoral votes. Last voted Democrat in 1964. Looked like it had been in play for a while because Donald Trump not popular among the Mormon community. There was a Mormon native son running, Evan McMullen, but not enough. Donald Trump is going to win the state of Utah. It stays solid red right there. He is continuing to fill in that map. Right now you see 197 electoral votes for Hillary Clinton, 193 for Donald Trump right now. But as John Carl was just showing you, he has many, many more paths to that 270 right Right now, John. Yeah, if we go back and do the paths, excuse me. So here it is. Hillary Clinton, she's got Colorado, she's got Virginia, he already has North Carolina, Ohio, but if you give him Florida, where he's got a commanding lead, if you give him uh, New Hampshire, where he is leading, if you Look at now, now he's at 247. We have multiple ways for him to get to 270. One way to get there, George, is he wins the state of Michigan, takes Arizona, which has been solidly Republican. He's at 274. So take Michigan back out. He can win the state of Wisconsin and Iowa, where he is leading and has led for some time in the polls. 
take Wisconsin back out. He can win the state of Pennsylvania. That puts him over the top. Take Pennsylvania back out, win the state of Nevada, and he's at 270. He's got multiple paths plausible pass to 270 electoral votes. So many pass for Donald Trump right now coming up on 1130 in the East. The vote's still being counted in those all important battleground states. We are going to stay here right till the end. So much drama here tonight. Could the biggest upset in presidential history be in the making? We'll be right back. in the east you hear that chime we have a projection it is a big one it is the state of florida 29 electoral votes they go to donald trump donald trump has won the state of florida one of his must-win states right there one of his keys to victory he said all along he was going to win that state he's got a home in that state he worked hard in that state he has pulled out a victory there he is, put, he is pulling ahead of Hillary Clinton. You see it right there, 222 electoral votes to 197 for Hillary Clinton. Matthew Dowd, this is a big one. Oh, it's huge. This was the one that, that for the last month, the Clinton folks said, if we win Florida, it's all over. If Donald Trump absolutely needed it. He got it. And now, as we've talked about, he has many different ways to get to the 270 votes he needs to be the next president of the United States. Cecilia Vega, the Clinton team counting on a surge of Latino voters in the state of Florida. It looks like they actually probably did get an increase in Latino turnout. It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. And uh, uh, radio silence from Brooklyn right now. We know that Hillary Clinton is not too far away from here in Times Square in a hotel with Bill Clinton and Chelsea. And George, just a couple of hours ago, we were getting details from inside the Clinton campaign down to what what their granddaughter Charlotte was wearing that she had an H on her t-shirt and what the catering was and I think the fact that uh, how silent they are right now speaks volumes to how absolutely nervous they must be at this stage of the night. Amy Robach exuberance in the Trump camp. Yeah, no one is quiet over here at Trump headquarters. In fact, I said people were smiling and laughing. Now they're jumping up and down, screaming, high-fiving, and we're hearing those chants that were once Florida, Florida, Florida. Now they're saying President Trump, President Trump, and there is massive celebration going on here, shouting, smiling, people taking pictures. I think there's even a group singing right now. This is a very unexpected turn, and now this crowd won't stop cheering for the man they came here to support. The night started out somber. It is anything but right now, George. Okay, Mirovac, thanks very much. Another state is coming in right now. This one for Hillary Clinton is the state of Washington. 12 electoral votes. Last vote of Republican in 1984. It is going to Hillary Clinton. So now she's got 209 electoral votes to his 222. She's built up the blue states on the coast. Donald Trump doing very well across the middle of the country. Hillary Clinton on the East Coast. John Carl. So here's what, here's what Hillary Clinton now has to do. She now has to run the table on states... She, she has to win all these states in the industrial Midwest, and she has to hang on to Nevada. You heard it there. Hillary Clinton has to run the table to become president. Donald Trump in the lead. We'll be right back. Those pictures tell the story. That's Hillary Clinton campaign right there. You see tears of the Clinton campaign. Now let's take a look at the pictures at the Trump headquarters right now. You hear those cheers. You see those hats. Donald Trump now has 222 electoral votes to 209 for Hillary Clinton. Tom Yamas, he's getting close. The excitement you see in that victory watch party multiply that times 10 inside of Trump Tower right now in the war room. I'm being told by sources they are very excited. They are triumphant for several reasons. You know, we said conventional wisdom was completely wrong in this election, and so was political science. Donald Trump's on his third campaign management team. Everyone said they weren't ready for prime time. Even they themselves at the time weren't sure how they would do in this race. And yet they made the call to go to Minnesota. People criticize him for that. Seems to be a smart play tonight. His last stop on this campaign was in Michigan. 
seems like it was a smart play. And for this very small core group of supporters and people he worked with that are still there, they put up with a lot, and now they're here. We've got another big state. It's an important one. Actually, it's a small state, but it's a very important one. It's the state of Iowa. Six electoral votes. Last vote of Republican for George W. Bush in 2004. It has gone to Donald Trump. And John Carl, I got to bring this to you right now because now basically Hillary Clinton has one path. She basically has one path. I'll show it to you two ways. First of all, on the map, she needs to win all of those states we just mentioned in that in industrial Midwest, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and she needs to hang on to the state of Nevada. If she does that, she narrowly wins. Let's look at it on our possibilities board. So here's where we are. If she wins Michigan, New Hampshire, Nevada, Pennsylvania, she still needs to win the state of Wisconsin to get over 270. So Donald Trump has many, many more paths at this point, and he's still leading. Let's go through those states. He is still leading in most of those states. He is, he is still leading in most of those states. Let's go back to our map. So we go start with <laughs> running, out of, running out of states that are still open to her. Pennsylvania. Uh, Clinton is now up slightly in Pennsylvania, but Donald Trump is up in the state of New Hampshire, 48, 46, 65 percent uh, reporting. In Michigan, it is tightened, but Donald Trump is still leading in the state of Michigan with almost 60 percent reporting. Wisconsin, Donald Trump is up three points with 70 percent remaining. In Minnesota, uh, Clinton has a lead. So, but, but right now, she has to win in three states where Donald and Trump And let's dig down in Wisconsin because he's got a fairly healthy lead there right now. Three points. In Wisconsin, yes, he does. And, you know, here's, here's one county that caught my eye, if I can just zoom back out, in, in Wisconsin. Up here, Door County, it's not a very big county, but this is a county, and I'll circle it so you can see what I'm talking about right here. Um, it, it, he has got a three-point lead with, in, in, I'm sorry, let me get... Door County. Anyway, he's got a lead in Door County. This is a county that Barack Obama won by double digits in 2008 and by seven points in uh, in 2012. It's a it's a it's a place where the median income is 50,000. It's exactly it's almost predominant. It's 96 percent white, and it's a state that's been Democratic, but now suddenly is the Trump Democrat. And Matthew Dow, when you look at the margins in Ohio. That, that would set, tell you something about what could happen in these other states as well. Well, I, yeah, I think when you take a look at Ohio, which looks like it's going to be an 8 to 10 point victory for Donald Trump, and then you'd extrapolate those voters that are there, which are also in Wisconsin and also in Michigan, I, right now the odds completely favor Donald Trump being elected next president of the United States. Right now the odds are totally in his favor. And if he wins Michigan? I mean, if he wins Wisconsin, either one of them, he wins. Terry Moran, you were talking about Brexit. Well, it, it is deja vu. There's no question about it. The, the sense uh, of all the polls and all the pundits going in was that Britain would never leave the European Union. It's such a radical thing to do. And they were being told by all their betters, the, the voters of, of Great Britain, uh, that the smart play, the smart thing to do was to stay in the European Union. And en masse, the great wave of the unwashed. Uh, Britain is a very class based society and the people who voted for Brexit were the people who were uh, not uh, not in the higher classes for sure and they came out and they socked the, the establishment right in the face and it does feel like that's what's happening because of Donald Trump and I just want to take a step back here this is an astonishing personal triumph as Tom just pointed out this was not a campaign <laughs> by any normal sense this was a personal endeavor uh, and one thing struck me while these results were coming in, a quote from his sister, Marianne Trump Berry, who's a judge on the New York State Supreme Court. She said, I knew better even as a child than to even attempt to compete with Donald because he always wins. Martha Raddatz, I wonder what Vladimir Putin is thinking right now. I think Vladimir Putin's probably very excited right now. And I think other world leaders are a little fearful of, of what would happen under a Trump presidency. I think some members of the senior officers in the military are probably a little nervous about this too. I mean, he's basically said the uh, generals have been reduced to rubble. Let's remember what the Trump supporters are voting for. He asked for a ban on Muslims, build a wall, he offended Mexicans, the disabled, lashed out at a Gold Star family, the military fighting in Mosul around there. He said they shouldn't tell people what's happening. And the Access Hollywood tape. That Access Hollywood tape we haven't talked a lot about this evening. But the white working class men I spoke to after that Access Hollywood tape was released didn't care 
I huh? mean, really didn't care. White evangelical votes than we have ever seen in our exit polling, 80-some percent. And it might not have been a personal a campaign uh, for Donald Trump on the, in the traditional sense, but there was definitely a campaign in the churches. There were uh, videos that went out on Sunday of Mike Pence talking in the churches, buses that went out, and that turnout is the highest we've ever seen for a presidential campaign. Byron. George, last night, no, sorry. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Go ahead, Byron. Use the word fear in talking about how foreign leaders are responding to this. I've got a number of emails from friends of mine of color across the country. And there's also a level of fear growing mm -hmm. in brown America. Because if, just if you look at the optics of the Trump rally, right. to many people that looks like 1950 America. You don't see many brown people walking around that room. And so I think there is a sense with some of the rhetoric we've heard throughout their campaign that, that this, if, if Trump goes on the win, this may be a wonderful opportunity for him to now pivot back to the people of color and say, don't be nervous, because many people are nervous this evening. Another piece of good news for Republicans coming in right now, it is from the state of Wisconsin, and that is the incumbent Republican Senator Ron Johnson has defeated wow. former Senator Russ Feingold right there, 52 to 45. So, Bill Crystal, that means uh, if, if this continues to go the way we see it going right now, you will have that Republican Senate. Looks that way, or at least 50-50 with the uh, Republican baby vice president breaking the tie. And incidentally, another state, I mean, Pennsylvania, I mean, which Mrs. Secretary Clinton's ahead in, most, I mean, again, just eyeballing it, most of the vote looks to me like it's Republican vote that's outstanding. That blue wall that everyone, this always happens in politics, right? When I came to Washington, it was the, what was it, the electoral lock that Republicans had that the Democrats couldn't pick after 80, 84, 88, those three big Republican victories in a row. Then there's the, now there's the Democratic blue wall, but the Democratic blue wall, which was Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, those were three of the key states in it, looks like it's totally crumbling. You know, that Wisconsin Senate race is a shocker. That was one that most Republicans today that I spoke to thought was going to go to the Democrats. So we have a very good day for Republicans, not just, and not good for all Republicans on the top, but, but a very good day for Republicans in the Senate and also the House, because it looks like we are projecting that they will lose the nine and possibly as few as five seats in the House. That's far less than they thought they were going to lose. Now let's dig into Wisconsin a little bit more. What are you seeing out of Madison County in Wisconsin? Let's take a look. Madison County, we see 70. In Madison, we see 71% of the votes in. Obviously, huge uh, Clinton vote there, but 29% uh, uh, still to come in. 29% still to come in. How about Dane County? Dane County, right next door. Oh, uh, wait. I don't have Dane County at my at my. Oh, there it is, no, Dane County. A 71% yeah. in, and obviously it's a big Democratic county. So there are still is, there, there still are, are a lot of outstanding Democratic votes potentially out there, but. Donald Trump's Trump got a, a healthy solid lead. lead. George, uh, George, I think one of the things I think we're seeing, we've all talked along how unpopular both of these candidates were, how high their likability, dislikability was, and how untrusted they both were. What it looks like has developed is that they, voters would rather go with a flawed outsider than a flawed insider. That seems to be their decision. They know that Donald Trump's flawed. They know he isn't temperamentally ready to be president. But instead of going somebody they didn't like as the insider, they went with the outsider. And Tom Yamas, let me bring this question to you. You spent a lot of time with the Trump campaign. How much thought have they put into what he would do as president? How prepared are they for this tradition and to take o transition and to take over? You know, he had Chris Christie, Governor Chris Christie from New Jersey, was heading up his transition team. Governor Christie obviously had a, a lot of news he was dealing with in the last two weeks. It's unclear how far he got on that. But he did have a core group of supporters that included Mayor Giuliani, Chris Christie, Donald Trump, of course, himself, and, and others that were with him to the end. Governor Mike Pence, his running mate, who was always with him, Senator Jeff Sessions. So we'll see how that cabinet could possibly shake out. But to be completely honest, I don't know if they've thought that far into the future because they were so focused on winning this race. Another quick update from inside that war room. They're now high-fiving each other. Trump family members with the staff. It, it, it looks like they're almost celebrating a victory tonight. Which is the complete opposite of Hillary Clinton, not on the victory front, on the preparing for the what comes next front. I mean, we were joking, the press corps that covers her, that they had essentially started measuring the drapes. Let's just talk about the two different campaigns. I was just looking at some of these numbers. Days as a candidate, 576, Hillary Clinton, 512 for Trump. She had 350 fundraisers that she attended. He had 50. She raised 502 million bucks. He raised $258. They've got to be scratching their heads right now. You wonder if the Democrats 
Democrats completely not only underestimated Donald Trump, but the entire Republican Party. Let's take a look at the national vote coming in right now as well. Donald Trump has pulled ahead, I believe, in the national vote right there. That's like 48 to 47 percent, about a million and a half votes. Alex Castellanos. Uh, to, to the point here, maybe there's some reasons that men voted against uh, the first woman president and all of that. But underneath this all, Donald Trump had a very clear message. Make America great again. He was changed. I was walking through the D.C. airport and they were selling the T-shirts at the Chachki stand. What did the Trump T-shirt say? Make America great again. The Hillary Clinton T-shirt said Hillary Clinton in 2016. There was no real message, vision, offering the American people something better. They tested 85 slogans in the campaign. Uh, not finding that clear message, the campaign, I think, with the vision and the message, may have had an edge there. And in Navarro, you were one of those establishment Republicans who did not support Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. What happened? Well, um, looking like we uh, didn't do well. Look, I, I think that... Um, I think what we're seeing today is frankly a rejection of Hillary Clinton. I think people looked around and said, I'd rather vote for the devil I don't know than the devil I know. I think the Comey letter was extremely hurtful to her. It's, uh, it's frankly astounding, um, you know, that he won Florida, for example. He had such little infrastructure. He had no field offices. Hillary Clinton began organizing in Florida well over a year ago. When you compare what Mitt Romney did in 2012 as far as organization, Mitt Romney lost Florida. John McCain lost Florida. I think the turnout was wrong in all the polls. They, the same way that Mitt Romney underestimated the number of Obama coalition members that would come out, I think these folks underestimated the number of uh, white folks that would but come there's, out. There's a rule but John Carl, in politics. But, but, if, but, you, if you build a church without Jesus, you get a warehouse. If you don't have a vision, if you don't have something to inspire people, all the machinery in the world won't deliver voters who aren't there to the polls. But to pick up on Alex's point, you know, I interviewed Trump back in 2013 in Iowa. It was his first trip to Iowa as a potential presidential candidate, but nobody thought he was going to run. I don't think he thought he was going to run at this point. And I asked him, what would the motto of a Trump presidential campaign be? This is 2013. And he said, well, I think it would be make America great again. I mean, I, I didn't even remember that. I went back and looked at the old interviews. He has been consistently on that message. So and you I, broke the story. And, and, <laughs> exactly. But, but, but exactly. It's exactly my point. No, but, but also, something happened with Hillary Clinton, which is... For all the talk of when they go low, we go high, the Hillary Clinton campaign at the end was entirely a negative campaign. It was Donald Trump is unfit for office. He is temperamentally unfit. He is unprepared. Not only that, he is likely to fly off the handle and maybe even cause a nuclear war. That was literally the argument that they were making and in the final days. you know what she talked about? You got a projection there. We have a projection. It is the state of Georgia. 16 electoral votes. They are going to go to, to Donald Trump as well. Bill Clinton won it in 1992. Republicans have won it ever since. Donald Trump continues that tradition. The map continues to get smaller and smaller and smaller. The lead for Donald Trump gets bigger and bigger. He now has 244 electoral votes to 209 for Hillary Clinton. Of course, you only need 270 to win. David Muir, he is closing in. He certainly is, George. And look at this. This is really fascinating. A key question that we ask every four years, the, the track of this country. And if you think it's on the wrong track, look at this. 93% who say wrong track went with Trump. 32% who did not believe wrong track went with uh, Hillary. And look at this. Non-college white men. This is even larger than the number I had for you before. This is 49 points. By 49 points, Donald Trump won non-college white men in this country. Uh, that's a record set. The last one since 1980 was 11 point gap. Yeah, and Let me go back to Pennsylvania and Ohio in those rural areas when voters were absolutely saying those white working class men were, were enthusiastic about Donald Trump. They were that hidden vote. Got to take a break. Donald Trump, 26 electoral votes from victory. Such a dramatic night. Everyone is watching Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. We'll be right back. back now coming up on midnight here in the east, in the east donald trump let's take a look at the map right now donald trump has a lead 244 electoral votes to 209 for hillary clinton you need 270 to win you see the states out there right now for hillary clinton to win she basically has to run the table right now donald trump is ahead in most of those states right now matthew dowd this is really something we could have one of the biggest upsets ever in american history coming up
regardless of the final outcome, which I think Lee, if Lee heavily leans in Donald Trump's favor, this is the bi biggest political upset news story in 100 years, in, in at least 100 years. Donald Trump, not favored to win against 16 opponents, comes through the primaries, wins the primary, everybody discounts him, comes into a general election totally behind against a machine that had all the establishment, all of it, including the Republican establishment, basically either silently or vocally against him. And he's about, about not yet, but he's on the verge of pulling off. And I think we're going to look back at this. It's more so than any other election, presidential election, that we've seen in our lifetimes, but go back 100, 150 years. Let's go to Nate Silver right now. Nate Silver, you had your forecast coming into the night like so many others. In fact, you were more cautious on Hillary Clinton victory than many others, but you still had it above 70%. You've had this dramatic change as the results have come in overnight. Well, we were a lot more cautious because of the scenario that's unfolding now, which said if she underperforms in the Midwest, she could lose the Electoral College despite winning the popular vote. She will probably win the popular vote once California and the West Coast is counted, but there are a lot of swing states in the Midwest if you lose Wisconsin, which has not been called yet, but probably will be if we're being honest. Um, she can maybe hold Michigan, Pennsylvania, and get to a 269-269 tie, um, but when you lose Ohio and Iowa by three to five points, um, when Michigan is in jeopardy, uh, her voters are concentrated just on the coasts, and she'll have plenty of votes. She'll get a lot of votes, maybe more votes than Donald Trump, but <clears throat> that leads to not her winning the White House. No, that's that. And, and where is your projection right now? Can you put it up there again? So right now, um, we have Clinton with a 20% chance, but that's without Wisconsin having been called. Um, when Wisconsin's called, she either has to basically win Arizona, or there are some ties, some 269-269 ties. They involve her running the table that would go to the House of Representatives, potentially. Um, so, you know, not even that much of a reward for Clinton there, because the House would probably be Republican. Um, but if she ran the table, it could be a tie is maybe her, her best hope, unless there's a lot of vote we are accounting for in Wisconsin or Arizona somehow swings her way. Let's take another look at the states that are still out there. John Carl, let's start with Wisconsin. I, I keep thinking, by the way, stranger things have happened, but I, I don't know if stranger things have happened. I mean, just, just no. to Matthew's point of you know, covering this race, the, the odd the chance that this guy would be the Republican nominee were, 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 were astronomically small. And, and then this, it's just unbelievable. So you wanted to go to Wisconsin. Wisconsin, Donald Trump's lead is actually expanding in the state of Wisconsin, four points next door in Michigan. It's tight. But I tell you, I've looked at this 48, 47. Hillary Clinton is underperforming in Wayne County, which is Detroit. She is underperforming in, 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 in Wayne County. The, clearly, the, the big city vote, the African American vote in Michigan is not turning out for Hillary and Clinton. And since Nate Silver it. mentioned it, let's take a look quickly at Arizona because Arizona, Donald Trump has a lead there. Arizona, Donald Trump has a lead. It's only a three point lead, but 63% reporting. It's closer than you would have uh, expected in, in, in previous cycles, but it's highly unlikely that she's going to win the state of Arizona. Koki Roberts, astonishing. It is astonishing. I will say this about Arizona. They have voted to uh, increase the minimum wage, and maybe some of the same people voting to increase the minimum wage are also voting for Hillary Clinton. So it could be surprising there, but it would be a surprise. Well, it is. And in Arizona at, tonight also, uh, Joe Arpaio has lost. Of course, the sheriff, free to be strong the supporter Secretary of Donald Trump. Trump. And okay. John McCain is one. Okay, John McCain <laughs> is one right there. We are just moments away from midnight. I have to take another quick break. Crucial point in this race, all eyes on Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. We'll be right back. Back live in Times Square, here again, George Stephanopoulos. It is midnight here on the East Coast, and Donald Trump is racking up the victories. He now has 244 electoral votes to 209 for Hillary Clinton, only needs 26 more to get the 270 he needs to become the next president of the United States. Tom Yamas, what are you hearing from inside their camp? We just got a really good piece of information from our intrepid embed who's been covering Donald Trump from the start, John Santucci. He gets this from a senior level source, Donald Trump, for the first time tonight, has left the war room. He's gone up to his penthouse in Trump Tower, and he said he needed a moment with his wife. While this is happening, Trump Tower, I'm told, is exploding in a good way. They think this is their night. Um, and, and just thinking with this 
political team here. You know, looking back at this campaign, if you break it down on a simple level, you know, Matt Dowd and Karl Rove, they had this amazing operation with the Bush campaign where they were crunching numbers. And the Obama campaign had this amazing digital operation that Terry covered, you know, micro-targeting different people. And when I think about Donald Trump, he essentially won this race by labeling people. He labeled Jeb Bush low energy. You know, he had a, an important message, but this is how he killed his opponents. Lying Ted, Lil Marco, and of course, Crooked Hillary. And as I think about labels right now, I'm also thinking about a title we haven't said yet, and the night's not over. But think about this, President Trump. President Trump yeah. would be the 45th if he indeed does win. Now we're paying attention to three key states right now, Michigan, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. Let's take a look at them one by one. John Carl, let's start out with the state of Michigan. Start out with the state of Michigan. Donald Trump clinging to a very small lead, but it is a lead, and you now have 64% of the vote in. About a 50,000 vote lead right there right now. And you go next door to the state of Wisconsin, and Donald Trump has a larger lead, 76% of the vote in. We zoom back out, and we go over to the state of Pennsylvania. Here is one where we have essentially a tie. We have about 4,000 vote lead out of... Five million votes cast. But Donald Trump does not need Pennsylvania. Does if he wins Wisconsin it. and Michigan, he becomes the next president of the United States. I, I just want to go back to what we were saying earlier this evening about what the appeal of Donald Trump was in these places, in the rural areas. And it was he gives those voters hope. They may not believe that he can really change anything, but he is their hope and change candidate. They rejected Hillary Clinton in those areas. They want the man who promises them, even if he can't deliver on those promises, he's their man. He's their guy. There's no question, and let's just dive in. Look at this, U.S., wrong track, and we saw that earlier. You know, if you think it's on the wrong track, you go with, you go with Donald Trump. This is interesting, too, Supreme Court. If you thought Supreme Court appointments were important, you went with Donald Trump. And to get back to what Tom Yamas was saying, you know, he said he went with labels, uh, you know, lying Ted and low energy Cheb. I just wonder how much of all of these big Republican establishment names, like the Bush family, saying they would not vote for Donald Trump, uh, and a number of others, John Kasich in Ohio, how much that also fueled these voters who felt left behind in rural America. I, I, I would have to imagine a lot of these voters said, you know what, I don't care what the establishment's going to do, I found my man. Cecilia Vega. Well, also I'm sitting here just surprised by the fact that we are all surprised by this in a campaign that has been nothing but surprises. We, How many times have all of us sat around a table and said, I can't believe that just happened? From the very first time Donald Trump came out of the gate and basically offended all Latinos by calling Mexico some of them rapists, to Muslim ban, to a deportation force, to not denouncing the KKK fast enough. The list goes on and on and on. And yet here we are surprised by where he is. It's just it's just pointed to me that it's been a campaign of, oh my God. Charlie Gibson, my thoughts go right now to uh, the White House. Barack Obama in the White House right now, Michelle Obama <laughs> in the White House right now. They poured everything they had into this in the final weeks. Uh, President Obama, going back to that White House Correspondence Center, what was it, three years ago showed nothing but contempt for Donald Trump. This is a repudiation in some ways of him as well. Terry and I were just talking about the fact, can you imagine on, if Donald Trump wins this thing, that ride up to the Capitol on uh, <laughs> January 20th for the inauguration with uh, Barack Obama sitting next to Donald Trump in the, uh, in the limousine going up there. They'll go up there together and it will be a pretty frosty ride. You know, Tom said something at the beginning of the evening, which I think is, a, uh, is fascinating. He's this, what an incredibly non-traditional campaign this was. <laughs> it was Donald Trump with a microphone, a hat, and an airplane. Twitter account. And a Twitter account. And a lot of media exposure. And extraordinary and media, media exposure. Media is a good point. Media is a very good point. We sure. haven't talked about the media. Donald Trump talked about, Tom certainly knows this personally, every night. about See? every night that we weren't telling the truth, that we were the corrupt media, that don't believe whatever you hear. And apparently a lot of people bought right into that. It's not only that, but George, he, George, Donald Trump sure. came to this campaign. He might not have had a traditional campaign by any stretch, but he came to this campaign with a skill set. He, he was a television right. performer. He had The Apprentice. He had other ventures. This was, this was something that he brought that no one really could match. None of those establishment Republicans during those debates across from you and me, Martha, you know, Donald Trump was the best performer on that stage, and he knocked them all off the stage. You know, yeah. I was thinking, George, about trying to reflect on when is the last time in our history that we've had a moment like this that somebody like Donald Trump showed up 
And the closest I can get is Andrew Jackson, which was 1828 when he basically was the populist. Everybody was against him. They thought he was a crazy man. What was he going to do to the White House? Who was he going to invite over? There was no way he should be president of the United States, including all of his party. Didn't want him to be president. He won. Let's take a look back at the states. It still isn't decided yet. We do have 244 electoral votes for Donald Trump, 209 for Hillary Clinton. Let's start with the state of New Hampshire this time. John Carl, what are we seeing there? By the way, I've got to share something with you first. A tweet from David Plouffe, who was, of course, the architect of, of Barack Obama's win in 2008. Thought Hillary His, Clinton couldn't lose. Yeah, absolutely. He said, never been as wrong on anything in my life. He says there's still a beating heart in Wisconsin. He does, still doesn't know if it's over, but he has never been as wrong as anything. I think that is... He's not alone. <laughs> He's not yeah. alone. Which state did you want to go to? Let's go to New Hampshire. Let's go to New Hampshire. This is uh, another one. We now have 77% reported, and Donald Trump continues to lead in the state of New Hampshire. And Michigan? Michigan, still tight. But again, Donald Trump with a more than 50,000 vote advantage in the state of Michigan. Next door, state of Wisconsin, Donald Trump, the lead, if anything, is expanding. And, and I looked back, uh, there, there's a, most of the vote is in in Dane County, most of the vote is in in Milwaukee. There's not a lot of more Democratic votes to mine in the state of Wisconsin. We haven't checked in on Minnesota in a while. What's happening in Minnesota and Nevada? Uh, Minnesota, Hillary Clinton's got a lead, a pretty formidable lead with 70% in. She's up six points out in Nevada. Hillary Clinton has a, a solid six point lead with 70% report. And Pennsylvania? And Pennsylvania, tight. Look at that. Look at that, George. <laughs> Donald Trump is back in the lead in the state of Pennsylvania by about 8,000 votes. More, so he's more ahead in Pennsylvania, ahead in Michigan, ahead in New Hampshire, ahead in Wisconsin right now. It, it, it's looking like a Trump victory. Uh, overseas, not quite overseas, over the northern border, the Canadian government's immigration website crashed tonight <laughs> uh, after Barbara Streisand and Brian Crest and a lot of other people said that if Donald Trump wins they'd move to Canada type in you can try it yourself it crashed tonight it was it was overloaded so uh, the international shock waves have already started I want, come, I want to come back to what we're talking about I, you, you cannot this is this is you cannot take give him enough credit for, for for doing this for pulling this off and I don't mean from and I don't want to be a Debbie Downer <laughs> but, but one of the things that's so dismaying that we saw all through this is people can't talk to each other anymore. They don't, they, they walk away from conversations with each other um, because the, the feelings are so heated. And no matter who wins this thing, that's not going away. The, 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 uh, the deep divisions have, have, have divided us as a country, and, and that, that hurts. And that's going to be a big challenge for whoever becomes the next president. I want to go back to Pennsylvania right now. Deborah Roberts is in Johnstown, Pennsylvania right now. What are you seeing? You were among a lot of Trump supporters early this evening. Well, there were a lot of Trump supporters. It was a pretty raucous crowd, but now we are down to the faithful few here, George, who are just biting their nails. I asked them just now if they think that this is over, and a couple of them said, no, it's not over until it's over. But they thought a week or two ago that there was something going on here. The head of the county Republican Party said to us, we think that we're onto something. We think that we're seeing something we haven't seen before. And also tonight, they saw a state uh, Senate race go to a Republican, a race that hadn't gone to a Republican in more than 30 years. So the folks here feel like that they are speaking. These are heavily Trump supporters. And you've got to remember jobs, jobs, jobs. This is an area that was hit hard by the collapse of the steel industry. And even some of the women here who said that they're reluctantly or they did reluctantly vote for Donald Trump today said at the end of the day, jobs trump everything. That's what they said to us, George. So a lot of nervous folks here still waiting, but I think they're feeling pretty confident, but they say it's not over, of course, until it's Donald over. Donald Trump is holding on in Pennsylvania right now. Martha Reddy, you spent a lot of time there. I, I, I certainly did. And, and I have to say, I'm not surprised in those areas where Deborah is, not surprised at all because of the anger. Be, uh, the, the mayor who I drove around with two days ago in Pennsylvania, and we went through these areas and he was showing me all the Trump signs, maybe one or two Hillary Clinton signs. Their town, Manesson, Pennsylvania, has gone from 25,000, it's a steel mill town, down to 7,500. People have moved out, they've given up, they don't have jobs. And he is the one who kept saying, I don't care what Donald Trump says. One other thing I want to bring up, George, and that is whoever wins tonight will not only be president, they will be commander in chief not only just commander-in-chief but we are still at war in iraq 
we are still at war in Afghanistan, and that is going to be immediate. I've been talking to a lot of military in the last couple of days, texting them back and forth, and it really is kind of across the board. But I think Donald Trump was probably far more popular in the military than even the general population, because that's the place if you want to find working class white males, it's in the military. I, I think I, I'm split getting some between things the there. rank and file I think, and the generals? I think, there, I yeah. think there's kind of a split there in the same as in society. Now, no active duty general is going to tell me who they're voting for. The military has already become pretty politicized this year, which is distressing to some people. Uh, but but there is a split, and there are. I was just l listening to someone. He said, "Look, I I like Donald Trump. I like what he says. I'm worried about the Second Amendment. It's all the messaging that Donald Trump has done has gotten." Let's through. keep an eye on the states right now as they continue to come in. The vote continues to come in. Let's go out west, uh, John. Cole. Let's go out to the south. Let's start out with Arizona and then go to Nevada. Okay, Arizona. Uh, Trump has a solid lead with about two-thirds of the vote in, three-point lead over Hillary Clinton. Nevada, Hillary Clinton has a solid lead of about five points. Neither one of those are particularly surprising. To dig down into Pennsylvania, where we see the lead kind of going back and forth right now, Trump up. One thing I would point out, George, is if you look out here in Pittsburgh, this is Allegheny County. This is a county that is overwhelmingly Democratic, and if you look, only 25% of the vote is in Allegheny County. So that will be a lot more Democratic votes coming in. But another county but, that... But Donald Trump, we should emphasize, Donald Trump can afford to lose Pennsylvania. Donald Trump can absolutely afford to win Pennsylvania. It's shocking that we are here uh, this close. And one other place that's interesting in Pennsylvania is Luzerne County, which is a county that if you look back in 2012, uh, Barack Obama won quite handedly. This is steel country. This is coal country. And look at Donald Trump winning by 20 points in a county that Barack Obama won just four years ago. Cecilia Vega. George, we're just hearing from a donor to the Clinton campaign, a top donor. I want to read you this quote that has just come to me, quote, done over, he is the president. This is from a Clinton donor. Clinton donor. There we have it. So we hear we from We've not heard from anybody no, in the campaign. We, haven't projected. <laughs> we have not uh, we have not heard from anybody in the campaign. There's still radio silence. Uh, and I'm told by uh, by my colleagues who were there in the room at the Javis Center right now that there are no aides to be seen. Uh, we know the last we've heard that Hillary Clinton was working on a speech, that her aides were working on a speech in a, in a hotel room in New York. Uh, but again, to read it to you one more time, this stark, stark words from a top donor to the Clinton campaign, quote, done over, he is the president. Trump. If Wisconsin goes for Trump, and if Maine too, that one congressional, one of the two congressional districts in Maine that has, a, which cast the electoral vote, I think that is gotten now for Trump. That's 270. So Pennsylvania and Michigan are very interesting, and he could have a big margin if he wins those two in the electoral college. But all he needs is Arizona, Wisconsin, and Maine too to get to someone to double check this, but I'm pretty sure about this math, to 270. And that's why I think the, if you look at Arizona and Wisconsin, they look pretty strong for Trump. And, and I was, we talked this morning to take up on something Martha said and Cecilia was mentioning is about the being president-elect. There was a talk, and I said this morning, there's two historical things will get broken, either a glass ceiling for a first woman president or the first president who had no political experience or no military experience. And so whatever that resume ceiling or whatever we call it, the paper resume ceiling, he's about to bust through that no president in the history of the country has ever done. They've either had military experience or political experience, and he hasn't either. That's right. We've had generals and elected yes. officials become president before. Both you, Bill Crystal, and you, Matthew Dad, have worked uh, with Republican presidents and Republican White House. And I'm, I'm, I, I just want to pose this question to you right now. We're still waiting for these other states to come in. But as we said, Donald Trump now has multiple paths. He calls you up tomorrow morning and says, what should I do? What is his number one job? Well, I'll have to withdraw my application to go to Canada. I, I'm, <laughs> I, I was worried I couldn't get through on the website there, but I guess it's, it's crashed. His number one job is to unite the country. He needs to make a gracious speech tonight before tomorrow, I think, and really reach out to those who didn't vote for him. I mean, that's traditionally what presidents do. It's traditionally what losing candidates do. I assume Secretary Clinton, assuming she loses, will do something like that. I think it's extremely important, the tone of Donald Trump's speech tonight. It doesn't make up, in my view. I mean, whatever it makes up for, it doesn't. If he's the president-elect, he's the president-elect. I think there will be a certain amount of goodwill, even among those who have very strongly opposed him and thought he wasn't the right person to be become president because you've got to hope your president succeeds. I would add, I agree with that, but I think one of the things he really needs to do, including among his supporters, is he needs to reassure them 
that he is going to be, he's going to be surrounded with people in the White House that they have a degree of confidence in that something isn't going to go out of control. Even his own supporters worry about his temperament and worry about his ability to be commander in chief. So I think he quickly needs to demonstrate some who is going to be around him. Tom and Thomas, quickly. Respectfully, respectfully disagree with my colleague Matt Dowd just because if he wins tonight, it's a testament to himself. I did this by myself. A politician's job, if we take a jaded perspective, everyone knows this, a politician's job, first day in office, is to get reelected. But if Donald Trump looks at that map tonight and he wins by big margins, you know what he's going to do? Whatever he wants. This might be the most stunning night in American political history. Donald Trump, 26 electoral votes away from the White House. We'll be right back. back now coming up on 20 minutes after midnight here on the east coast and donald trump is coming up on victory it is not done yet but he has 244 electoral votes to 209 for hillary clinton shaping up to be one of the most if not the most stunning upset in american political history cecilia vega you've been covering this clinton campaign from the start all through the final weekend they were they were exuberant they were exuding confidence is reality setting in uh, well, we're still not hearing from anyone directly inside the Clinton campaign. I am hearing from Democratic sources who, uh, and, and donors to the Clinton campaign who say that they believe that this race is over for Hillary Clinton right now. Uh, we still, like I just said, I want to emphasize, no one from the Clinton campaign has spoken publicly yet. In fact, the last tweet That's a we sign saw, in and of itself. That is a sign in and of itself, George. Um, I, I, Hillary Clinton is notoriously superstitious. We've been talking about this all day. She had two speeches prepped and ready to go, one for either outcome uh, and she's been working on those speeches along with her aides all day and all night and uh, I guess we will know soon which one she delivers. Tom Yamas, the exuberance continuing to grow in the Trump camp. Uh, I think we're beyond that point now, George. Rudy Giuliani just met with reporters and he's talking about the future, that they're going to start working starting tomorrow on Wednesday, the day after Election Day. They're calling the polls before the election prejudice. The only irony of tonight, Donald Trump said the election is rigged. He may end up winning the rigged election. Winning the rigged election. We'll see. We still have a lot of states out there. One of the things you're finding in these exit polls, uh, David Muren, it, it, it picks up on the point of how personal a victory is for Donald Trump. A lot of his supporters voting for him, even though they disagree with him on big issues. Yeah, it's a stunning thing. It sort of flies in the face of the findings so far on this election night. But look at this. A key question we always ask, which candidate is qualified to be president? The uh, majority of Americans say only Hillary Clinton there, 46%. Look at this. The border wall, one of his key issues, if not the most important issue, 54% uh, of Americans say they oppose any idea of a border wall. And look at this. Undocumented immigrants, a chance at legal status. 70% of Americans say they absolutely deserve that chance. Only 25% say they should be deported. But here's what it all boils down to. Look at this. The quality that matters most. 39% of Americans said the, the candidate who can bring change. And when we laser in on who that went to, 83% of American voters who want to change went with Donald that Trump. That is the big vote right there. But Alex Asciano, let me bring that to you right there. I mean, Mexico's made it very clear. They're not going to pay for any wall, even if Donald Trump wins. How does he bring that to his supporters? Or do they not even care? Well, I... Uh... As far as Donald Trump, what we know about him is the art of the deal, right? Everything is a negotiating process, a position. And for too long, Americans' voters have seen they send people to Washington with their five-point plan, and that's where they start. Well, Donald Trump is the kind of a guy who's, uh, I want to buy this car. Uh, you, you, you're going to charge $50,000, i will give you ten. As long as there's a good faith effort to get things done, I think the American people understand that it's part of the process. And, and we'll give him, I think, some slack as long as we move things in a different direction. But I do want to point out one thing about what happened tonight. Peter Thiel, founder of PayPal, gave a big speech in Washington last week, and I think gave the best summary of what this election was all about. He said, I don't think voters pull the, level, the lever to endorse a candidate's flaws. We're voting for Trump because we judge the leadership of our country to have failed. The details on policy, how much of a wall, how high, that's not the big issue. Somebody's got to turn Washington around. That is the big issue right now. Washington is broken. Someone has to fix it. Donald Trump, 26 electoral votes away from the presidency.
are back on. We had a little audio glitch right there. Sorry about that. But the state of Nevada has gone to Hillary Clinton. Six electoral votes, a lot of early vote there. She wins 49% to 45 right now. John Carl keeping her hopes alive, but they are slim hopes. She now has 215 electoral votes to 244 for Donald Trump. Yeah, she's in, in a situation now, George, where she has to win. She has to basically run the table on these states in the industrial Midwest, including Pennsylvania and that. But she has to win Minnesota, where she has a lead. She has to win Wisconsin, where she is trailing. She has to win Michigan, where she is trailing. She has to win Pennsylvania, which uh, is right now uh, almost a pure toss. So she's got to win two states right now, two key states right now, Michigan and Wisconsin, where she is behind. Yeah, and, and even so, uh, you know, Donald Trump, has has some other paths here if he wins in New Hampshire he can win he can win just uh, just the state of uh, Wisconsin let's go to my possibilities board here because he's got he still has multiple sorry so if you look at this these are the states outstanding Trump's got a big lead in Arizona put that in, in his in his camp so he's at 260 with Arizona Wisconsin alone puts him at, at 270. Uh, he, doesn't need, he doesn't need anything else. And Michigan, of course, puts him well over 270. And Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania puts well. him well over. So he just needs to win one of the three. Okay, that's what he's got right now. I want to go back to Rebecca Jarvis, our senior business correspondent. You're talking about the Dow futures before. World markets are now open as well. Asian markets are open. What are we seeing? We're seeing lower across the board, George. The Dow is now, as far as the futures market concerned, down more than 800 points. The S&P 500, which is what most Americans track their 401k to, futures of the s S&P 500 are down 5%, which means if it were to open there tomorrow, the traditional 401k would be down about 5% tomorrow. And for a moment, the CME group, which oversees the markets, halted trading in the S&P 500 because the stocks were down so much. That is extremely rare that we see things like that. It happened momentarily here. Now the market has bounced up a little bit, but still much lower. Terry Moran, we're starting to see some world reaction come in as well. I want to pull it up here here uh, on, on my email. We saw the French ambassador to the United States and we'll, we'll put up in a second sorry saying this is a world we do not know anymore. That is starting to come in as well. He, he said after Brexit, this election, anything is now possible. A world is crumbling before our eyes and he's absolutely right. And it's the world that was once dubbed the new world order, the world that was built after the Cold War promoting uh, not a borderless world, but a very open world in terms of trade and allowing money and capital and jobs and, and businesses to flow from country to country and immigration. That is being rejected by people who believe, uh, Trump voters would tell you, that the homeland counts more, that we need to secure our borders, get the jobs back, as, as Trump has said. This is a rejection of, of the neoliberal world order that uh, really has been the consensus of governments across the West and across the world for a generation. And Themes, more. Tom Yamas, that Donald Trump hit again and again and again, repetition from that very first day in June 2015. Oh, completely. It was what, what it carried him through the primaries and into the general election. Uh, we've just gotten some reporting also from Trump Tower. I wanted to update you, George. So we now understand that Donald Trump is in a, a wait and see approach. They're waiting for either two things to happen. One, obviously, uh, someone calls the race that he's won, or two, he receives a call from Hillary Clinton. That's where they're at right now. That's where their mind's at right now. Okay, let's take a look, uh, John Carl, at the state of New Hampshire. What are we seeing there right now? <laughs> you ready for this, George? 15-vote margin. Donald Trump is winning the state of New Hampshire by 15 votes. 15 wow. votes. How much is out? 81%. Uh, Oh, so still a lot of votes left lot, out there. Yeah, still, still a lot, lot of votes there, but yeah. it's a 15-vote margin yep. right now. Lots of close states out there uh, right now as we go across this map. Matthew, Dad, this is a lot of similarities right now to Florida in 2000, but not necessarily depending on other states in the upper Midwest fall. Well, I, I think Hillary Clinton would wish it was, was Florida 2000 at this point in time, because that was As a 200 votes. Uh, yeah, it's Bush, uh, if that was the case. I think we at, at, we're going to have to grasp with a lot of things in the aftermath of this, the historical nature of it, unbelievable. But we have to, act, and one of the things I want to follow up with, with, with that was said earlier, is there was major poll problems in this election. Now, she may, Hillary Clinton may end up winning the popular vote in this race, and it looks like she probably will win the popular vote. So the national polls may be not far off, but every single state poll, every single public state poll, 
most of the polls done by the Hillary well, campaign. That, that's what I want to tell you. It's not just the public polls. Listen, we all do a lot of yeah. reporting. We've talked. We we were reporting with the, the Democratic Hil campaigns. We were reporting with the Republican campaigns. We were reporting with the Senate campaigns. I, I talked to both sides, both the Democratic side and the Trump side. And almost we're all in consensus that it was almost impossible at that point. They had a, their Trump side had a route, but they thought it was almost impossible for him to win in the last 48 hours. And he's about to win. Chris, and Republicans in Washington were convinced that he was going to lose. And they were telling this to us quite candidly. They were convinced that he was going to lose. Right. The question is, is there any way to have gotten this right? If you look at what the, the ABC pre-election poll showed compared to the exit polls, the proportion of voters who are these non-college white men, they got the sample right. It's the proportion saying that they'd vote for Trump that was wrong. And so there was this question, social desirability bias. Is it socially unacceptable to say that you would vote for Donald Trump? That may be the problem. And what's tough for the polling industry is you can fix sampling error. You can't fix when people don't want to tell you the truth. And that's a big problem for the polling world. Alex. No, I think if you couldn't figure out in this election that it was uncool to publicly support Donald Trump and tell somebody you weren't paying attention or you didn't have a phone or a television set, and I think that's it, social uh, desirability bias. John Kerry, right, George Bush, 2004, the uh, exit polls had Kerry winning by six, he lost by two. We may have had as big an effect this year. Stephanie. On the John Kerry comparison, the exit polls were wrong, but the internal data was not wrong. Yeah, and Bush, I think the Bush data was we we ended up exactly where we were. And, and we at. were pretty darn close. And I just want to address one thing, the social undesirability of stating that you're for Trump. There's a reason for that. It's not because his message was hopeful. It's because his mes message was divisive. Whoa. Make America great again was a dog whistle for keeping immigrants out, for keeping your foot down on people, for discriminating against women, for sexual that's assault, only, all of these things that Trump became you, about. You know, but and these, and you know what the, well, but Alex, remember the most powerful disagree. ad against Donald Trump were the ads that used his own words. But so he didn't nobody make was it, twisting look, those facts. I'm not going to argue that Donald <laughs> Trump made it so difficult to defend him. These are things about Republicans in elections after election. Everybody said that Mitt Romney was racist and sexist. No, not John, but come on, Donald Trump has to agree with racist and sexist with issue. his language. That's the uh, look, problem. I, I don't disagree with you, Kristen, okay, but you have to quick... agree with me that this is of a different sort. I, I want to go back to the stage. So I just want to call it what it is. That's why he won. Okay, I'm going to call this one right now. We're going to come back in a few minutes after this later. I want to go back to the state of Nevada uh, right now. Jim Avila, that is one place where Hillary Clinton supporters have not yet given up. They just had that win in the state. That's right, George. And in fact, just a few moments ago, the, uh, when the state was, in fact, called for Hillary Clinton, there was a great deal of uh, chanting, yes, we can, uh, and Hillary uh, were being chanted in the room. Died down a little bit. Of course, it's only six electoral votes here. Uh, this was a very, uh, nationwide, they're very disappointed, of course, uh, because this was one of those states when the battleground states where Latinos were expected to have a surge. And apparently there was a Latino surge here that helped Nevada win. But across the country, uh, that Latino surge has uh, been ineffective. It hasn't won. Uh, we've been talking about anger all night long. Uh, anger uh, with the, from uh, working white, uh, white people in the working class. There is also a great deal of anger tonight uh, among uh, Latinos. So I've been getting messages all night long from Latinos uh, in, in, their, in their advocacy groups, and now they've been turning not just to anger, but to fear, George. There is a real fear among Latinos in this country right now because it appears to them that Donald Trump is going to win. And not only just fear about being about their relatives being deported or that there be ICE squads walk uh, run it, walking around the neighborhoods looking uh, for, pre for undocumented immigrants. Uh, it's also a, a fear that they are being marginalized, that, that people of color, uh, Hispanics, uh, Muslims, uh, uh, blacks, that they'll be now ostracized and, and not important. What are the chances now, really, if, if Donald Trump wins? What are the chances of true immigration reform? Even though those exit polls say uh, today that most uh, of Americans who voted today actually favor a path to citizenship. 
uh, but they do not but they also favor a huge wall and that wall is is very fearful and a symbol of marginalization uh, in this country that 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 Americans uh, of, of color are feeling especially well, if, uh, Latinos tonight. if he reverses, if he becomes president it certainly would be a Nixon goes to China in a moment let's go back to the maps right now let's take a look at Pennsylvania right now very 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 close Pennsylvania is close and we have 93 percent of the vote in George Donald Trump is clinging to a very narrow lead but it is a lead with 90 percent of the votes in and early Earlier I mentioned to you that we were waiting for votes from Allegheny County, which is out there for out there in Pittsburgh. Take a look at it now. 98% of Allegheny County is in. So again, there's not a lot of votes left for Hillary Clinton. So to he's be leading in Michigan, leading in Pennsylvania, leading in Wisconsin. That's right, leading in three states. He only needs to win one of them. You talked about Jim Amala there. Talk, he talked about the Hispanic vote, and there were so many headlines in this last week about a waking, a sleeping giant. When you talk about building the wall, about a deportation force early on in the campaign, I think what was missed is that he woke another sleeping giant, and that is the un uneducated uh, white men in this country who heard someone who spoke to them. And that's what we're seeing with 49 points. I mean, that's a record. The biggest record going back to 1980 is an 11 point gap with non college educated white men. We're looking at 49 points between Trump and Clinton tonight. We're seeing gender gaps in some of these states, the likes of which we've never seen before. 30 some points in some states. Uh, and it is, it is another place where you're going to see uh, a sense of being left out. So if you have African Americans voting by 89% for Clinton and Hispanic Americans voting for by 66, 67% and, and women voting for her, you've got this, you've got this incredible divide that's not just a partisan divide, it's a divide among groups of people who are going to feel very, very hostile to each other. They, they, both groups of people around the country and in Washington as well. Byron Pitts, I see you want to get in on this. George, uh, I'm confused at this moment tonight. Join because, the club. Right? Because <laughs> I, I went to an all-boys Catholic high school in Baltimore, made up mostly of blue-collar kids. And I've been talking to a number of my classmates tonight. Many of them went to college, many didn't. Many of them own small businesses. And they see it as, once again in America, the underdog has won. And that's a good thing, because that's very much an American quality, right. that the underdog has won, right? Then I talk to many of my friends of color and women, because oftentimes in, in, in America, if you're a person of color, you're told if you get an education, get a good job, prepare yourself, you can be as successful as anyone else in America. And in this case, you had a, a woman who was on paper as prepared as anyone could be to be the president, and she lost to, forgive me, a white guy with a haircut. <laughs> And, and so you have those, so, so those two let, Let's add to the layer of confusion. Let me bring this to Tom Yamas as well. You have the champion of working class America that's been stuck for a generation without an income increase is a man who inherited an awful lot of money, parlayed that into success in reality TV and branding hotels, lived as far removed a life from that life as you could possibly imagine. George, you have a billionaire who lives in a penthouse in Manhattan connecting with the Midwest people who are nowhere near his economic level. His message resonated with these people so well, and he really never adapted his look or sort of changed his style. He wore that suit everywhere. He'd throw on the hat. Sometime, if he was going into a really, you know, maybe uh, sort of, I don't know how to describe it, but an area where there's a lot of hunting, he would throw on a camouflage Make America Great Again hat. And that was the only adaptation of his, of, of, of his gear when he'd get out there. He never lost that jacket. He played golf every Sunday. But it is incredible that his message connected with those people. And, and I want to add to this layer of confusion and bring this one to Matthew Dowd. He, 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 he connected in a way, just as Tom Yamas is saying, and there's just no question about that. People saw him as authentic as a truth teller, even though if you, you, know, you, you look at the nonpartisan um, examinations of the claims he would make on any given day, and they say by five to one, he was making untruthful statements. Well, I think there was a famous thing said that, that his voters didn't take him literally but they took him seriously, right? So he, the things that many people laughed at said, there's no way he can do that. His voters thought, oh no, he's serious. But the bad things he said, oh, and he doesn't really mean that. I think what they finally decided was they've been frustrated at both political parties. This is not a, a reward for the Republican Party. They're frustrated at both political parties. And they said, give us the biggest, brashest guy, and we're gonna follow him. 
and he's representing us. He's given us a voice that we haven't had in years. We didn't have it with George W. Bush. We didn't have it with Barack Obama. And we forgot what happened with Bill Clinton. And give us that brig, brash, in many ways, bully. And he's going to go to Washington, and he's going to represent me. He's not there yet, but he is closing in. What's happening in the state of Wisconsin, John Carl? Wisconsin is still a solid Trump lead, but I you know, do need to caution you that there are still Democratic votes to come in. Uh, we mentioned Dane County, home of Madison, 81% uh, reporting. It's solidly Democratic, so there's still, there's still votes there. There are still votes in Milwaukee, but if you look overall at the state, you know, Trump's got a three percentage point lead. I would also look next door in the state of Michigan, and Trump is still still at a lead. He's had a lead all night in Michigan. And we've been waiting on Wayne County, which Matthew and I were talking about. Wayne County, which is Detroit, 85% is in. So he's, they're starting to run out of Democratic votes. And New Hampshire? And New Hampshire is tight. Let's see where we, where we are now. Uh, Donald Trump has expanded his 15 point 15 vote lead. He now has uh, a, a more sizable lead with 81 percent reporting. 81, Koki. On all of these ballot measures around the country, they're all going very liberally. Marijuana is getting yeah. legalized every place. The minimum wage is going up every place. Uh, uh, assisted suicide. I, I don't know whether that's a liberal or a conservative idea, but it's it's certainly one that is opposed by many churches, and uh, and that is passing. So it is this very uh, bifurcated result here in well, terms of uh, what people you, are actually saying. You, you separate out the, 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 the issue of the wall, the issue of the ban on Muslims. There wasn't much of a uh, necessary coherent agenda put forward by Donald Trump. But I think and I want to bring this one to Terry Moran. But if he is indeed elected, whether Republican House, perhaps with the Republican Senate, he will be adopting the agenda that they have they have put on the table. That's what Paul Ryan was saying all along. Right. Well, good luck, Paul Ryan, A, retaining <laughs> your speakership and B, imposing your will on Donald Trump, as Tom pointed out. This is a personal victory unlike any we've ever had in American politics, except maybe George Washington. Uh, and and the, the thing that, that, that is Trump's ideology, he's not a liberal, he's not a conservative, he's a nationalist. Make America Great Again is a nationalist slogan. And what, and, and what counts for the people who voted for him, it seems to me, is that he wants to make America great again. They get a sense that people in this city, in New York City, a lot of them, have more in common with their counterparts, if they're in finance or media or whatever, in Frankfurt, in London, in Hong Kong, than they do with their cousins in Albany. And, and what they want is bring America home again. And I think that's, that's his agenda. I want to go to Mary Bruce in Janesville, Wisconsin. That is, of course, the home of Paul Ryan. Number one on the agenda for Paul Ryan, repealing Obamacare and perhaps a big infrastructure bill. Absolutely. But you make a good point, Terry, just now, that just because Donald Trump may win, that does not mean that Paul Ryan is in the clear here. Remember, he has had that very, very tense relationship with Donald Trump. Donald Trump has called him weak, ineffective. Donald Trump was made very clear his views about Paul Ryan when Paul Ryan first went public with, with his announcement that he was no longer going to defend or campaign for Donald Trump. You can still expect, even if Donald Trump does win, that that relationship could still continue to be quite tense for quite some time. But we do not have a winner yet. Donald Trump has 244 electoral votes, 215 for Hillary Clinton. Race not over. One slim path for Hillary Clinton, all eyes on Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. But Donald Trump ahead in those states right now. We're live with the latest results when we come back. Back live in Times Square after this. Coming up on 1 a.m. here on the East Coast, and boy, what a night it has been in keeping with this entire election. Unusual, surprising, something no one would have predicted just a day ago. Donald Trump, 26 votes away from the White House. He's got 244 electoral votes right now, 215 for Hillary Clinton, and he's leading Jonathan Carl in most of the states out there on that board right now. He sure is, and the key ones are these uh, industrial states in the Midwest and Pennsylvania. If you take a look, let's start in the East with Pennsylvania. Uh, 48, 49 percent, 95 percent of the vote in, and Donald Trump is winning in Pennsylvania. That was just to underscore here. That I mean, was considered is, safe territory by the Clinton campaign from the very beginning. They put some time in there at the end, but did not spend a lot of money uh, at all. They considered that part of their safe 
blue firewall. Absolutely. It's a state, again, that has not gone Republican since 1988. The Clinton team did campaign hard there in the final days, though. Barack Obama campaigned in, in Pennsylvania. They had their final rally in Pennsylvania with Bruce Springsteen, the Clintons, the Obama. So, so Pennsylvania is a place they did put some effort in at the very end, which may have been a sign that they were worried about it, more worried than we realized. Michigan. Again, Donald Trump still has a lead, now just 77% reporting, so there's still a fair amount out, outstanding, but Donald Trump continues to lead in, in, in Michigan. And then the state of Wisconsin, here, this enduring lead, 85% of the vote in, and Donald Trump has a three-point lead over Hillary Clinton in Wisconsin, a state that I would say might have been even more improbable for a Trump victory than Pennsylvania. Uh, Minnesota because, yeah, is let's, the one Let's, spot let's sit on that for a while, yeah. because again, to underscore this, Donald Trump did not win the state of Wisconsin in the primaries. He had the Republican establishment in that state against him. As you have pointed out, some of them came around, but the governor, Scott Walker, was against him. Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, was against him. He had this talk radio network in the state against him as well. He was incredibly unpopular during the primaries, yet ahead right now. Yeah, and at the very end, Paul Ryan, who had refused to campaign with Donald Trump, offered to campaign with him when he saw that Trump was doing an event in Wisconsin in the final stretch, and Trump canceled the trip to Wisconsin. Went and to yet, Minnesota this, instead. This may be the state that puts him over the top. Matthew Dowd. I just can't, can't, I mean, I, the historical, unprecedented, I mean, we've said that word unprecedented from the very beginning, right? And I actually thought Donald Trump, I said Donald Trump would win the Republican primary based upon data. And then I said Donald Trump would lose the general election based upon data. Well, the data was wrong uh, in the second half of that equation so far. And even if Donald, even if Hillary Clinton pulls out a, a close victory in the final hours of this and all of this, something went majorly off in all of the expectations everybody on both sides had. And I think it had to be more than secret Trump voters, people who wouldn't say they were voting for Trump. I didn't find very much of that. I didn't find really anybody who wouldn't say I'm voting for Trump. Um, I mean, there were a couple of people who didn't tell me who they were voting for, but a lot of them were college-educated women. I, I, you know, who, who knows if they were the secret Trump support. <laughs> but, but I really, there, there is something else going on here that the data is missing, that the polls are missing. We do have, we have the late deciders, which is something we haven't looked at yet tonight. This was kind of interesting uh, about deciding, uh, when did you decide? Last few days, last week? Uh, many decided much earlier, but when you break it down to, did you decide last week? And if you decided in the last few days, Trump edged out Hillary Clinton on that, and that will fuel arguments that perhaps the FBI director's announcement affected the final days of this race. Okay, we are coming up on 1 a.m. Eastern. One state still voting. Donald Trump just 26 electoral votes away from the White House. Hillary Clinton has a small pass. She's not giving up. We're not ready to call anything. The latest results coming up. Back live in Times Square after this. It is 1 a.m. in the East, 10 p.m. in the West, and we have an amazing election night going on right now. Donald Trump. Donald Trump now has 244 electoral votes, 244 of the 270. He needs to become the 45th president of the United States. Hillary Clinton now has 215. You see the states that are still out there right now. The polls just closed in Alaska. We can't, we don't have enough vote in to call that one uh, yet to project that one. Three electoral votes in Alaska, but the most consequential states out there right now. And let's just go through them one by one and see exactly where the vote is right now, starting with the state of New Hampshire. Let's take a look at the state of New Hampshire, put that up. And we're going to show where the, the votes are in the state of New Hampshire. Well, there's the state of Wisconsin. Donald Trump holding on to a three-point lead there in the state of Wisconsin. In the state of Nevada, we've called that for Hillary Clinton. John Carl, let's bring up the other, the other contested states right now. Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Let's look at every single one of them. First of all, if you're at New Hampshire, uh, Donald Trump has a... Hillary Clinton now has a slight lead in the state of New Hampshire, so a glimmer. Only four electoral votes. She has a slight lead. That's the first lead of the night we have seen in New Hampshire. Pennsylvania, Donald Trump with 96% now in, has a almost 50,000 vote lead over Hillary Clinton. The state of Michigan, Donald Trump continues to have a lead with 77% in, about 59,000 vote lead. The state of Wisconsin, Donald Trump continues to lead. 87% re reporting, he's got a three-point lead. 
out west in the state of Arizona, where Democrats had hoped for a, uh, an upset victory. Donald Trump has a solid three-point lead. Well, and, and, and that's important, because let's go back to your possibilities right now. Let's move over to the state of Arizona, where he has a healthy lead right now, over to Donald Trump. That means he has to win only one of the other big states up there on the board. That means he can win Wisconsin, gets him right to 270. It means he can win Michigan, puts him well over 270. Pennsylvania puts him even further over 270. And by the way, I haven't mentioned that little district up in, in Maine. Maine, too, it's actually big geographically, but only one electoral vote. He's way ahead in Maine, Maine too, as well. So he's likely to get that electoral vote, but he's got a lot of possibilities right now as we come up. And it's been such a surprising evening in so many ways. And Matthew Jad, you were talking about this just before uh, we left. Just uh, in some ways, uh, an entire industry blindsided. Yeah, oh, I think a country blindsided, an industry and a country blindsided. But as I say, let's just look at the expanse of it. This is from every, almost every single media association who did their own polling. They weren't in some conspiracy. They did their own polling, converged on a three or four point lead. The Clinton campaign did their own polling. They were confident they were going to win this election. The Trump campaign did some semblance of polling. They were not confident they were going to win this election. And then every single state poll out there in cumulation effect. And so I think that we're going to be asking a lot of questions for the days that following us. How was this missed? I actually think this is a bigger miss than the Brexit. A much bigger miss because there was it's a way broader more, country. There were way more polls done in this race going up to this and a way more sense of what, what was going on in the country and the arguments were clear. So I think this is the biggest miss the world has seen. And it was you, you know who didn't believe those polls? Donald Trump's voters. They went out there, they listened to him say this is not over. They didn't listen to us. They didn't listen to anybody else about the polls. They went out and voted. Clinton campaign hoping it's not over yet. I want to go to Cecilia Vega, who's going over to the Javits Center now. Give us some sense of the scene there. George, um, I got one word for you, bewilderment. Um, these people in this room in here look completely shell-shocked. I just got in here, but on my way in, there were people who looked like they had come from a party and they were walking out uh, in a, to an event that's not yet over. There is There are questions in this room right now. People don't know what's going on. They don't know if they're waiting for a concession speech. They don't know. They're hoping they're waiting for a victory speech. I've seen one gentleman standing right here next to me. You can't see him off camera who's got a paper. Hillary Clinton mask on top of his head. You know, this was supposed to be the party. And let me just end by saying, George, I am standing underneath this glass ceiling. The symbolism that the campaign went to to book this arena here under a giant glass ceiling um, that at this point, I think a lot of people in here are wondering if, in fact, it will actually be shattered tonight. Radio silence from Clinton High Command, Cecilia. Complete radio silence, George, but to go back to what we were talking about earlier, we are hearing from top Democrats in the party. We are hearing from Clinton campaign donors, big donors, who say this race is over. Okay. And Stephanie Cutter, let me bring this back to you. As I was saying earlier this evening, you worked for President Obama in his campaign. You worked for President Obama in the White House. I, I don't want you to read minds too much, but try and take us inside the White House at this point. Now, you know, John Carl um, brought up that tweet from David Pluff, who of course ran President Obama's campaigns. He was as certain as anyone could be over the course of this campaign that Hillary Clinton was going to win. All the data, as, as Matt Dowd on the Clinton side, suggested a win because they had multiple passes. It sure seemed like President Obama believed mm -hmm. in these final days this was going to be a victory as well. Well, I, I think we all got it wrong. Um, and it would be uh, good for the Democratic Party to take some time and, and look at what happened. And maybe we weren't listening uh, uh, well enough to those voters. Um, she clearly didn't perform as well as she needed to with African Americans, Hispanics, uh, even women, um, despite having a historic gender gap. Um, and he overperformed with white men. So we have to understand what happened here um, and also understand that white men used to be at least part of our coalition, if not the, 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 the winning part of our coalition. They were part of the coalition, but we've completely lost them here. Stephanie Rawlings Blake, and I'll go to Bill Crystal in a second. One of the other things that has been talked about is, you know, you saw in the in the primaries Bernie Sanders come kind of out of nowhere as well to give Hillary Clinton a real fight uh, for that nomination. But um, a lot of hollowing out at the Democratic Party, you aside as a mayor of Baltimore at lower levels. You know, this has been, uh, to Stephanie's point, just troubling, and, and to Byron's point, you know, we're, we're very confused uh, because 
The numbers were just so wrong, uh, just all across the country. I was in Florida stumping for Hillary Clinton. I saw people that were coming out to the polls. They wanted to make sure their votes were in the bank for Hillary Clinton. There were good numbers that we were seeing. Um, I don't know if there was uh, some overconfidence in the, the Democratic uh, voters, but um, we definitely have a lot of, uh, lots of regrouping. Uh, to do as a party. And Bill Crystal, Donald Trump, it was talked about many <laughs> times during the primaries that perhaps this was a hostile takeover of the Republican Party, maybe now on the verge of winning after that hostile takeover. Yeah, just, and I think Matthew Dowd made the point, but just to amplify it, I mean, this is really extraordinary. We've not had a president like Donald Trump, who wasn't either a general or formerly a, or an elected official or a cabinet officer, I guess, Herbert Hoover. We haven't had. Um, uh, the, the, the upset in the Republican Party was pretty striking. The Republicans normally nominate the next in line, a well-respected, established governor or senator or former vice president or something, or son of a former president. So then, and then he, to win an upset like this, I think we are under, we're all going to be underestimating for a while the impact of this. Yeah, you don't have a surprise of this magnitude, so a historic anomaly of this magnitude, and then everything goes back to biz normal, and Paul Ryan's the Speaker of the House, and they're bargaining on an infrastructure so deal. True. I don't buy that. I mean, I don't know the Paul Ryan will be Speaker of the House. I don't think it'll be business as usual. I hope Donald Trump reaches across the aisle and reaches across the country, because it's a very divided country. Whichever one won, won whichever one of them won, Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump would have to do that. Uh, I hope that there's a message of unity, but the governance, what he chooses to do, he doesn't agree with Paul Ryan on entitlement reform, the heart of the congressional Republican agenda. He's he got a very different view of immigration, of uh, trade. I mean, is he really going to go ahead with the trade policies he's talked about? We are in such uncharted, we're in more uncharted waters than we even think, I guess is what I would say going Alex, forward. One, really one think. thing that makes you think, though, is that President Obama's personal po popularity is separate from where he has left the nation and that this was a rejection of continuity. He's, President Obama said it at the convention, Hillary Clinton is continuity. He campaigned for her strongly and voters I think sent a very powerful message there. But as far as uncharted waters, this isn't left right anymore. This is old new. Big old dumb top-down Washington and government has failed this country. That's the verdict. And so we're going to roll a hand grenade under Washington's door and blow it all up. That, I think, is part of the big message tonight. What people were saying was, we hate those charted waters. Uh, you know, we know that where that chart goes, and it's not working for me. Yep. And so uh, what they want is so ironic in a way, because what Trump kept saying, uh, at least about African Americans, if not directly to them, was, you know, what do you have to lose? Well, they felt there was a lot to lose. And all, close to 90% of them voted for, for Hillary Clinton. But, but <coughs> Trump voters thought, that's exactly right. What do I have to lose? I, I guess this is the question I'm, 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 I'm confused about or trying to puzzle over at this point, like everyone else uh, at this point. So you, you, I think your, your reading of that is exactly right. They vote and they say, what do we have to lose? And I guess my question is, I'll read this to Tom first and then Terry, what are they going to get? What is Donald Trump going to do for these voters who have now put their faith in him? Well, I mean, he said he's going to attack those trade deals. He, he wants to tear up NAFTA. Uh, he said he's going to tax companies who try to take jobs out of America. Of course, these were all campaign promises. Will he really be able to do this? We don't know. But he may have a Republican House. He may have a Republican Senate. And, you know, we haven't really mentioned this yet, but the Supreme Court. I mean, all those evangelical voters, you know, Donald Trump really didn't prove to anyone that he was a bigger Christian or that he loved God more than the other of his rivals. You know, he, of course, he said that, that two Corinthians, and we saw the Bible come out in Iowa and South Carolina. We didn't see it again. Um, but he convinced those people, and he got their vote because of the Supreme Court. Only, only eight seats on the Supreme Court right now. Merrick Garland, perhaps the man nominated by Barack Obama, one of the biggest losers of tonight uh, as well, if Donald Trump does go on to win. But to pick up on the point that Tom was just making, Terry Moran, as, as again, his role as chief foreign correspondent, says he's going to tear up trade deals, says he's going to renegotiate the terms of NATO. He's been quite critical of the operation in Mosul right now with and the, the Iraqi Iran coalition. Deal. And, and the, the, Iran the Iran deal. How does the world react? 
uh, in shock, and, and they better fasten their seatbelts. Donald Trump has not only taken over and revolutionized the Republican Party and revolutionized presidential campaigning, he's about to take over the United States in this personalized, charismatic power. Uh, and he's going to redefine the terms of the United States' role in the world, and I have no doubt that he would do it. The president is in office with a great deal of power for a person who knows how to pick it up and use it. And if there's one thing he's demonstrated, he's that guy. And we see we have, we're looking at Trump headquarters right there. I want to bring this back to Martha Reddice. Of course, she questioned Donald Trump closely on this during the debates. But right now, we have American troops on battlefields in Afghanistan and Iraq. Fewer than before, but still there. Y yes, we do. And uh, Donald Trump, I questioned about what he would do in Syria. Uh, his understanding of military policy and civilian military divide. Uh, I don't know that he really has a plan for what he's going to do there. He has General Mike Flynn. General Mike Flynn has been with him. He has, he'll, he'll quickly tell you, he has 200 admirals and generals backing him. I think Mike Flynn has been a huge influence on him. I was also looking back and, and at an interview Tim Kaine gave. Tim Kaine has a son in the Marine Corps. He was asked by John Duck Dickerson, so if Donald Trump is democratically elected and your son is serving as a Marine, you wouldn't trust his life under that commander-in-chief? And Cain said, I wouldn't. You're That's not. a pretty extraordinary thing to say uh, if you have a son in the Marine Corps and that you don't trust the commander-in-chief. The, the people in the military defend the Constitution. Let's That's go back and look at where we are right now. Let's take one more look at these key states as the votes continue to trickle in. Again, start with New Hampshire. I, I've been looking. Uh, so New Hampshire, uh, Hillary Clinton seems to have a lead that, can, that she's maintaining with 85 percent in. But of course, New Hampshire is not enough. Only four electoral votes. Go down in Pennsylvania, 20 electoral votes, solidly Democrat for a long time, and Donald Trump continues to have a lead, a considerable lead. Uh, with 97 percent reporting go out further west uh, to Michigan. Donald Trump continues to have a lead, although it has narrowed some 81 uh, percent reporting. Wisconsin, this is the one that could put Donald Trump over the top. 87 percent reporting, George, and Donald Trump has a three percentage point lead. Needs to win only one of those only three one. states. Just for the sake of it, let's also look at Minnesota right now as we keep an eye on uh, the Trump. Uh, Headquarters in New York Hilton right now. Yeah, so uh, Minnesota I'm sorry, Hill it's Clinton. Hillary Clinton does have a lead. It's a three point lead. I, I should also point out that's also a lot narrower than I think a lot of people thought. The, the idea that, that, uh, that Minnesota is even close uh, is something that was not anticipated at all. George, I want to go back to I, I think it's the first time I really met Donald Trump at last year at the Iowa State Fair. He was really just coming on the scene in a very big way. Flew that helicopter in with Trump on the side. These nice, lovely people at the Iowa State Fair could not get enough of him. I mean, we were walking around the Iowa State Fair basically seeing if anyone supported Hillary Clinton there and really couldn't find anybody. And Donald Trump, you know, bringing kids on his helicopter, again, the Manhattan billionaire with the, with the working class there in Iowa and charming, charming them. Hey, I grew up in upstate New York and you go home and you see Trump pen signs everywhere. And I, I think it goes back to this Bernie Sanders comparison we made earlier in the evening, which is both of these candidates, though, on varying degrees of the political spectrum, had a message for the working class in this country. You know, when they say make America great again, they, they were talking about opportunity for people who might be a high school graduate, who might not have had the opportunity to go to college or not been able to afford college, which is a huge issue in this country. And they spoke and had a message that resonated with people who said, I want the opportunity too. I should not be held back because I didn't have the opportunity that others had. And I think that, you know, like I mentioned earlier, Bernie Sanders might cringe at the notion that some of his supporters went to Donald Trump, but it was it was something Sanders tapped into and Trump sent, tapped into. And I think there'll be some there'll be some there'll be an autopsy within the Democratic Party about whether or not Hillary Clinton uh, was successful in getting that message across. George, that she could do something for them, too. I, I'm just looking back on some old interviews. This is from Bucks County, right around Philadelphia, just northeast of Philadelphia, an Obama voter that I interviewed. I said, have you ever voted Republican? He said, I have not, but I am this year. I'm voting for Trump this year. And why are you voting for Trump? I don't trust Hillary at all, at all. She wanted to be a politician her whole career. So staying in a marriage for that is something that bothered me a little bit, I think. Does anything bother you about Donald Trump? Well, you know what? They're both horrible. I don't know who to pick, but they're both horrible. 
I'm going with Trump, and I think he will pick an amazing cabinet because he wants to win. Not ready to find out just yet. We're not ready to call this. Donald Trump has 244 electoral votes. But I want to go outside to TJ Holmes here in Times Square. Tell us about the crowd, what you're seeing, what you're hearing out there. Well, you guys have been talking about being shocked and confused and surprised about the evening. Same sentiment out here in Times Square. Where we have thousands of people gathered around. But something I've never heard before is quiet. It has been quiet in Times Square this evening as the results have popped up on the screen behind me. It, it's been overwhelmingly a pro-Hillary crowd, but they have been shocked at the results, and I've never heard Times Square go quiet before. We've set up this, this Facebook booth here, and people could come in, and then this Instagram Oval Office have their picture taken. Well, what you see right now is an empty booth and an empty Instagram Oval Office because nobody's in the mood to be having a good time and having fun out here because these Hillary supporters, again, pro-Hillary crowd, they have been in absolute shock, and the place has gone quiet. We come through here every, no, Monday through, you know, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, Times Square, you hear some noise. You're not hearing much of anything. Isla is just one of the uh, of the Hillary supporters. Yes, Isla, I hello am. to Hi. you, dear lady. Now, nice you have a smile you. on your face now. I do. <laughs> Um, I mean, considering the fact that Florida um, was Republican, I'm very disappointed, but it's not shocking. Um, I live in Boca Raton, which is very um, for Trump. Are you holding so. out hope at this point? Um, to be honest, I don't know. It kind of seems like a lost cause. It sucks, and I don't want to say that, but it is what it is. It I is guess. what it is. Isla, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. That's, that's kind of the sentiment. And, and again, I don't know if you want me to go ahead and go back to you, George, but if you want to hear from some more voters, you're certainly welcome to. But uh, mostly, you can't find a lot of Trump folks out here. There, there, are, there are a couple here and there in the crowd, but they're certainly hiding, had been very vocal, got a little more vocal as some of these votes started coming in. Um, and you hear, and let me go ahead and toss it back. We, uh, to you right now, George, but uh, but the place has gone quiet this evening, something I never thought you'd hear about Times Square on an election night. That is a different kind of Times Square right now. We're still waiting for some crucial battleground results to come in. Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, they could decide our next president. Donald Trump only 26 electoral votes away from the White House. We're live here in Times Square and across the country with the campaigns as well. We'll be right back. We're back now coming up on 1.30 in the East Coast, 10.30 p.m. on the West Coast, and Donald Trump is coming up on those 270 electoral votes he needs. He has 244 right now to 215 for Hillary Clinton. He is also leading in a lot of the states you see right there still in gray. He is ahead right now in the state of Wisconsin. He is ahead right now close in the state of Michigan, ahead right now and close in the state of Pennsylvania. We also have some news out of the state of Pennsylvania. Senator's race there, the Republican, Senator Pat Toomey, has won defeating Democrat Katie McGinty right there, 49 to 47 right there. Uh, Pat Toomey played a cagey game with his support of Donald Trump and his opposition to Donald Trump over the course of, of this campaign. He prevailed, got the victory. He John didn't Clark. even reveal who he was going to vote for until <laughs> the very end. He finally said he was going to vote for Donald Trump. But you have to look at this day for the Republican Party because the Republican Party, outside of what happened with Donald Trump, is having an unbelievable day. They're holding on to the House, losing very few seats in the House in, in, in a year where they thought they would lose many more. Look at these Senate races. They are winning... Indiana, they've won Indiana, they've won Florida, they've won Wisconsin, and one that, that most Republicans had frankly written off. Now they've won Pennsylvania. New Hampshire is very close. Uh, Kelly Ayotte may win in New Hampshire, and, and in Roy Blunt is ahead in Missouri. Republicans are going to keep control of... The question is, what, that Bill Crystal raised, is what does the Republican Party stand for? Because these Republican senators ran on a very different agenda than Donald Trump's. I would add to that I think the Democratic Party needs to have the exact same conversation to go along with what Stephanie was saying is when they face this election, they're going to, if this continues and the trend gets, Donald Trump's elected president, the Republicans take over the United States Senate, and they suffer, Republicans suffer very few losses. Everybody thought it was the end of the Republican Party 30 days ago, 60 days ago. Well, the Democratic Party needs to face, look, take a long look in the mirror and realize 34% of the electorate, a larger share than the non-white share of the vote in this, 34% white males rejected 
the Democratic Party in almost the same proportion as non-whites. It's one of the things we saw, but David Beers, you're also seeing that Hillary Clinton did underperform what she needed to do with, with non-whites as well. Yeah, and I think our control room has the numbers here. Uh, it, it was the effort to get non-whites, and we're talking Hispanic voters, African-American voters, and take a look. This is on the far right what President Obama did in 2008, then 2012, and look what she did uh, tonight, at least so far into the evening. Uh, Ten points she lost to what Obama was able to perform in 2012, just four years ago. Uh, and Donald Trump did much better. Look, he gained 11 points there with non-white voters across this country. Mayor Stephanie Rawlings-Blake, is the story wow. of tonight, we're still waiting on Detroit, we're still waiting on Milwaukee, Philadelphia, and these final votes coming out of those big, big states. But is one of the stories tonight going to be that African Americans that came out in record numbers for Barack Obama did not have that same enthusiasm for Hillary Clinton? Well, I don't think anyone had uh, the expectation that African Americans would have the same level of enthusiasm as they would for the first African American uh, president. But what I, what I hope the story of tonight is, is where our country goes from now. I mean, there's a lot, it, there's a big difference between um, fighting to win and being a leader. Um, when you're a candidate, it's great to have a, a, a winning strategy, a logo, a, a, a baseball hat, but I don't think anybody up here that's a supporter of Trump or a Republican can say one thing, one policy that he'll actually do to, to, um, to, to keep any of the promises that he's made. Not one thing. You don't know how he's going to fix the trade deals. You don't know. He's certainly not going to build the wall. How is he going to bring jobs back? Nobody can say what those policies are. So I hope that story is a story that gets filled in. That is going to be a big challenge for him if indeed he does become the next president of the United States. Still 26, 26 electoral votes short of what he needs right now. 244 to 215 for Hillary Clinton. We'll be right back. To ABC News coverage of election night 2016. Here again, George Stephanopoulos. 130 here in the East Coast, 1030 in the West. Donald Trump, 244 electoral votes. Hillary Clinton, 215 electoral votes. A lot of states still out there, those states in the gray right there. And let's take through them one at a time and show you where things stand right now again. Donald Trump needs 26 electoral votes to win. He is, there's the state of Minnesota, Hillary Clinton, holding on to a deed right now. Don't have enough votes in to project that. Yet, state of Michigan. See it right there, Donald Trump holding on to the lead right there, about 70,000 votes, 16 electoral votes, Donald Trump leading in the state of Michigan. State of New Hampshire right now, only four electoral votes. Hillary Clinton is pulled back into the lead there by about 4,000 votes. State of Pennsylvania, this is a big one, 20 electoral votes. And you see right there, Donald Trump ahead, 49 to 48. That would get him just about there. 220 electoral votes in the state of Pennsylvania alone, and you see him right there, up by about 60,000 votes. And Tommy Amos, take us inside the Trump High Command right now. All right, George, here's what we have. They're still very excited, and now they are growing impatient. They want the networks and the news organizations to call this election for Donald Trump. We're hearing that from multiple sources, so there is a, a little bit of frustration now because they feel they have won this race. That being said, Donald Trump got a very good sign, a very promising sign just a few minutes ago. Mary Bruce, who covers Capitol Hill for us, says that Speaker Paul Ryan called up Donald Trump and they had a very good conversation. The Speaker congr congratulated Donald Trump on his big night and he also spoke with his good friend, Governor Mike Pence. Spoke with Mike Pence. Let me go to Mary Bruce. Do we have Mary Bruce? She's in Janesville, uh, Wisconsin. Right now, Mary Bruce, you've been covering Congress for us for a while right now. Covered Speaker Ryan uh, up close. What do you think is going through his mind right now? I guess we lost uh, Mary Bruce. I'm going to bring. Oh, she is. She's back there right now. Hope you heard the question right there. Go ahead. George, we do know that Speaker Ryan did have that conversation with uh, with Donald Trump, reaching out. The Paul Ryan's camp will only say that it was a included conversation. Uh, 
this is clearly a warming up that we are seeing. Remember, Donald Trump and Paul Ryan have had this very contentious relationship throughout uh, this election. We have seen uh, Paul Ryan over the last few days even coming out saying you'd be willing to campaign with Donald Trump. That event never actually uh, ended up happening. You've heard Paul Ryan even on the, on the stump in recent days saying Donald Trump's name, the T word, something that he was very reluctant to do throughout much of this campaign. He took uh, the Voldemort approach, the he who shall not be named tactic when referring to the top of his own party's ticket. Now you're seeing Paul Ryan making these overtures to Donald Trump. Clearly, uh, I think this is very much the beginning of, of a healing process that you're going to see going forward, assuming that Donald Trump uh, does, in fact, win the presidency. Healing process with John Carr. You've covered Capitol Hill as well. And one of the things I'm thinking of, we know that Paul Ryan had a distaste for a lot of the language we saw from Donald Trump out on the campaign trail. He was against the Muslim ban. He is very strongly for free trade agreements, including the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is on the agenda right now. I can't see him leading the effort to undo no. NAFTA or other trade deals. No, no, no. And, and, and if you look at virtually every major issue, Paul Ryan stands opposed to Donald Trump. It's not just trade. It's also entitlement reform, which is the issue that brought Paul Ryan to power. Uh, it's also uh, international affairs. Paul, Paul Ryan is more of a favors a more internationalist, you know, aggressive U.S. foreign policy. That is not Donald Trump. Uh, they disagree across the board. Well, it's hard for me to imagine them working. Well, on with one big, okay, with one, a couple of big social exceptions, issues. and I wonder, yeah, perhaps on social issues, they could probably agree on the Supreme Court. And you got Cookie Roberts, of course. You covered Capitol Hill as well. One thing I think they definitely agree on: repealing Obamacare well, and replacing it with something else. They clearly agree on an agenda of more tax cuts to promote promote economic growth. Absolutely, and and Paul Ryan uh, has this whole better way that he uh, talks about of a whole host of, of uh, legislation that he wants to see done. And I'm not sure that Donald Trump is going to oppose him on any of that. Uh, I think the one place where they could have an argument is over spending, and, and that is over uh, the question of, of infrastructure. And, and look, think about that. First of all, we, we actually do have a crumbling infrastructure. Trump is right about that, saying our airports are, are terrible. And this is a way you actually could hire some of these people who are complaining about being out of work. You don't need a college degree to work to build some roads and to build some airports and some train stations and some schools and some hospitals. And so uh, that might be a place where Trump can deliver to this group of people that he's talking about. And, and the Republicans in Congress might just have to swallow hard and, and add to the deficit. Well, the You'll get some Democratic votes for that. Absolutely. As well. Lots of Democratic votes. Tom, you know, you, you've been out on the trail with, with Donald Trump again and again and again, and we know this, the signature issues he talked about, the Muslim ban, go to the trade deals. He did also keep on promising, hitting this hard, especially in the last couple of months, this idea that in his first first few weeks in office, he would move to get rid of Obamacare completely. Oh, oh, incredibly. And we really haven't talked about that tonight, George, but he hammered home those premiums that were rising in the final weeks of this right. campaign and every time he mentioned that every state he would go to the numbers would get higher and higher and the crowds would cheer when he would say he was going to repeal Obamacare and that also appealed in reality also to some small business owners who Obamacare affected as well. Let's go over to Amy Robach. She's over at the New York Hilton where the Trump people are getting ready to celebrate. They're hoping for that. Tonight, Amy, what do you got? Yeah, well, there are a lot of impatient people here who are very ready for this race to be called, and one of them is standing right here with me. Susan Fabiano, you supported Trump. Are you surprised at all by tonight's results? Not at all. Not even a little bit? Not even a little bit. You thought this was going to happen. Why do you think the pollsters got it so wrong? Because I think it's very similar to when Reagan was elected. There's a silent majority out there that is afraid to express their opinions. They're going to vote with what they're afraid. That, that hidden vote we heard Trump talking so much about, he said tonight was going to be Brexit times 50. Yeah. It looks like he may have been correct on that. Tell me what you're feeling here tonight, standing here in this room. This has been so exciting just to be in the room, seeing everybody. Everybody is so positive and very upbeat, and there's so much energy in the room. So this, it's been great. This has been a very negative campaign, though. We have a very divided America. A lot of people... Uh, question, you know, you see the signs in here, women for Trump, but clearly that's been an issue with Trump. There's been a big gender gap in who came out to vote for whom. Why, as a woman, did you support Donald Trump? 
because at least I believe in what his policies are. I believe in what he says. Do I believe in the way he says everything? Not really. But I don't believe in Clinton at all. She proved that she was, you know, pretty much dis uh, disreputable. Uh, she's been in the government 30 years. She's made a lot of money off being in the government, and there's something wrong with that. You make it in the private sector, I'm happy for was you. Was it a vote more against Hillary rather than a vote for Trump? No. I like what he says. I have four grandchildren, and I want to make sure that they grow up in a country that is safe and gives them all the economic possibilities that I had when I was growing up. Are you hoping that we see a different Donald Trump in the presidency, if that's in fact what happens in terms of how he speaks to minorities, to women, or about those groups in general? Absolutely. I would like to see that change. But again, I want to see what he's going to do. I already know what the Democrats are going to do. I want to see what he's going to do. Are you going to go to bed tonight? Um, not until they call it. <laughs> Any predictions? Seeing how you knew this was going to happen tonight, do you think we'll know before we go to sleep this evening? I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure Michigan's going to put him over. All right, you heard it here, George. Susan says Michigan is going for Trump. Okay, Amy Roback, thanks very much. And Tom Yamas, we're also hearing from Trump's campaign manager. That's right, Kellyanne Conway taking somewhat of a victory lap right now. She tweeted this out, things that were true, undercover Trump vote, Mike Pence for VP, Hillary's floor and ceiling are the same. And finally, rally crowds matter, and we expanded the map. In many ways, she's very true. Congratulations also coming in to Donald Trump from overseas, Terry Moran. Yes, indeed. The high fives are happening at the Kremlin. There's no question about it because he is a, Vladimir Putin is a big winner here, and it will remain an open and perhaps unanswered question just how much uh, the Russian government was mucking around in this election. But there's no question Putin and Putin's Russia have a freer hand in Ukraine and in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, and he is a person who has tried to sow this, this, this notion of the restoration of nationalism. 27 years ago today, the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, opening an era of, of walls and borders being much more porous and, and uh, shrinking Russian power. And today, the guy who's going to build a wall, he says, won. <laughs> and uh, Martha Raddatz, the leader of the French National Front, Marine Le Pen, congratulating Donald Trump, saying congratulations to the new president of the United States, Donald Trump, and the free American people. Oh, yeah. He's, he's going to get some congratulations from there. We were just over in, in France talking to... Uh, to, to French politicians about Do Donald Trump, and there's some support, just like here. There is support over there. But I think when you look at the world and we wake up tomorrow, uh, there's going to be a lot, a lot of reaction from around the world and what this means for everybody, yes. what it means for Asia Pacific, what it means for the war. I mean, is he going to pull troops out? I, 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 and the other thing, George, I don't think any of us really well, know. Well, that's the thing. I, that's that's, the thing that's, that's exactly the today. point I just we wanted to know. get to right there. And Tommy, I'm I'll bring this to you first, and then and open it up as well. We know that Donald Trump started to get security briefings when, when he got the nomination. We know he received the security briefing, the same security briefing that Hillary Clinton received, the conclusion of 17 of our national security agencies that Russia was behind this attack, this hack of the emails, yet he went out during your debates on the stump day after day after day after day and said, I just don't believe it. Not only did he say that, George, he said, quote, I love WikiLeaks. <laughs> and he would say that over and over again. And it wasn't a problem, and his crowds loved it. Even when people like Senator Marco Rubio said it wasn't a good idea that we were promote that Republicans were promoting this. And he was even asked in a news conference, Donald Trump, if it gave him pause, and it didn't. And he, he encouraged the hacking at one point. He later said he was just joking, but he did actually say that. Uh, and, and we haven't really talked about WikiLeaks, but when Donald Trump put the label on Hillary Clinton of crooked Hillary, and then the WikiLeaks come out, and those embarrassing emails for the Clinton campaign showed some voters, wait a minute, maybe he's got a point. Maybe they believe that. Yeah, but he was talking about 17 intelligence agencies, professionals. These are career people in intelligence agencies who I know all through that were shocked that he would say something like that. And tonight are probably wondering what their future is. As he well. also said he knows more than the generals more who, than the generals, who organized this, this uh, offensive in, in, in Mosul right now in Iraq. Yeah, I mean, I mean right but, now but, it's but, a very critical time. He said the generals were reduced to rubble, but then I think he came back and said it's the civilians, it's not, it's not the military. Uh, 
But, but take uh, a step back. I mean, you know, Martha, I mean, the, the, the intelligence agencies, how could they be wrong? How could the, well, the intelligence agencies told us we had weapons of mass destruction, mass destruction in, in Iraq. The generals, how could we disrespect the general, the, the Iraq war became so incredibly unpopular. And, and we said that to him that night. We said that in the debate. Absolutely, the intelligence agencies have been wrong in the past. And this, this gets to, this gets to, a, this gets to, to a bigger, bigger point. And of course, we're still waiting for those results to come in in Michigan, in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania. But Charlie, let me bring you in on this because it's this something we've, we've, we've talked about a bit tonight. American people skeptical of everyone. They are skeptical of intelligence agencies. They are skeptical of business leaders. They are skeptical of the press. They are skeptical of politicians, leaders in Washington. This is a repudiation of all of it. It certainly is. Uh, one of the most popular things uh, in, in his campaign rallies were to whip it on the press. Um, you still have some of the marks. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but, you know, I've been silent, George, because I'm, I'm, I'm gobsmacked, I think, the way everybody is. And, and, and what really brings me up short is we don't know. We have no idea what waters we're in. We're in uncharted waters because he really hasn't given much signal as to what he will do. I mean, he says, I'm going to cure this and I'm going to cure that, but he never tells us necessarily how he's going to do it. And, and I'm, I'm, you know, I, Bill, bless your heart, Bill, you think he might come out with a conciliatory statement. But every time he has spoken, it is all about him. You know, it is about me. That's basically what it comes down to when he gives a speech. And I have a feeling that he's going to... Uh, take this very personally and not be very conciliatory and that 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 worries me and the other thing the other thing George words matter I, I, all of us I think believe words matter and when you start your campaign calling Mexican immigrants ra rapists and murders and then you insult um, Hispanics you tell you're gonna you're gonna deport 11 he says he's, you know he started out saying he was gonna deport all 11 million he got what is it, 20 29 percent of the Hispanic vote in this country. I, it's just amazing to me. Um, and, and needless to say, his comments about women and his, and his, his support among his women stronger than we expected. Um, I, we're in uncharted waters. We're just straight in uncharted well, waters. Do you have some information on the... You know, just to Charlie's point here, this is pretty telling, Charlie. You know, if you break down that question about the comments that were made on that Access Hollywood Hollywood bus. Uh, Trump voters, among Trump voters, they were asked, Trump's treatment of women, does it bother you? Those words, do they bother you? And the majority of Trump voters, 54%, said not much, not at all. And I think it's going to be a discussion in some households, moms and dads with their children. Uh, after those comments were made, there were so many ads. We saw that Hillary Clinton ad play over and over again in the battleground with Trump's comments and the children listening and watching and what parents will say on this day after. Now, 54% say it doesn't matter that the, much. The people but, 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 I talked to just a few days ago said exactly that. They didn't care. That was in his past. It, it, he's, he's going forward. That's something. But it's interesting. You know, Tom Yamas told us that Donald Trump went upstairs in Trump Tower to talk to Melania Trump. We saw her go to suburban Philadelphia in the final days of this campaign, a lot of people said, what was that speech? But she went and s spoke about cutting down on bullying for precisely this reason, to try to get at this, that, that among the criticisms of Donald Trump is what he's done on Twitter, these comments made about women, and that perhaps was the first sign that they're aware they have to do some healing on that front. George, I think we have a sense of what a potential Trump White House would look like, and I was just thinking about this, because here's a guy that can't stand professionals, right? He started his campaign basically running against the professionals. Jeb Bush had the most professional campaign operation put in place. Jeb Bush got four delegates and spent $110 million. He built a tanker ship. He goes into the general election against the next tanker ship built by Hillary Clinton. The most massive infrastructure, all of the staff, campaign headquarters. They had 50 times more headquarters than them. They outspent Donald Trump, I think, five to one in this. She won all three debates. She won the convention. And he is about to win this race. He is a Somali pirate. And this is a time in, of large tanker chips. And Donald Trump's going to go into the White House think those professionals don't know what they're doing. I just did this. Well, I think that's right, but I, I think you also have to say that it's it, people voted for him. It's not just him. 
There are millions of Americans who voted for Donald Trump. And this country does rest on the consent of the governed. And these, the, you know, you might disagree with them, but these are voters who have voted for Donald Trump, and they believe it's not just about him. They believe it's about them. And I think that we, that we have to keep that very firmly in mind. Well, no, and, and that's and why I, I keep they, coming they back to That's why I keep either. coming back. I think you're exactly <laughs> right. I think the question is, what is he going to do for them? And George, on that point, as I look around our panel, I think there's a lot of confusion because people are asking, what happened tonight? I've been with Donald Trump for 500 days. My question is, what happens tomorrow? And I really don't think anybody on this planet but Donald Trump knows what he's going to do. He is the master of the head fake. He'll say he'll do one thing and he'll do something else. He'll make a promise and he'll go back on it. And if he does have the, the Senate and if he does have the House and he's the president, like I said earlier, he can do whatever he wants to do. And we just don't know until he starts in office. If he takes, if he takes that attitude. Yeah, he will. Um, he will not govern. I mean, governing is a serious business. You can't say, "Oh, I'll just promise one thing one day, one the next day." I'll tell the <laughs> Asian allies this, the trade deal that. I mean, I hate to sound like a you know establishment, sober, <laughs> boring. You know, it is like kind of important to get some of these policies right. There is kind of a world order out there that has not failed for 70 years and that has brought an awful lot of people out of poverty. And this country, and this country hasn't failed, and this country hasn't failed so much either. You know what I mean? A lot of good things have happened over the last 30, 40 years. Wait a second, let me just finish this. And if, <laughs> if Trump can change, I, I, Charlie is the only person who's ever accused me of being too nice to Trump. I mean, I'm hoping he changes. <laughs> if he has the attitude that I fooled everyone in the primaries, I fooled everyone in the general election, I'm just going to keep doing this for four years, I think that would be very bad for this country. It is a deeply divided country. He's not going to win a majority of the popular vote. If he has the attitude that I won, I won, I'm just going to keep on winning the way I've won, I just think it will not work and it will end up badly. Bill, but he, never, also said, he also said at one point, I can fix this country in one term. I mean, I'd have to run for re-election. That's the mindset he has going in. He's in a week. That's what he said. <laughs> Alex, go in. Remember the Donald Trump you saw in Mexico standing next to the Mexican yeah. president? Remember the Donald Trump you saw after he won Florida? Very conciliatory. And Martha, your point that uh, this is not just an American phenomenon. No. Uh, we think it's a global. Trump victory. It's a global phenomenon. Everywhere, people think those guys who think they're better than us aren't doing that great a job. They've failed us, whether it's Marie Le Pen, whether it's Brexit, whether it's here in the United States. Columbia. So the first thing he has to do is make disruption safe because actually government is a problem. It isn't working very well. It's time to get a lot of money and power out of Washington back into people's hands. Well, if he can help be the Republican Party or even the Democrat well, become Kristen, if you're, you're of change, about this he'll succeed. You're talking about this globally. You know, in other countries, the Trump movement would have its own party, right? In France, you have Marine Le Pen's party in Germany, you have Alternative for Germany, you have a separate populist party. Hear what Donald Trump's got to do. You know, winning sure does heal a lot of wounds. We had been talking prior to tonight about how broken the Republican Party is into these fractures. Is there going to be a civil war? How much does winning heal some of those wounds? And how much is there still pressure from the center right or the conservative, the ideological part of the party to go to Donald Trump and say, you've never run as a particularly ideologically conservative candidate, but now that you're president, but he can give them either. We got to take a break. He can give them something question. right at the beginning, particularly if he has a Republican Senate, and that's what it's looking like right now. And that is a Supreme Court pick. That'll be one of the first orders of business if and when he takes office. 26 electoral votes away right now. That's what Donald Trump needs to win the White House. All eyes on Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. We're live with the latest results when we come back. Coast and Donald Trump is closing in on what may be the biggest upset in American political history. He has 244 electoral votes right now to 215 for Hillary Clinton. And when you look at that map right there in those gray states, he is leading in the states he needs to get those electoral votes. John Carl, starting with the state of Pennsylvania. Yeah, Pennsylvania is, is a, <laughs> one of the many shockers of the night, but 97% of the vote in. And as you see, he has a solid lead, uh, 75,000 votes lead. And if you look at where the vote is outstanding, we had been watching Allegheny County. That's Pittsburgh. That's a solidly Democratic county, but 98% of Allegheny County is in. Another obviously solidly uh, Democratic area is going to be Philadelphia. If you look at Philadelphia, 
99% uh, in Philadelphia. Even in the counties around Philadelphia, as you look, 98, 99. 100% uh, in the counties. There's not a lot of Democratic, obviously Democratic vote left in the state of Pennsylvania. If he wins Pennsylvania, it is President-elect Trump. Blue wall is crumbling. State of Michigan right now looking like the same story, a little bit closer little now bit, than it was before, but... A little bit closer than it was, but Trump continues to hold a lead in Michigan. The other one that I think is the mo more likely is Wisconsin. He continues to have a very enduring lead in Wisconsin. George, 90% of the vote in, and he still has a three-point lead in the state of Wisconsin. And of course, any one of those is enough because the state of Arizona, which is still hanging out there in the West, he's got a pretty solid lead right now. He sure does. If you go, if you go to our possibilities board and you look at this, look, look at it the reverse, what would Hillary Clinton have to, didn't have to do? Well, Arizona, Trump's got a pretty solid lead. Give her Give her New Hampshire. She has to win all the remaining states. Look, if she wins Michigan, she doesn't get to 270. If she wins Michigan and Pennsylvania, she's only at 268. She needs to win them all. She needs to win New Hampshire, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. And she is behind in all of them but New Hampshire right now. Donald Trump is ahead. Our election coverage is going to continue. We're not going anywhere right now. As we said, Donald Trump has 244 electoral votes, 215 for Hillary Clinton. He is closing in on something that was just not foreseen across this country, around the world, but he is closing in on the White House. Stay with us.